So now this series of stories on TikTok has been going viral. It's called Who the F Did I Marry? Now this lady goes into full detail of how she was bamboozled by a man that she met online. Now she posts a 50 part series to this on TikTok. I've compiled all the stories so you guys could just watch it straight through. Grab your popcorn, your snacks, or if you have chores to do, go ahead and let this story play while you're working. Now this is a 50 part series. So if you guys need to save this video, bookmark it so you can watch some now, watch some later. But I did include her ex-husband's response because see now people on the internet have found him. Although she did try to keep his identity private, even gave him a fake name. Now here's what she had to say. I'm gonna post the story here. As always, you guys leave your opinions down in the comment section below. But here is part one of who the fuck did I marry? Um, so I met my ex-husband around March 4th of 2020. We met on Facebook dating site and we also matched on Hinge. Um, I did not realize that he, he was on both um, under two different names. So one was his actual name and the other one was a variation, like a nickname um, that he called himself. Different pictures. So it was a running joke between us. Oh, you ain't even recognize that um, you had matched with me on Hinge. No, I didn't. Um, and also that should have been a red flag. By the way, you will notice in this story, I called it the United Nations of red flags. It is so many red flags that, I mean, you would have thought I was colorblind because I ignored all of them. So anyway, back to the story. We met around March 4th. We exchanged phone numbers. He called me and we talked on the phone um, for the first time. In the first phone call, he told me that he had just moved to Georgia from California, from San Diego. His job had transferred him um, because he was being transferred in as the new regional manager for a major condiment company that is based here in Georgia. I'm not gonna say the name. And so we also talked about his childhood. He told me um, he grew up in Philly. He's from Philly. Both of his parents were deceased. This is the first phone call. Both of his parents were deceased. His father um, was a Philadelphia police officer. His mom was a teacher. He also told me he um, went, he briefly lived in Augusta um, with his family. He had two brothers and two sisters. He also had two half brothers on his dad's side. First phone call. So I'm just giving you guys the backstory. This was the first phone call we had. So we talked about family. We talked about friends. We talked about our jobs. At the time I was working at Georgia State Patrol. Um, and he knew this and he just thought that was like, wow, you know, so you work with troopers all day. Yes, I did. Um, also in that phone call, he explained to me that he um, used to play football. He explain that he used to play arena football i know nothing about arena football um i know about nfl i know about college go dogs but i don't know anything about arena football so he explained to me that he used to play arena football he used to work at apple in the off season of arena football um and i remember thinking on that phone call Oh, okay. You know, like, good for you. I, I don't know anything about arena football. And I believe I did tell him that. I don't know anything about arena football. That'll come into play later on. So he told me, you know, I just, I just moved here. Um, my job is paying for my housing be and they are helping me to look for a house. He was like, I'm trying right now I'm in Gwinnett County, but I'm trying to look for a house ideally in Atlanta, like Brookhaven, um, Sandy Springs. He was like, I, I really would like to move out there. And so I thought, you know, this is, that's great. You know, you're looking to get a house. You just moved here. He was like, I don't really know too, too many people here because I spent all my time at work and you know, this job is really demanding. So that was our first phone call. We talked more. He talked a lot, which 
took me by surprise because I'm not really used to men talking more than me. Um, he eventually asked me out on a date. Our first date was set for Saturday, March 7th, 2020. Um, he asked me what was my favorite restaurant. I said, Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> and so we agreed to go out um, at the Cheesecake Factory in a location that was in between. I lived in Clayton County at the time. He lived in Gwinnett County. I realized that if you don't know anything about Metro Atlanta, that makes no sense. But basically, we lived uh, about 45 minutes apart. So we agreed to meet at the Cheesecake Factory over at Perimeter Mall, which is in an area, Sandy Springs, Dunwoody area. I was excited. Like I called my friends and was like, I got a date, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'll see how it goes. First conversation was good. Um, hopefully he looks like his pictures because, you know, that's always an issue with online dating. Hopefully he looks like his pictures. So on my way to our date, I took 285 and literally right before I got to Boulder Crest, the exit for Boulder Crest, I heard a boom and I lost control of my car. Thank God that this, well, not thank God, but I knew what to do. So I did not crash, but my tire blew out. So I called him and I said, hey, I'm so sorry, but my tire just blew on 285. I'm slowly making my way off the exit. I believe I pulled into a Chevron gas station and I said, you know, I gotta get this fixed. I don't know what to do. Like I'm a damsel in distress kind of thing. He kind of paused, he got quiet and he was like, where, you know, tell me exactly where you are, drop your pen. So I dropped the pen and he came to the gas station came to the gas station got out the car and i was i was so relieved that he actually looked like his pictures that i was like oh my god he's actually a attractive because he's like six four six five um oh also man i apologize so let me go back to the first conversation let me add something he did tell me in the first phone call that he is that he was divorced um, and that his ex-wife, they had, she had um, two children, a boy and a girl who were teenagers, young adults. I think the girl was about 20. And he said that he had a very close relationship with his stepkids. Um, but that he and his ex-wife had divorced because she cheated on him um, out in California. And so coming to Georgia was a new beginning for him she was still out in california the kids were still out in california um and so you know he was like there's no i, I can't stand her but i still want to be in the kids lives i have to put that in there because that will come back later so this is just setting the stage again that first conversation was we talked about family job friends um how he ended up in georgia me being in georgia the things that, you know, I would think people talk about in the first conversation. All right, now back to the tire. So he shows up to the gas station. He changes my tire, which I just thought was the sexiest thing in the world. Um, and then he proceeds to say, hey, I found a, play, a tire place around the corner. You need to get another tire. Like, you can't drive on this donut. So he followed me to... Um, he followed me to the to the tire place and then helped me get a tire paid for it so i was definitely like wow um and so the vibe was good so anyway i get the car i get the tire fixed we follow each other to the cheesecake factory over in perimeter we hold hands walking into the cheesecake factory so in my mind i'm like this is just this oh my god i had butterflies that that's that's the look of a woman who had butterflies so i had butterflies and um we go in there's a long wait and so we sit outside and we just talk and the conversation's great and this is where he tells me what it is he's looking for he tells me you know, I'm, I believe at the time he was 42. 
he was like I want to get married and it be for real he's like my parents were married 40 plus years before my mom passed away and I want that I want marriage family a house like that is what I want he's like I'm you know I'm as a man I'm ready to get married but I want it to be for real because the first time you know it really hurt me when she cheated on me so he's telling me everything that I wanted to hear um and so he was like what is it that you want and I said pretty much the same thing I was like I'm ready to get married definitely want to have a family and <clears throat> I want to marry my best friend so we both put on the table that we wanted marriage and this is the end of part one all right who the fuck did i marry part two so we both um put on the table what it is that we wanted we both had established we were dating for marriage we were not dating just to date we were not trying to be friends with benefits and none of that um, so the the dinner at Cheesecake Factory went really well. We laughed, we joked, we talked about people, which um, <laughs> is kind of up my alley, my sense of humor. It was just, it was a good vibe. So at the end of the date, or excuse me, at the end of dinner, we sat in his car and he played this song for me by John Legend. I don't know the name of the song by the t well by the time this video posts I will put the name at the bottom I can't remember the song I just remember that John Legend was talking about I think I met my wife tonight and I thought it was a sign so I was like oh my god so anyway we ended up sitting in the car talking just about life and experiences until about midnight so during this conversation, he again is telling me how it was, you know, what it was like living in California, how he went out there. He went to San Diego State. He played football for San Diego State. Um, he talked about how, you know, life, he loved it out there. So he stayed. Um, that's when he joined the company. Um, and then he explained that he also did arena football but only did it for about two or three years he claims that while he was doing arena football the team that he was on won a championship but again keep in mind i don't know anything about arena football so i was like okay i didn't know that they had championships and he was like you know he got a little offended like yeah they got championships and you know he was on that team so he talked to me about how he worked at Apple. He worked um, something in the IT area of Apple, but it was in the store. Again, it was one of those. It's like when I tell people I used to work at Amazon. I, I really wasn't paying much attention to it. Why? So we talked about all that. We talked about, uh, we talked deeply into what happened with the ex-wife. It's because I asked chips. And he was like, you know, he got a little offended. Like, yeah, they got championships. And, you know, he was on that team. So he talked to me about how he worked at Apple. He worked um, something in the IT area of Apple. But it was in the store. Again, it was one of those. It's like when I tell people I used to work at Amazon. I, I really wasn't paying much attention to it. Why? So... We talked about all that. We talked about, uh, we talked deeply into what happened with the ex-wife. It's because I asked. He was not volunteering all this information. So in other words, I, I get very uncomfortable when men start talking about their ex a lot. That's not what happened. I was asking questions because I was really trying to figure out, okay, is this a, are you ready for a relationship or are you still um, missing her? So we talked about that. We talked about my exes. That was a mistake I made because I talked about how I dated at one point in time somebody I worked with. That will come back later. Um, and he seemed real cool about it. He was like, you know, that was before me and blah, blah, blah. Um, so the conversation was good. Midnight comes and um, I go home. Yes, I went home. We ended up talking, talking, and talking. Mind you, our first date was March 7th. And within about two and a half weeks, Brian Kemp, our governor, 
shut Georgia down. We were about to, we were going to be on lockdown. So during those two and a half weeks, we talked every day. We went out again at Red Lobster. Um, I don't even, I remember Red Lobster. Um, but everything was going great. The issue was, where are we going to quarantine? So the question was, are we going to quarantine at his place? Which he had like a studio type of situation. Like it clearly, where he was staying, um, I was like, it's like a studio apartment. But he kept telling me like, this is temporary because I'm looking for a house. Like he showed me, he showed me the email from the from a woman who worked at the company where she was out on maternity leave but she was she was putting him in contact <clears throat> with a realtor to help him find a town home or a single family house so i was just like okay this is definitely temporary like he's not trying to stay here long term and she was apologizing in the email. I'm so sorry. You know, this should have been taken care of before you got here, but it wasn't. Da, 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 da. I saw the email. I saw the email. I read it. I read the email. Um, so the decision was, are you, we're going to quarantine at the studio or are we going to quarantine in my house? First mistake I made. Well, there's a lot, but this was a mistake I made. So ladies, caution moment. During one of our dates, um, because keep in mind, in those two weeks, we were seeing each other quite a bit. Um, nothing physical or anything like that. Just two people who were who I thought were really on some. All right, let's see if this is going if this if this is going to grow into something. He came to my house. When he came to my house, I had a three bedroom, two and a half bath townhome. He was in a studio. Now, I'm telling you guys all of this in in order of how it happened. So some, t some things I'm probably going to insert what I was thinking and the mistake I made. Can I turn this off? No. Okay, I still need that. Um, and I say that to say that I did not realize inviting him to my home um, probably made his eyes go, oh shit she's a keeper she got this three bedroom two and a half bath townhouse and i'm in like a little studio yeah let me let me let me go ahead and pursue this what i need to do to quarantine here the decision was made quarantine at my house so we the state went on lockdown he came and stayed with me um in my home and for the most part be in the initial beginning it was fine it was it was fine the reason why i hesitate is because i grew up in the church so for me it was really like an internal struggle of bruh you always said you would never live with a guy unless he was your husband and now you living with a dude and he ain't your husband like it was it was a struggle for me because i knew better and, I, and don't come for me. I'm just telling you the way I grew up, it was like that. It was not sitting right with me. But at the same time, I didn't want to quarantine by myself. I did not want to. So there we go. Um, so he moved in. We talked about the bills. Let me clear something up that I said in the other video where I said he paid all the bills. He paid all the household bills. He did not pay my car payment, my cell phone, or my car insurance. He paid the rent because my rent at the time was less than a $1,000. Um, he paid the utility bills. And, on, and so when he's telling me that he's a regional manager, I was like wow okay so you got money um <laughs> and so he paid he paid all the household bills so my check really was just taking care of me myself and i and i am not this is where it's not gonna make me look good but it's the truth it was intoxicating to not have to worry financially about how to pay the bills it was a wonderful feeling and so 
I kind of push to the side the fact that, yeah, you shacking up because it's like, but your page, you don't have to worry right now. Like he's, he's taking care of all of April's bills before April even comes. Cause this was still March. So we're living together and I'm cooking, I'm cleaning. He's helping to cook and clean. And then we have a conversation about house. Is he still going to buy a house just for him? Or is he going to buy a house where it's for us? Because we are going to try to make this thing work, be official, get married, have a family. So the question now on the table is, what are we going to do? Because I didn't want to stay in um, Riverdale, Georgia. I did not want to raise a family there. I refused to have a baby um, in Clayton County. So the decision was made. Let's start looking for a house for both of us. Remember, he was already looking for a house for him. But then he was like, you know what? We're together. I plan to marry you. Let's look for a, for a, a family home for the two of us he was like this is how much i was approved for that's when he showed me the chase paperwork um it was a letter stating that he and it had the chase emblem at the top he showed me a letter stating that he was approved for 700 and all right part three who the fuck did i marry so this is when he showed me a letter from chase with the chase logo at the top stating that he had been approved for a mortgage for excuse me for a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage or a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house so he was like we can't go over 750 and i said i remember asking him can you afford the mortgage on a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house because i know i can't this is when he explains to me I told you how I played arena football. I invested my money really well. So he said, I have money that will help pay for the mortgage. He was like, we're good. Like, I'm I financially, I am okay. Um, he was like, that's why I'm able to get approved for $750,000 mortgage. So he told me that his money was in different savings accounts. He said he had an account with Chase Bank, he had an account with U.S. Bank, and he had an offshore account. This is what he told me. The offshore account, I was like, why? And he explained something about, oh, the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. imposes taxes on money when you have a certain amount in, in U.S. banks. He was like, so everybody knows that it's smart to have some money in an offshore account y'all look I live paycheck to paycheck I again I was like okay that's whatever I said so you have the, so you have the money um, to pay for to pay for a home I'm also holding in my hand a letter from Chase saying that he was approved for 750,000 so I went off of what I saw so we contacted a realtor. I won't say his name, but man, if he ever, ever sees this TikTok, I owe this man such an apology. But we contacted a realtor in <clears throat> who was based in Cobb County because I was very adamant I wanted to move back to Marietta, Smyrna area um, in Cobb County, Georgia. He was fine with that. His whole attitude was... You know, you're going to be my wife, happy wife, happy life. So we met a realtor. I, I would find houses that I wanted to tour. Keep in mind that um, this was COVID. So at the time, we could not tour a home. It would have to, it would have to be a virtual tour. So this particular realtor, we found a house in Douglasville, Georgia. Not Cobb County, but nevertheless, it's in Douglasville. I was fine with Douglasville. So we found a house in Douglasville, Georgia. The realtor did a, um, a, a uh, FaceTime tour of the house. The house was, it was really a nice, it was a nice home. Four, five bedrooms, four baths. So we did a FaceTime tour of the home 
and the home was listed i believe roughly 400 and something thousand i really like the house i could see myself living there i could see us living there I could see us with the kid there this is now april just for timeline purposes this is april so he really liked the house he was like you know what we'll put an offer in on the house he was like if you like it because again it was covid we weren't gonna be able to see the house in person because the family still live there so he said um i'll put an offer in we'll see if it's accepted I said okay so he puts an offer in he's telling me he put an offer in i need to clarify some things he told me and the things that i actually saw so for this house in douglasville he told me he was putting an offer in the realtor would call me because one thing that the realtor told us he was like if the woman likes the house typically the house is going to get bought so he kind of dealt with me a bit more than he did my ex-husband um and again this is april 2020 this is before we got married so at the time he was my boyfriend so the realtor was calling me and it was like hey you know i'm i'm I put the offer in and what they're asking for um, is proof of funds and I, and I know any I don't I did not know anything at this time about buying a house so I was like hey you probably need to talk to him because I'm not even listed on the mortgage like from the paperwork I saw it was only in his name so he um, he called him I guess they talked I was not there um, but I'm assuming that they had talked so the boyfriend is coming my ex is coming home saying yeah I talked to so-and-so I sent him over the paperwork the offer was approved and <clears throat> they are going to try to do a virtual closing first we got to do an inspection if the inspection goes all well then we have to do a virtual closing he t also told me that he put down earnest money on the home. He put down, I believe, 5000 He said, I, I just transferred the money over to the realtor's uh, account or whatever um, so that it could be earnest money for the house. So I'm just like, okay, great. He was like, so realistically, this is April. We should be able to get in that house um, by June. Okay, no problem. So this is what he told me about three or four days later i get a phone call from the from the realtor and the realtor is like hey i'm just checking to see what you know what you guys want to do about that house so i was confused i'm at work um and i said oh i i was told that he put an offer in and the realtor was like he did I didn't know that he put an offer in and I said well why wouldn't you know like he told me he put the offer in and he um, he had paid earnest money five thousand dollars earnest money and so the realtor was like well let me call him and find out what's going on with that because I didn't know anything about it so red flag of course so I call him and he's and he in true narcissistic nature he flips the script and he like goes off he's like cussing going off like he shouldn't excuse me I have the hiccups he shouldn't be calling you if he has a question he should call me because I'm the one that's on a mortgage he was like and now it's you know it's gonna be an issue and I said well did you put the offer in with him or not and he said, no, I did not put the offer in with him. I put the offer in with a friend of mine who is a realtor so I can give him the business. <sighs> so I never, I did not hear from that realtor again. So I was just like, is the house under contract or is it not? He was like, yes, the house is under contract. This is what, this is how crazy things work out. About three days later on realtor.com, I'm looking at the house because I was trying to figure out in my mind how I'm going to decorate. It shows the house is under contract. So 
showed my boyfriend. My boyfriend's like, I told you it was under contract. He was like, I, I like, did you not believe me? And I ain't had the heart to say, hell no, I didn't believe you. <laughs> like, it seemed too good to be true. Um, but once I saw the house was under contract, I absolutely believe that, okay, this, it's under contract with him. Like, yeah, we're about to do inspection. We are about to move. Um, and so we had driven by the house. Again, keep in mind, a family's still living there. So we had driven by the house. At this point, he was like, I want us to start looking for furniture. So that way we can go ahead and order it. So when, when it's time to move, the furniture is ready because you know it's takes like six to eight weeks sometimes um for furniture to be delivered if they don't have it in stock like he was he was very methodical and planning and saying this is what we need to do so we started going to home, home depot lowe's um because we had a printout of what the sellers were going to take they were going to take the appliances he had a printout let me be clear. He had a printout. So it said on there that they were going to take the appliances. So we needed to get a new stove, um, new refrigerator, new microwave, all that stuff. So we went to Home Depot and Lowe's and I, I went ham. I chose all these new appliances and here's where we get into the shopping. All right, part four. So... We go to Home Depot, we go to Lowe's. I'm choosing all these appliances. He's taking pictures of the, of the, um, the SKU number. We have representatives helping us. And he basically explained to them, hey, we're, we're buying a house. Um, we should be closing sometime in June. Can we order this stuff now? Can I, can I put a hold on it? Like, what can we do? Because <coughs> we're not ready for delivery. I stood there as the Home Depot rep said, we can hold it in our warehouse. Like you can buy something and we can hold it. People do it all the time, especially with COVID. So I watched him pay. Um, I want to say it was about three or it was either 350 or 500. I watched him pay a deposit on a whole new set of appliances for them. And they were going to hold it until we were ready for delivery i watched this so i was like okay good deal like we got the appliances next let's go to rooms to go and ashley furniture and find um actual furniture so we went all around rooms to go we went to ashley furniture we went to american signature and i i i saw all these things that i wanted again he's taking pictures of it he was like, I can go online and order it. I didn't think anything of it because, again, I just saw that we held the appliances. So I was like, okay, that's that's fine. Um, so April turns into May. May 2020 comes. Um, this is where things start to get a little interesting. May comes and obviously we had not done inspection and i'm asking him all the time what's so what's the deal with the house he was like oh because of covid they're trying to get someone to do the inspection but the guy that they had it was always something the guy they had caught covid so they're going to have to get somebody else and he's like he's like 15 houses backed up so it'll be a while so at this point in May, I know I look crazy. In this point in May of 2020, I started recording um, audio diaries. I don't know why. I, it was some something just made me just start recording my thoughts in, a, in an audio diary, and I still have them. And I would I would save them by the date, and um, I would just start talking about what's on my mind so i was like i knew i knew there was something something was nagging me like mm. but i i kept pushing it out of my mind i was like you saw th this is what i reminded myself you saw 
him pay for the appliances. You know the house is under contract. You know that he told you that um, he's the one who put the house under contract. Why would, like I remember saying to myself, why would he lie about that? This is so easy to verify. Why would he lie about that? Have you caught him in any other lie? And at the time the answer was no. Um, so I really was like, maybe you just aren't used to a guy who actually does what he's supposed to do. Like I, I was questioning myself and then answering my own questions. So inspection didn't happen around mid May. I found out I was pregnant May, 2020. When I found out I was pregnant, he was ecstatic and I was like, oh shit. The reason why I was oh shit is because number one, I'm plus size. Number two, because of my age, I was, I, I felt like it was probably going to be a high risk pregnancy. Um, and I wasn't married. And that nagged, I cannot tell y'all how much it nagged me. There was a lot of internal <coughs> struggle in between. My family didn't even know that he had moved in at this point. I told them, you know, that I was pregnant, um, went to the doctor, everything looked good. Um, but again, because it was COVID, he couldn't go in with me, um, into the actual room. So, you know, doing any sort of ultrasound, doing the blood test because my HCG levels were really high. So the doctor was like, Hey, it might be twins. We don't know yet. Um, you're still kind of early you know, along, um, they gave me a due date. The due date was January 26th of 2021. Um, so yeah, uh, May found out I was pregnant. So there was now more of a push into, we got to get a house. We got to get the fuck up out of here. I'm not having a baby in Riverdale. Okay. Nothing against Riverdale, but I ain't having a baby in Riverdale. So we need we need to we need to find out what's going on with this house and so he was very he was on top of it he had an answer for everything um he was like you know i'm gonna call and find out what's going on blah 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 um he then magically told me about a week later oh they're going to do inspection on the on the house like in two days so I was just like, okay, keep in mind, I'm, I'm taking his word for it. I'm taking his word for all this. So he's like, they're going to do an inspection. Um, once we get the inspection report back, then we will know what, you know, what we are going to be responsible for. What, what are we getting ourselves into? So, um, <laughs> I guess they did an inspection. He showed me an inspection report. Um, only thing that they said that the roof had just recently been replaced, which he, I remember he was very happy about. Um, and the issues that they, that there were for the house were minor. It was not, it was not a bad, cause we did have a discussion about it. He was like, it's not, it's nothing that we can't handle. Then he said that we were set to close, um, the end of May. were set to close the end of May. He told me it was going to be a virtual closing. You're probably like, what the hell is a virtual closing? Because again, he's saying because of COVID, people are not closing in the office. They're doing a virtual closing where um, you would need to electronically sign the paperwork. This is what he's telling me. And so he was like, we're set to close like just before Memorial Day. And so, for some reason, again, there's still that nagging part. For some reason, I didn't start packing. I, anyone that knows me will tell you I hate moving. I've done it enough in my life. I hate moving. But I did not start packing up that house at all. I was just like, you know, I'm pregnant. My body was changing so fast that it was like I can barely keep my eyes open half the day. Um, and so, no, I didn't start packing. And I remember, 
I did record, again, I was recording audio diaries just about every day. When something didn't sit right, I would verbally record it in the audio diary because I was like, I don't know what it is, but there's something. That was the theme of our relationship. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something. Um, and so I remember talking to myself in my little prayer closet because that's where I would do my recordings. And I remember thinking, what if he what if we don't get this house like what if we don't get what if he's lying but again there goes that thought process of why would he lie about this like who makes up that they're buying a house when in fact they're not and then he's showing you all this paperwork like come on you can't be that jaded that you don't even believe what's in front of you. All right? So now we're going to go into part five. Okay, part five. Who the fuck did I marry? So I'm questioning all this stuff in my head out loud on my audio diaries. And then once again, I'm like, but look at what you, well, look at what he's giving you. Like, He's paying. He, it wasn't a question about money. It was just a question of, are we really, are we really about to move into this house? And <clears throat> keep in mind, he's paying all the household bills. He still is. So we were supposed to close before Memorial Day. We didn't. There was an excuse. There was always an excuse with him. Always an excuse. And I didn't know enough about the process to question stuff because I really wasn't involved the way I should have been. And it was giving me a lot of anxiety. So I'm pregnant with a lot of anxiety. Um, and if push, if I'm be a hundred percent honest with y'all, I was not expecting that I was probably going to have a healthy pregnancy because I was stressed. And what I was stressed about is I didn't know what was going on because I wasn't really involved the way that a normal relationship would be involved. Just being honest. Um, so we did not close around, we moved now into June. This is now going into June. Around June 5th, I looked at the house again on Realtor.com. I don't know what made me do it other than, and I don't mean to sound super spiritual. I know that people are like, you know, you may or may not believe in God, but I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, probably the Holy Spirit was like, look at that house on Realtor.com. So I looked at the house on Realtor.com. This was around June 5th. It showed that the house was off the market. And I remember being like, okay, wait, what, is, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Because ex-husband is telling me we're about to close on the house. We're about to close. It's our house. We got furniture, da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. Um, he's also telling me that he's been in contact with the realtor, his friend, who was telling him, you know, this is what was happening next. Here's what's going on. So the guy that we initially worked with apparently is completely out of the picture. But again, I was not heavily involved. So I'm just like, let me look at the house. I see it's off market. What the fuck does off market mean? Like now I'm really freaking out. So it shows the name of the real estate agent for the seller. I don't remember her name. I called her and I said, you know, my, <clears throat> excuse me. I said, my husband and I, even though I wasn't married, my husband and I were looking at this house at one, two, three main street. And we really wanted to tour it, but now I'm showing it's off market. Is it not available or, you know, I, I pulled that card and she was like, Oh no, ma'am. Um, the home closed yesterday. It closed June 4th. Again, there are certain dates I just remember. Um, 
And I said, oh, it closed June 4th? I was like, really? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and she said, yes, ma'am. She was like, um, my, my sellers sold the house. And I was like, oh, man, okay. Well, I said, my husband and I really wanted, you know, we love the pictures of it. And we're getting ready to start a family. So I would have loved to have been able to, you know, have the opportunity to see it. I asked her something. I don't remember the specific question I asked her. And I don't even, I, I have a baby with this man. He's paying all the household bills. Let him get out of the lie. And that's what I did. I purposely made the decision that I knew he was going to come back and I knew he was going to give me some bullshit on why he couldn't buy the house because he didn't know that I knew that house is already sold. The house is already sold. Um, and this is the part where I said, I'm going to be honest, even though it's going to make me look bad because most women in their right mind would have would have been like I'm out and I didn't I purposely made the decision that I knew he was going to come back and I knew he was going to give me some bullshit on why he couldn't buy the house because he didn't know that I knew that house is already sold the house is already sold um and this is the part where I said, I'm going to be honest, even though it's going to make me look bad. Because most women in their right mind would have would have been like, I'm out. And I didn't. So, um, sure enough, he came home. He didn't really say anything that day. The next day I asked him about the house. And he said, my friend, the realtor... Um, he was like, I'm talking to him because something's going on with the interest rate. And when he said that, I felt so much relief because I knew that I had been prepared for, he's going to give you some bullshit. So when he said there's something with the interest rate, I said, you know what? If the int this is literally what I said, y'all, if the interest rate isn't good, then we shouldn't move there. We should probably let this house go. We should cancel whatever furniture we, we ordered or, you know, appliances. And let's just look for another house. I said, I would like to be moved before the end of the year. I said, I really don't want to be nine months pregnant moving into a house. I would like, I would like to be done with this before then. And he was, he, the way I said it was so calm and he was like, okay, he was like, I'm going to call the friend, the realtor and tell him I'm backing out of the house and I'm going to see if I can get my earnest money back. And I remember looking at him, I was standing in the kitchen and I cocked my head to the side and I said, okay, get your earnest money back and let's find another house. And so that's how that first house fell through. So, um, fast forward, I'm looking, I keep looking at this to see how much time I have because you know they only give you 10 minutes. So, this is part five, part six is coming up. But, um, subsequently, what ends up happening the next week, which is mid June, I was at work, um, and I started cramping, started bleeding. Um, and at this point, my doctor, I had just had an ultrasound. So I went to work and I'm going to see if I can get my earnest money back. And I remember looking at him. I was standing in the kitchen and I cocked my head to the side and I said, okay, get your earnest money back and let's find another house. And so that's how that first house fell through. So. Um, fast forward, I'm looking, I keep looking at this to see how much time I have because you know they only give you 10 minutes. So this is part five, part six is coming up, but, um, subsequently what ends up happening the next week, 
which is mid-June, I was at work. Um, and I started cramping, started bleeding. Um, and at this point, my doctor, I had just had an ultrasound earlier that day. So I went to work because the ultrasound was, was fine. I went to work and the cramping and the bleeding started and I started crying because I, I kind of knew what was going on. And, um, my doctor had called me and told me that when they did the ultrasound, they did not see a heartbeat. So she was like, this pregnancy is not going to be viable. So I'm crying hysterical, and now we're going to get into part six. Okay, so this is part six of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? So where we left off. So obviously, um, my doctor had called and told me there was no heartbeat. The pregnancy was not viable at that point, and I was cramping and spotting at work went into my best friend's office and immediately started crying she was like what's going on and I said um I told her what the doctor said and she grabbed her keys grabbed her purse and was like let's go I'm taking you home on my way home I called my boyfriend and told him what the doctor said and he was like I'll meet you at home so he was coming from Duluth went straight home um and so about 24, 48 hours later, I had a doctor's appointment and my doctor gave me three options. First option, let everything happen naturally. Your body will expel the fetus on its own. Second option, you can take a pill which will induce expelling the fetus at home. The pill basically will cause you to contract and expel. The third option was to go into the hospital and do a DNC. I did not want to do a DNC because I did not want to be in a hospital with COVID going on. Um, and for whatever reason, I did not do the option of let it happen naturally. So I chose to do the pill. His birthday was um, June 17th. My ex's boyfriend, excuse me, my ex's birthday was June 17th. So the decision was made. We're going to celebrate his birthday that day, go out to eat. Um, and then that night I would take the pill because we both were off from work the next two days, next two or three days. So um, went out to eat to try to celebrate as best we could and then took the pill that night. That night was the most traumatic, excruciating pain I've ever put my body through. Um, I do not recommend any woman, if prayerfully you don't have to go through that, but I don't recommend taking that pill. If you don't have to, don't do it. Um, I, st I spent the whole night in the bathroom just crying in so much pain. I couldn't take, they gave me a narcotic. I couldn't take it because it was, I found out I was allergic to it. So it was causing me to like projectile vomiting and it, it was a mess. So, um, and he was right there. You know, he was scared that he needed to take me to the ER. But in the morning, the pain kind of subsided. So about 72 hours later, I had another doctor's appointment where the purpose of this appointment was to do an ultrasound to see if everything had passed. Everything did not pass. So because of that, my doctor was like, we're gonna have to do a DNC. Um, my DNC was scheduled for the first week of July. My boyfriend, my ex was going to take me. Um, that was always the plan. Two days before, my procedure he tells me he comes home and tells me that he is up for a promotion he's up to he's up to be promoted to vp because of this the president of the company <coughs> excuse me is coming in and it was going to be this huge business meeting he had to go to um the business meeting was scheduled for the day of my surgery 
And so I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing a fit because I was like, you, you know, you, you, there's no way you can do that meeting. Like I need you to take me to the hospital and all this other stuff. And so he offered to have his sister take me to the hospital. Um, apparently his sister lived in Douglasville. I was like, no, because I've never met her. Like, I'm not, I know, I'm not having a stranger take me to the hospital. No, this is a private situation. I don't want to do that, blah, blah, blah. So my aunt was going to, had offered to take me. And then my friend who took me home from work had offered to take me. So at that point, um, we get into an argument because he's like, my sister is, you know, you, you about your family. So why can't she step in? And I was like, nah, because I don't know her period. I don't know her. So, so my friend offers to take me to the hospital. Cause I was all distressed that he's saying he has a business meeting and he can't take me. So I remember being on I-75 <laughs> on the connector on the phone with her crying because I, I was so embarrassed that he wasn't going to be the one to take me and that I was needing to rely on someone else to take me to the hospital in order to get a DNC done. And she was really great. She was like, girl, this is why you have a village. Like, it's okay. Things happen. The world is crazy right now. I will take you. You're going to be okay. So he did not take me to the hospital um, for my DNC. My friend did. She could not stay because of COVID protocol. Um, so when they wheeled me into pre-op after I got checked in, I texted him and was just letting him know, hey, here's the update. I'm about to, you know, I'm in pre-op. They're going to get me prepared to go back um, to the surgical ward or whatever. And the response I got was from his new executive assistant named David. Now, when he told me he was up for the promotion, he did tell me that part of getting this new job would be that he would get an executive uh, executive assistant named David. And he did tell me, I'm going to make sure that I inform David, if you get a text from this number, meaning from me, um, pull me out of the meeting because, you know, she's my fiance is having um, a procedure done and I'm picking her up. So it's important that you come get me if it's something serious. So I text him. David responds. He said, yeah, Mr. Blah, blah told me that um, you are having a procedure done. If you need me to get him, I can go get him. He's in a meeting. Just let me know what you need. And I just said, no, don't bother him. I'm just giving an update that they're about to take me back. And David responds and says, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. So I have the procedure. I wake up and I am now in recovery. I should be in recovery 45 minutes up to an hour and a half. I wake up. First thing I ask, and I remember asking, is where is so-and-so? The nurse who was so sweet, you know, she was like, everything went well. Um, you're doing great. She said, we spoke to your fiance. He's on his way. So I said, okay, you know, okay. I kind of dozed back out, but I could still hear everything that was going on. I just could not keep my eyes open to save my life. So I hear her talk to the other nurse. And that's when she said, yeah, um, Dr. So-and-so called her fiance and his executive assistant picked up. And the executive assistant said that he was in a business meeting and that, um, you know, you could relate to him what you need to say. And he'll, you know, tell Mr. He'll tell the fiance. And my doctor was like, hell no, <laughs> HIPAA. Um, I need to speak to him. So apparently my fiance called the doctor back about 30 minutes later and the doctor informed him she'll be ready to be discharged in about an hour. You know, you can make your way and come pick her up. He said he was on his way. He was on his way from Duluth to Atlanta, which is not a huge distance, but the time of day, one thing about Atlanta, there's always traffic. So 
he should have been there within the hour. I should have only been in recovery an hour and a half. Let's go to the next part. Part seven, who the fuck did I marry? So he should have, I should have been in recovery at Northside Hospital for about an, at most an hour and a half. Um, subsequently, I ended up being in recovery between three to three and a half hours. The nurses kept calling my ex asking, what's the status? Because they were actually getting ready to do a shift change. So they kept calling asking, what's the status? What's the status? Like, where are you? I want to say that they called a total of three times and they spoke to him twice. Um, so at this point, I knew that they were all like, where is her? Where's her fiance? Like, what is going on? Um, he said he was stuck in traffic, and so he was making his way there. He eventually did get to Northside Hospital, um, and they wheeled me down because, um, again, he couldn't come in um, just because of the protocols. So when I got in the car, um, and I'm in pain, but yet drugged up, couldn't keep my eyes open, couldn't really, I was just out of it. But I remember him calling my aunt and my mother and letting them know, I picked her up, we're on the way home, let me get her settled, and then um, I'll give you guys an update. I remember that. What I did not know was that he had text my aunt and my mom and asked them to not bother me for like a week. Like, just please don't reach out to her. Let her just rest. I am from New Jersey. I am from an African-American family. You don't tell my black mama or my black aunt that, um, you know, please don't bother her for a week. <laughs> I didn't know this at the time, but I'm just interjecting that part. I'm trying to stay in the timeline, but um, he, he did apparently do that. And my aunt was like, why well, will fuck you up? Anyway, so go home. Um, he waits on me hand and foot. I recover. Um, just needed about 24 to 48 hours to just get my mind right. Um, during this time, in between the when the house in Douglasville fell, um, fell through, we had not talked about a house. So I guess it was about a week later after the DNC. He decides that, you know, do you want to start looking for a house again? Excuse me, I have hiccups, y'all. Do you want to start looking for a house again? Because of what happened with the house in Douglasville, I felt like I was smarter this time to say, you know, I want to be involved in every aspect because I don't know what the fuck happened with that house in Douglasville. But what I do know is that he, he lied to me. I didn't think, I, I didn't know then what I know now. I just knew he lied about putting in, or excuse me, I knew he lied about being under contract. So um, I told him, I said, I don't wanna work with your friend who I've never met, never talked to. I know that he has talked to him because he's talked to him in front of me. And I'm gonna demonstrate on one of the videos how he used to do his phone calls. Don't worry, it's coming. So we found a new real estate agent, really nice guy. Um, his name was Scott. I am using his real name. Really nice guy. Um, and we told him what the budget was. And Scott was like, okay, when you guys are ready, we can start looking at houses. Try to look for houses that are empty because you can actually tour those. If it's a house where someone's already living in there, chances are it's going to, have to be a virtual tour because of COVID. So I found a house, um, that I absolutely, in total, we must have looked at about 15 houses. Um, but I found a house in Smyrna that I absolutely loved. We toured the house. Everything about this house was perfect. The house was listed for 699,000. It was a brand new construction build. The only issue was that the basement 
was not finished and he wanted the basement to be his man cave. Um, again, I went with him to tour this house. So this was already feeling very different than the situation in Douglasville because we did not actually tour the Douglasville house. We only did a FaceTime um, virtual tour. This house in Smyrna, we toured. We toured this house more than once. Um, and it was it was gorgeous, fucking gorgeous. So we talked about it. He said that he had the money. Um, again, the price was six ninety nine. He said he felt comfortable putting in an all cash offer. If you remember on the videos before, he told me he had money in his savings from when he played football. So when he said an all cash offer, even I knew you you got that kind of money like where you can cut a cashier's check for 699,000 and he told me he did. He had money in savings um from when he played football and he was very comfortable paying all cash for this home. So the real estate agent, Scott, sent over the paperwork. The paperwork was sent in both of our names. It was sent to my email. Um, that was another thing that I changed after Douglasville. Everything gets sent to me. And then I will be sure that he signs it. So he sent it to me. I looked over the offer. Um, we were asking, excuse me, we were going to put in an all cash full price offer with um, a request to have the basement finished. Also, we were requesting for the seller to give us an answer within 24 hours. Um, we were requesting a quick closing. Um, these are just some of the things I remember. I remember 24 hours, like I didn't want to wait on, y'all think about it. 24 hours, let us know if you're accepting the offer or not. And then also a quick closing because it was a, a new construction. So we didn't have to wait for the current tenant to move out. We didn't have to do that. So I watched in our bedroom as he pulled it up because it was a electronic document. He signed his name to the offer for $699,000 cash. He re requested again, the seller let us know in 24 hours if they were accepting the offer. So we submitted the offer at around 6 p.m. We were requesting that by 6 p.m. the next day, they let us know if the offer was accepted or not. I watched him sign the offer. I sent the offer back to Scott from my email. All parties had signed. Scott texted us and said, I got it. I'm submitting it. I will let you know what they say. Let's go in to part seven. Sorry, let's go into part eight. Good grief, this is getting long. Okay, so I just wanna clear up some things that I realized um, is kind of creating some confusion. So just allow this video to serve as a stop sign. Let's clarify. First of all, the story, background. He was born in Philly, raised in Philly, and moved to Augusta. Um, story is that he moved to Augusta for high school. After high school, he went to college at San Diego State, enjoyed San Diego State, stayed in San Diego for quite a while, um, got married in out in California, had a house in California, played arena football out in California, but his family was back here in Augusta, Georgia. Um, he still had a lot of family up in Philly, but for the most part, he had a sister in Augusta. He had a sister in Douglasville. He had a brother in Baltimore. He had another brother in Philly, and he had um, a brother in Nashville. So I just want to clarify that in terms of um, the demographics, not the demographics, but the geography. Born in Philly came to Augusta for high school, 
went to San Diego State for college, played football, stayed in San Diego, excuse me, stayed at San Diego, got married out there, but still had quite a bit of family here in Augusta, excuse me, here in Georgia. Um, he also had a sister, I think I said, who lived in Douglasville. <sighs> I have physically met his aunt who lived in Augusta. I've met his brother who lives in Augusta. Um, I have spoken on FaceTime with a brother who lives in Baltimore. Um, and then I will demonstrate how he used to talk to the brother that lives in Philly. That's coming up. You haven't missed that. In terms of the proposal, you did not miss the story of the proposal. I simply did want to share it because it was embarrassing. Basically, he gave me three ring options. We went to a jeweler at the Mall of Georgia. He had me pick out three rings. I told him which one I liked the most because I knew it wasn't a, a romantic proposal at all. I knew which ring I liked the most. I told him which one. He, he basically said, when I'm ready, I'll give you the ring and I'll propose. Fast forward um, about, I guess it was summer because I was actually pregnant when the ring came. We were sitting at the dinner table. He took the ring box out of his pocket, slammed it on the dinner table. And I was like, what is this? He was like, open it. I opened it. Inside was the ring that I had wanted, um, that I had chosen at the jeweler. And he was like, all right, so this means that you're going to be my wife. I was pregnant. So, again, when I asked y'all to give me grace, it's because there are certain things that's just like, girl, what was you thinking? Trust me. There's no excuse. Um, so there was never a, will you marry me? It was more of a, we're living together. We're having a baby together. Um, we need to get married because the backstory also was that his dad was a retired police officer, but at one point his father was a pastor. So he could quote the Bible like nobody's business, as we all know, so can Lucifer. But anyway, he could quote the Bible like no one's business. Um, and so that's how we ended up engaged. And I was wearing a ring. I was wearing, I will find a picture and I will try to post it. But I was wearing the ring. Um, don't worry, there's more to that story as well. So just want to clarify some things um, for the people who were like, wasn't it weird that he had a sister who um, lived close, but he's from Philly. So I just wanted to definitely bring clarity to what he told me um, was the backstory. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to California for foot, um, college, played football at San Diego State, played football in arena football. Um, worked at Apple and then joined the condiment company in California, who then transferred him back to Georgia. He was married in California um, and he told me he got divorced in California. That is important as well. That will come up again later. Um, and so the ex-wife at this point in time, at the time that I'm telling you part seven, which is the last video I just posted, the ex-wife lived in California with her two kids, his two uh, stepkids. The two stepkids were 17 and 20 or 21, but they were that age group, that age group. And he was saying that he was very close with them. So he wanted to keep a tight relationship with them. Um, and he talked to them if not every day, every other day. When I say, and I, I when I say this, I need y'all to understand. When I say that he talked to someone, it means that he he was on the phone in front of me, talking to the person. I hope that that, because I will touch back on this. He was on the phone in front of me talking to the person. So he talked to his siblings every day he talked to his aunt 
almost every day. He talked to his family the way I talked to my family almost every day. Um, and again, I will demonstrate how he used to do the phone calls. I will also demonstrate how he used to do the work phone calls because he called me every single day from work. And he would talk to people while he was on the phone with me. And I could hear people in the background, but that's a whole nother part. So again, buckle your seats. I promise I'm reading your comments, I'm reading your questions, but I wanted to bring this video just to clarify some stuff. Hopefully this helps. And um, honestly, I hope I know people are fascinated by this, but more than anything, I hope that there's a woman watching this and she's saying to herself, okay, it's time for me to ask some questions. That's my hope. All right, part eight of who the fuck did I marry? So we submitted an offer on the house in Smyrna. I sent it over to Scott, our realtor, and next day comes, Scott asks if we can take a phone call. So he calls us and tells us that the offer was not accepted and the builder did not do a counter offer. We don't exactly know um, why. Um, we don't exactly know why he didn't accept it, but the bottom line is, is that we figured out later on that he didn't want to finish the basement. So the offer was not accepted. The house fell through. I was okay with that because, again, I knew he had put in an offer. So we continued looking at other houses. We found another house um, in Smyrna that he really liked. Um, I thought that it was way too big for just the two of us. Um, and so the price of this home was much higher than the 750000 that Chase had approved for the mortgage. So what he explained to me was that he was willing to do the $750,000 mortgage and he was also willing to put a significant amount of the money and savings on the house, which meant that he was now comfortable going from $750,000 up to about $900,000. Again, his, his whole explanation was, I have the money where I can put down a substantial down payment, bring down the price of the home, and then basically mortgage the rest of it. So that was now the plan. I was not comfortable with a home <laughs> over $900,000. Um, but again, keep in mind, I saw the Chase paperwork. So I was like, I just feel more comfortable sticking at the 750000 mark. That's what you were approved for. Let's go with that. By this point, this is now fall of 2020. Um, we have been talking about marriage. I had my ring. Um, he had made VP at the company. And again, he was calling me every day from work. Um, the, I need to kind of explain how the company was ran because when you think VP, you would think he would be in an office. It was a condiment company, so they actually were producing the condiments, and I'm not saying the name of the company on purpose, but they were producing the condiments um, in this particular plant location. So a lot of times, he would simply tell me that he walked the floor um, checking in with his subordinates, basically. Now, how did he go to work? For the most part, at this point, he left before I woke up. However, pretty much he wore dress pants, um, kind of like a, deep, a dark navy blue cargo pant. And he had a polo shirt with the company logo on it. What I saw a lot of times is that he would not wear the polo shirt to work. He would wear like a company t-shirt. He would wear rubber sole shoes and the um, navy blue cargo pants. I didn't think it was a uniform, but it definitely, it reminded me of what someone would wear when I worked at Amazon, if you're gonna be doing manual labor. 
He didn't go to work sloppy looking at all, but it definitely was not suit and tie. Nowhere near suit and tie. Um, it is fair to note that outside of work, he was a man who he loved to dress. He loved to wear the latest Jordans. He loved to collect watches. He collected a lot of Invicta watches. Um, he he loved to collect hats. He wore hats, baseball caps everywhere because he didn't like the shape of his head. Um, so in terms of how he dressed casually, the man, he could dress. Um, in terms of how he dressed for work, yeah, he didn't dress like a VP. But his excuse was... I'm constantly walking the production floor and I can't be in a suit and tie walking the production floor where they're creating the condiments that we're selling. So by this point, again, this is fall. We're still looking at houses. Um, we're still touring houses as much as we can because it is COVID. Um, we had found another house that we really liked and a house that I really, truly wanted to put an offer in on. This was now going to be the second house that we put an offer on. He put in the the asking price, I believe, was about 700000 He put in under asking um, an offer for about 650000 I'm guessing, but I'll try to find the house and put it on this and put it on the story. Um, the reason that that house fell through. <sighs> We found out that the home was sitting on a septic tank. We found out that the septic tank had an issue and it would have taken about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to fix the septic tank. The sellers were not willing to fix the septic tank. Personally, I ain't really care for the house that much. I'm the one who was like, I don't really want it. So even though we put an offer in, we had twenty four hours where we could uh pull our offer back. And so we did. Once we found out, I believe it was in the disclosure. And if you're a realtor, please feel free to tell me if I'm using the wrong terminology. But I believe it was in the disclosure that they told us the septic tank needs to be replaced. That's when I was like, nah, I don't, I don't want that house. Um, so we pulled out. The house fell through. And so... I was fine with it because again, I was heavily involved. I saw him sign the offer. I knew every step of what was going on. Our real estate agent, Scott, was amazing, but you will see in, when I get to it where he made a mistake as a real estate agent. So house number two fell through. Um, we then moved on, saw a few more houses, and then we get to house number three. I'm going to pause talking about the houses because now I need to introduce what happened with the cars. Stay tuned. All right, part nine of who the fuck did I marry? So we're pausing on the house stuff. Let me tell you about the car. So when I met my ex-husband, I was driving a 2012 Nissan Rogue, um, fully loaded, it had quite a few miles on it, but it, it got me from A to B. It was, in a, it was in good condition, but I was upside down in the car. He was driving a 2018 Ford Taurus. Um, super, uh, sport mode. I know he had a sport mode on the car, and I love driving that car. Um, when he told me how he was a regional manager, he told me that one of the perks that came with the job was that he would be getting a company car. And so... We spent time going to Range Rover of South Atlanta. Um, we spent time going to Jaguar. We spent time going to BMW. We spent time going to uh, Ford, which was on Mount Zion in Morrow, if you all are familiar with that area. He test drove a whole lot of cars. In the end, he decided on a BMW sedan. I was there when he test drove the car i got in the car with him i loved it um and he explained to the salesperson you know i'm getting a company car i need to get a printout of the full price of the car tax tag and title because what my company is going to do is wire over the money for the car 
the salesperson was like okay you know apparently apparently that happens a lot so he gave him a printout with the tax tag and title for the car um in front of me and the salesperson he called the person in the finance department for his job obviously i have no idea what this person's name is but he called the person he explained to them this is the amount of money he said the president of the company so and so has authorized for him to get a car not spending more than i think ninety thousand tax tag and title the bmw came out to just under ninety thousand um and so he i remember this conversation so fucking vividly so He's, he's on the phone in front I'm standing I'm sitting down the salesperson sitting down at their desk and he's like they you know they put me on hold and so he's like he I guess the person comes back and he says um, yeah the, the price of the car is blah 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 he was like give me a second and I can send you a picture of that printout that shows tax tag and title for the BMW he gets off the phone he takes a picture of it. He sends it to whoever. He waits about 10 minutes. He calls the person back. He says, did you get it? Apparently the person did get it. But the person who can who can actually physically do the wire transfer had gone home for the day. So what he says to um, the BMW salesperson, he's like, okay, we're gonna have to do this tomorrow because so-and-so went home for the day. I don't know who the salesperson is. I can only tell you from my viewpoint what I thought. I had no reason to think this was a lie. I really didn't. Because again, you got to keep, please keep in mind the circumstances that all of this is happening. We're inside the dealership. We're sitting at the desk of this person. He gave us the printout. He's on the phone, do, you know, doing business, basically saying, look, I need this is how much money the car is going to cost he's taking a picture of it he seemingly is texting someone saying this is how much you know this is proof of how much it is then he asked the bmw salesperson i need your wire transfer information the guy got up rushed over to i guess their finance area to get the wire the bank wire information because obviously you have to wire it a certain kind of way rushes back over gives it to my ex-husband my ex-husband's like okay first thing in the morning we will get this wired over and then you know i'll come and pick up the car my fiance me will drive me up here to pick up the car so we leave he felt like because at the time that this all happened i was pregnant so he felt like look we're about to have a baby i don't want you driving that nissan rogue I want to get you something up. I want to get you something more secure, something new. I really wanted a Kia. <laughs> I really wanted a Kia Telluride. Um, and he was like, well, let's, let's look at the warranty. This man knew a lot about cars. He knew a lot about the warranty. He knew a lot about the depreciation value. And so he did talk to me a lot about what will we get the most for our money. Um, we test drove, when I say we, I, I test drove a Kia Telluride, a Kia Sorento. He didn't like either of those. He had me test drive a Ford Explorer. He didn't really care for that. Then came time where he really wanted me to get a BMW. Um, he really wanted me to get a BMW X5. So he took me to B Global BMW Imports which if you know anything about Atlanta, it's off of Cobb Parkway, but you can see it off of set, uh, off the highway. I believe 285 is where you can see the Global Imports BMW dealership. He took me there. He had me test drive an X5 and X6. Um, he also had me test drive a, uh, I think I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, a 525, which was a sedan. I did not like that. I wanted an SUV. Um, I loved driving the BMW. He also had me drive an M series, test drive an M series. So he was very adamant that I should get a BMW. The reason being is because according to him, he had a BMW in California. 
when he lived in San Diego. He had a BMW that he loved. It was a white BMW. He showed me pictures of the BMW. So he showed me pictures of this white BMW that he had. And unfortunately, the car got totaled about two months before he moved to Georgia. So he had received um, money, not a lot, but of some money to get another car. And he used it to get the Ford Taurus because he was like, I just need a car that's going to get me from A to B until I get into a house and I'm much more settled. For him, he was like, I'm really giving myself 60 days to get settled here in Georgia after moving from California. But then he met me. Again, that's the story. So he had me test drive the BMW. So much so, I loved the BMW, loved it. I wanted a dark blue BMW with cognac interior. I wanted an X5 and I wanted an M series. So I can clearly tell y'all that's exactly the car I wanted. We were online looking for that particular car because not every dealership had it. I was okay with a black BMW if needed. Um, but I really wanted dark blue and I really wanted that cognac colored interior. So he felt like I want you to still, I want you to consider all of a sudden an Audi Q8. Let's just see how you like it. If you don't really like it, then we will go back to the BMW. I cannot tell you why he switched up. I can't. Um, but I can tell you he took me to an Audi dealership on Peachtree Industrial. He test drove an Audi and I test drove an Audi Q8. Um, I loved the Q8. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I was tired of test driving cars. By this point, I had test driven test driven so many cars um our weekends were spent either looking at a house or test driving cars and i was picky i will admit that so he had me test drive the q8 i really liked it i finally just told him look i'm good with either the bmw or the audi because i'm tired of, i'm tired of test driving cars he told my family he was buying me a new car because it, keep in mind he had well, not keep in mind. Let me let y'all know. He had met my family initially on Zoom because, again, we were locked down. He had met my family. Um, he also had met my family in person because at this point, it was like, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, maybe we can do family dinner. Um, and so we had. So he had met my family in person. And now we will go ahead and move towards part 10 of this series. Okay, part 10. Who the fuck did I marry? Okay, had to sneeze. All right, so at this point, I had test driven all these cars. Kia's, um, hell, he even had me test drive a Nissan Murano. But the main two were BMW and an Audi. He had told my grandfather he was getting me a car. He had told my aunt he was getting me a car that he was going to, he, he was like, she's going to be my wife. I want her to be in something secure. So my family was really like, wow, you know, uh, wow. You know, who knew that he had this kind of money? Um, and so I hated the fact that he did that because anytime he got around my family, here's another red flag to put in, in the United Nations of red flags. He would always talk about money and he would always brag. I never realized it in real time. I didn't realize it until I was out of the situation. He always bragged about the fact that he could fight, the fact that he had money, and the fact that he played football. Those are the three things he always bragged about. Back to the cars. So I told him, I was like, pick one between the BMW and the Audi, because you said you're buying it. So pick one. So this man chose the Audi. So he takes me to the dealership. I wanted a white Q8. He does the, give me the printout of how much it's gonna cost tax tag and title to get this Q8. Gentleman who's helping us gives him the, the printout. He's saying he's going to pay this money for the car out of the savings account that's, that's offshore. That's the story, that's what he's saying. 
So he apparently is asking the guy, you know, is there a holding fee? Can I pay a holding fee to secure this car while I'm working to get the money transferred? Because obviously with COVID, it's going to take long for the banks to transfer the money. Side note, I need everyone to understand one of the reasons why he was able to get away with the stuff he got away with is because we were on lockdown. It's crazy because it's now 2024, but I don't know. Do we all remember how it seemed like a lot of stuff stopped in 2020? Now, keep in mind, that's not an excuse I'm making because shit still got done. But in terms of business as usual, business as usual just was not happening in 2020 at this time so when he's saying oh it's going to take a while for the bank to transfer the money the gentleman who was working at audi did not even he didn't make a face he didn't he he didn't blink he was like i know it's going to take a while because of covid so basically what ends up happening is we leave he has the printout he calls the bank or he calls his his um financial advisor who does have a name the financial advisor's name is eric i feel comfortable using certain people's names especially if we find out they didn't exist um so he calls eric he tells eric in front of me in front of me hey i need to transfer seventy two thousand five hundred and twenty six dollars whatever the amount was because i'm buying a car for my fiance this is the bank account information. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or do you need me to email it to you? Pause. I can't hear what the person's saying, but that's what he would do. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or can I email it to you? Okay. Okay. All right. Give me a few minutes and I'll go ahead and email it to you. All right. Let me know. I'll call you back to let to find out if you received it. Okay. Hang up. So I'm hearing this because, again, I'm not paying attention to, did I hear anybody on the other phone? Did I hear anybody on the other end? So he, um, he proceeds to type up an email, type up something, telling him this is the information that we need. Um, I didn't think anything of it. He called me at work the next day to tell me that the money was sent to Audi, that he called Audi. And he confirmed with Audi that they received the money. What he told me is that the car is going to be um, delivered to the house. Y'all, we it's not that I lived in a hood, because I didn't. But I did not live in an area of Clayton County where you would have a brand new Audi delivered to your house. So I remember saying to him, I don't want that car, like, delivered to the house not yet because i need to put that car in the garage and my nissan was i only had a one car garage so my nissan was in the garage so he said okay well let me call them back and change the delivery date can you be home or can you t do a half day so he's asking me can you work a half day so that they can deliver the car and you and you will be home for it i said yes that's fine because again, it's COVID, I'm working from home anyway. Um, I only had to go in the office two days a week. So I, I'm at home the next day. He told me the car would be delivered between the hours of one and three. Hmm. Obviously between one and three, nothing happened. So three o'clock I called him. He's at work, he sends me the voicemail. He calls me back. I said, it's three o'clock. I didn't, no one ever came with the car. Um, what's going on? And then I remember I was like, well, do I need to call Audi myself? Cause I thought that you handled it, but if you didn't handle it, let me, do I need to call them? And so whenever I would suggest I will handle it, he would get very, very defensive. Red flag number 472. So he was like, no, I will call Audi. Don't do anything. I'll call Audi and find out what's going on. Okay. So I'm at home chilling, cooking dinner, normal night. He calls me back and says, yeah, the car was stuck on the truck in Spartanburg because apparently that's where their deliveries come from. So 
when he told me this, I was in the kitchen laughing because by this point, I will be honest. And I told y'all I'll be honest, even when it makes me look bad. I was guilty of on one hand, I believed him. And on the other hand, I was like, let me see what lie he come up with. Let me just see. Um, but keep in mind, my brain was really like not rationalizing, not comprehending how deep the lie was. I just thought that no one told him the car was going to be delivered and he made that up. I had no idea how deep the lie went. So he said, you know, the car's in Spartanburg. Um, it should be delivered this weekend. The weekend came, he had a whole other excuse. Um, I don't remember what the exact excuse was as to why the car was never delivered. I do remember we got into an argument and I was like, don't even worry about it. I'm going to get a new car my damn self. I don't even need your help. Which is probably one of the worst things you can tell a narcissist because they love to be the hero. You know, they look, it's, it's all about them. But I was like, don't even worry about it. I'll get when I when I have the money to get a car myself, I'll do it. I don't want to hear anything else about a new car. I don't want to hear shit else about a car. Because at this point, I was spending way too much time trying to figure out are we getting a car? Are we getting a house? Like where what the fuck is going on? Always there was an excuse. So when I told him, I don't want to hear anything else about a car and I am not going to a dealership to test drive another car, um, that ended that whole discussion right there. So this is what I'm, this is where I'm going to interject what I believe was happening. I believe that my ex-husband is the type of person he gets off, uh, you know, nut. he gets off on you being excited about something that he knows you will never get. So I believe that he enjoyed going to car dealerships. He enjoyed um, watching me test drive a car and get excited about it, knowing I was not going to get it. It is the, it is the level of cruelty. And again, I'm telling y'all stuff, stuff that I found out way later on. It is the level of cruelty that I still cannot comprehend. So the whole issue about the BMW and the Audi, I think he just enjoyed seeing me get excited and then pull it away. Part 11 coming up. All right, part 11. So for this part, I'm just gonna give you some backstory on the family. Pause all the stuff about the house, pause the stuff about the car. This is backstory on his family, my ex-husband's family. All right, follow me. My ex-husband's parents, mom and dad, are both deceased. Mom passed away from cancer. Um, dad passed away shortly after her. I'm not sure what he passed away from. So he has a number of siblings. He has two, with his parents, he has um, two siblings, two brothers, excuse me, two brothers. One is older, lives in Philly. One is younger by two years lives in Nashville. He has two sisters. One, Shantae, is older, lives in Douglasville with her husband and two kids, a boy and a girl. Younger sister, Kim, is the baby, lives in Augusta with her husband, worked at, I think he told me, Procter & Gamble. That was the story. He had two half-brothers that were through his dad. One brother lived in Baltimore, the other brother lived in Augusta. The brother that lived in Augusta, I have physically met in person, shook hands, hugged, all that. The brother that lived in Baltimore, I have FaceTimed with, talked to him. The brother that lived in Philly, the older brother that he looked up to, I have never talked to him on the phone. I would always talk to him um through my through my ex-husband so the conversation would be like hey babe uh brother brother so-and-so said hey he didn't call him brother so-and-so we'll call him john john said hey hey john i would be in the bathroom doing my hair brushing my teeth hey john and he'd be like did you hear 
he said how you doing i was like i'm good how's he doing um because that's just me and so he would relay back and forth back and forth back and forth um he talked to john every day from starting around july after the grandmother passed away he would talk to john every morning we both would be getting ready for work and he would be on the phone with John. They will be talking for 30, 40 minutes, talking about football, talking about other siblings. They would be talking about cars. They talk, I mean, it was, it was really like not a big deal. They would talk about the brother in Baltimore. They would talk about the brother in Augusta and then they would, they would reminisce. This is the conversations I could hear. Let me explain. When I say I can hear a conversation, what that means is I am physically standing near him or next to him where I could hear him with the phone up to his ear talking to someone because it wasn't me. Okay. I may not hear the other person because the phone call may not be on speakerphone. But what I hear is, um, for example, I hear... Hey man, what y'all doing? Oh, for real? Y'all barbecuing this weekend? What y'all making? Oh, that's what's up. Nah, I think me and her gonna stay in this weekend. Cause you know, these numbers is looking crazy with COVID. Yeah, she over here. She's just sitting right here. She watched the TV. Okay, hold on. John said, hey. Hey, John. You heard her? Okay. All right, bro. I just wanted to check in on you. That's the type of conversation I'm explaining. Okay, so I hope that that gives a little more clarity about the type of conversations I'm hearing. So, um, I don't know why this light keeps going out. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's how he would talk to his siblings. The grandmother passed away. He called me around April or May <clears throat> and told me that his grandmother passed away his grandmother um, on his dad's side had died suddenly from COVID. She had symptoms. She went to bed and did not wake up. He was distraught. He was crying. He wasn't eating. He was just sitting there um, listening to music, not watching TV, just sad because he was like, you know, my grandmother was always my, my support system. So from what I saw, it really bothered him. I did not think anything of it. I'm one of those people. If you tell me somebody in your in your family passed away, I'm gonna believe you because I don't play about death. And I guess I expect other people don't either. Um, however, however, that is not the same for everyone else. But we'll get there. So, family. He talked to his. He had his uh, sister Shantae who lived in Douglasville. Um, like I said, she was married with two kids. Apparently she was a nurse. So when I had my miscarriage, that was a sister that he was like, my sister will take you to the hospital. Like that's what family does. Okay. Um, I had never met Shantae. I've been on the phone or excuse me. I've been around him when he was on the phone with Shantae. Never heard her part of the conversation. Um, but he would be talking to his sister that's what he said that's what it sounded like too um now what is interesting is that we lived maybe 35 40 minutes away from douglasville so there were plenty of times that he had invited me to go with him to his sister's house okay let me tell you how this would always work out total times he invited me was probably three times for different barbecues or whatnot the first time he invited me i was like no nah, i ain't going because again covid and she's a nurse hell no um the second time he was like yeah she invited us but i don't think we should go because covid no the third time we agree i agreed to go i was like absolutely i'll go meet your sister like that'd be great um on our way to her house to douglasville to go see the sister um apparently he got a phone call the phone was always like on vibrate but he got a phone call and 
he told me that something came up and so she's she had to cancel the barbecue to get together whatever um and so i was just like oh man you know okay well hopefully we can go another time it was it didn't happen close enough for me to have red flags if that makes sense um but at this point as y'all probably like girl you so blind but again i didn't think anything of it because it's like okay it fell through we'll see we'll reschedule um and so we just went out to eat and then he talked to another brother the brother from augusta that he would have on speakerphone so it was like you know i didn't i didn't think anything of it i really didn't um man and the more i talk about it the more i realize like i i'm not a dumb person but it just never dawned on me the things that you have to now investigate um it just it didn't dawn on me but nevertheless that is the backstory for his family right grandmother passed away three weeks later he called me and told me his uncle had passed away from covid the uncle had tested positive had to go into the hospital and he died it was um a bit of a red flag it was a bit of a red flag but like i said i don't play about death so i was just like wow because of these two deaths he became a stickler about covid and when i mean a stickler wear your mask wear gloves hand sanitize wash your hands like he was annoying about making sure neither one of us caught covid so now i'm gonna give you the backstory in regards to what i was told with the ex-wife okay i know i look rough but it's okay it's okay anyway so this is part 12 of who the fuck did i marry so this is the backstory on what i was told for the ex-wife this is important pay attention <laughs> all right this is 2020 so this is what i was told in 2020 i was told that he and his ex-wife used to be friends then they started dating and subsequently got married they got married in california um, he had bought a house with the money that he made from arena football they had apparently had gotten married on the downward of the arena football career um had a nice house he showed me a picture of the house showed me pictures inside the house remember that showed me pictures inside the house it was a really nice home in san diego and um basically what happened was that he came home from work early one day and have the hiccup sorry came home early from work one day and his wife was sleeping with another man the man was in the house he and the man get into it her son who um is about 17 years old in 2020 um she had two kids a daughter and a son the son apparently was on his way home from school when my ex-husband found his previous wife in bed with another man so the story goes that he and the guy fought he kicked the guy out he kicked his ex-wife out but told her the kids could stay the kids are not biologically his those are his stepkids um she was like you must be kidding like i'm not leaving my kids here the kids are old enough to where um they were like we're, we don't want to go because you fucked up we don't want to leave so apparently she leaves um the kids stay with him for a few weeks and uh then she gets her own place the kids move out move in with their mom he um he files for a divorce in california he files for divorce in California and it was an ugly divorce. She was asking for spousal support, all kinds of stuff. And then it turned into, um, you know, I'll help you with the kids, not child support, but just I'll, I will give you some money for the kids because apparently he was very close to the kids and he wanted to keep a relationship with the kids. Their biological fathers, apparently there were two fathers, their biological fathers were not in the picture. 
So um, the divorce starts out contested and ugly, eventually becomes amicable. Eventually they become cordial with each other. So my ex-husband moved. This is all all before he ever met me. So I'm telling you the story of what I was told in 2020. So eventually about two years later is when his job approached him about an opportunity to transfer to Georgia. And so he took it. New beginning, fresh start. He has family in Georgia. He took it. He told me this story pretty much the second or third conversation we had. Um, so it was always from the beginning that she had cheated. He caught her and um, he had filed for divorce, but he was still close to the kids. They still had a great relationship. I've heard him. I've heard him on the phone with the kids, you know, just encouraging them, helping them, helping the 17 year old like with homework. Um, the kids really apparently wanted to meet me. And I was fine with that. Um, he would, apparently he would send them money, you know, if they needed something because he he loved the kids as if they were his own. I'm telling you the story as I was told it in 2020. So let's see, around April or May of 2020, he informs me that his ex-wife has moved to Georgia. Apparently she's staying with her sister in Gwinnett County. So she has moved to Georgia. The two kids are now in Georgia. And so when he tells me all this, I'm like, so what was that supposed to mean? Now, I will say this. He never made it seem as if she wants him back. He never presented that. It was always, no, nah, you know, we're, we're cool for the kids. We're cool for the kids. Um, but he he's never presented that she was trying to get him back. I feel like it's fair to her for me to say that. Um, and again, stay with me. It all comes out. But um, that was the backstory in regards to the ex-wife. That they got married in California. They divorced in California. And then she eventually moved to Georgia, to Gwinnett County, after he had transferred to Georgia for his job. Um, he did tell me that, you know, every now and then he'll get a text message from her. Um, he told me that he, you know, told her when I was pregnant. He felt like she needed to hear that from him instead of hearing it from the kids. Um, and we got into a bit of an argument about that. But, honey, in the big scheme of things, that... <sighs> anyway, so we got into an argument about that. I felt like the fuck, is, that's none of her business. Um, but that's the, the overall backstory of her. So, remember, because <laughs> there will be a quiz. But just remember, he... Um, met her in California, married her in California, divorced her in California. She moved to Georgia, to Gwinnett County after he moved to Georgia. Are we clear? Okay. Okay. Part 13 of who the fuck did I marry? Um, so I've kind of given you guys all the backstory. Let's just kind of recap real quick. So I told you how we met met in March of 2020. Um, basically, Georgia got shut down. I keep saying shut down, got locked down. We decided to quarantine together. I know it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, I really liked him <laughs> and thought he liked me. So um, I told you guys how we met. Um, things moved at a rapid, rapid pace. Met in March moved in together pretty much beginning of end of March, beginning of April, found out I was pregnant in May, lost the baby in June, had to have surgery in July, started looking for houses, um, started looking at cars. All this stuff happened literally between March and the end of, excuse me, in August is when I got my car. So, um, Got a car in August. He paid the down payment for that car. Um, 
which I was shocked by. And no, it was not a BMW or an Audi. It was a Nissan Altima, but I loved that car at the time. So he paid the down payment for that car. He told me he would help me with the car payment. The biggest mistake that I made, and I'll explain why I say this. The biggest mistake I made was that I signed myself up for a car, a car note, where I knew I needed his help to pay the car note. I knew better. My mom has always taught me, do not ever put yourself in a position where you were financially dependent on a man. And all of that went out the window. And the reason why I say that was the biggest mistake is because when I have pulled back the layers of this whole monstrosity of life <laughs> that I lived for 2020 and 2021, it really does boil down to the fact that I truly ended up marrying him more out of fear than anything else. And I'll expound upon that later. But um, I got the car in August. And by this point, I was I was exhausted of looking at cars. I was mad that I didn't get a BMW X5 dark blue with cognac interior. Um and I was tired of looking at houses, getting my hopes up, looking at a house and picturing myself in the master bedroom, the kitchen, the island, you know, all that stuff. I'm a visual person and I was tired of giving my getting my hopes up. Um, so now we're going to segue into fall going into the holidays. <sighs> Here's what happened. In October, we looked at another house. This house was in Marietta. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, it was gorgeous. I want to say that the house was about $700,000. I really liked the house. I could see myself living there. I could see myself cooking there. Um, and so subsequently... My ex-husband put in an all-cash offer on that house. I watched him put an all-cash offer in on the house. Our real estate agent, Scott, called us about 24 hours later. And he said, um, the sellers love your offer. The offer was an all-cash, full asking price offer. 700000 let that sink in for a moment. He said the sellers love the offer. They are asking that you do that you show proof of funds so that they can accept the offer. My ex-husband said, I will show proof of funds when they accept the offer. The seller said, Great, we'll accept the offer when you show proof of funds. So basically we got into a stands a standoff. Um, and if you're a real estate agent or you work in real in um, real estate, I would love to know your thoughts on this. I had asked people in my personal life, like, have you ever heard of this before? And I've had plenty of people who said I side with the ex-husband. I would not show my bank statements until they um, accepted the offer. And then I had other people who were like, I wouldn't accept an all cash offer unless I verify that the person can pay. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Okay. So our real estate agent called us and was like, guys, you know, the sellers are giving you two days to show proof of funds. I had the letter that he showed me from Chase. I sent that to Scott, but that was for a mortgage. The offer was for all cash. So he needed to show all that he needs to show proof of funds that he had the cash to pay $700,000. He didn't show it. He refused to budge on showing them um, proof of funds until they accepted the offer because he was afraid that they were going to create a bidding war. So what ended up happening was Scott called us and said, you know, I apologize because I didn't do my due diligence as a realtor. He said, before I ever started showing you guys a house, I should have 
um, collected your pre-approval letter and proof of funds. He said, so at this point, my broker has informed me that I cannot show you guys another house until you show at least us, meaning the um, real estate firm, until you show us proof of funds. And so I'm just like, well, I'm telling my ex-husband, just show them the fucking proof of funds. Like, what's the problem? Um, And so it was a lot of, you know, I don't really, I find that this is really unprofessional because it's not our fault that you didn't do your job correctly. It, It got a little ugly and it got uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't understand why you don't show them proof of funds when you clearly just signed a document stating that you're putting an offer in at full asking price. This was the same thing that the realtor was saying. He was like, but you just signed an offer. So what's the problem? Like you want them to accept the offer and then you'll show everyone the proof of funds. And my ex-husband without missing a beat said, yes. So Scott did his best to work with the seller and say, look, accept the offer. He'll show you, he'll open the books. He'll show you the proof of funds. These sellers were like, no, that's not. And it wasn't so much the sellers. It was the seller's agent. Big respect to the seller's agent. Um, But the seller's agent was like, no, that's not how we're doing business. He needs to show those proof of funds before before I advise my clients to accept his offer period. If he's not willing to do it, we'll go on to the next offer because they did have another offer on the table for, um, it was less than asking price, but, um, they were willing to accept that offer over the all cash offer because those people had basically shown proof. So subsequently the house fell through, we passed the two day deadline. They went with the other offer. Also, at this point, our real estate agent, Scott, and I do not blame him for this, pretty much cut all ties because what he, I believe, felt like was, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on and this is not how I do business. So until you guys are ready to show the proof of funds um, needed to buy a house, you need to get yourself another agent. Because we were already about 20 to 25 houses deep by this point. We had already put in two other offers. They fell through. And now here we are with this house. And once again, it fell through. Okay, so um, good news and bad news. Number one, this is part 14 of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? Bad news. This is going to be the last post for the night. And the reason why, good news, um, tomorrow's my birthday. So I'm just going to make this video, post it, and then I will pick back up probably Friday. Because honestly, I truly want um, to enjoy my birthday tomorrow. I just I just want to enjoy my birthday. Um, all right. So y'all don't be upset. <laughs> just if anything watch parts 1 through 14 and then um we'll be ready for part 15 so the house fell through in October 2020 and what I told him was I said I don't want to look at another house I don't want to talk about cars I want to get through the holidays Um, because it was going to be a holiday season where I could not celebrate my family because of COVID. So I said, I just want to get through the holidays. I want to get through the end of the year. Um, and we'll revisit stuff in January. I was very calm when I said it, no argument, nothing like that. Um, and he said he understood. I just... A lot of what fueled me staying in this situation really was the fact that, number one, I didn't want to be alone. Number two, I didn't want to look stupid um, by having the relationship end so quickly for everyone to be like, we told you something was up. Um, And number three, I was ready to get married. And that 
what ready to get married fueled a lot of stuff um and again i was still making my audio diaries so listening back to it i knew something was was wrong i admit that i knew something was wrong but what i thought it was truthfully was like why does it seem like there's always something like why can't we just go ahead and get the house um why is it always something why can't i just get the bmw it still didn't dawn on me how deep this something went and for the people who keep asking um i'm going in order of events so yes there will be a video where i explain how everything came out and what came out what was true what was not true it's coming i'm just getting all of this out in order so i told him i didn't want to look at a house no more um i don't want to talk about houses do not mention the word zillow do not mention the word the word uh realtor nothing let me just get through the holidays and for myself the question was what do you want to do you want to stay with him or do you want to cut your losses and the part that kept me constantly second guessing myself was what if he's not lying what if he's not lying there's no literally the conversation i had with myself was there's no way he is lying about having money you saw you saw the paper from chase they don't just approve $750,000 for a mortgage for anybody um you see i've seen his checking account you see how much money's in his available checking like you you i don't think he's lying <laughs> i don't think he's lying about that but what is it is it that he doesn't trust me like i second guess myself so much is it that he doesn't trust me is it that maybe he doesn't really want to get married like what is it because I know what I saw. I know what I heard. I know that he's having conversations about move the money from this account to that account. Um, I know he's paying my car note and all these bills. Like clearly this man is making money. I know that I saw the the promotional the letter from HR that states his new salary is two hundred and something thousand. Um and I remember thinking like, God, what, like, what am I missing? I'm missing something, but what is it? Because I know what I've seen. I've no, I know what I have touched. I have physically touched these, these papers. Like I know how to read. So what is it that I am missing? He's close to his family. He talks to them all the time. You know, he's just a regular guy that just likes to watch um, NFL football. He leaves me alone when I want to watch Georgia football. Um, you know, he's paying all he's paying the bills, groceries. I haven't had to worry financially since I've met him. And as a woman who had lived on her own, paying her own bills, my God, that is the most intoxicating feeling when you meet a guy who just takes your stress and your worry away financially. But the downside is he took away the stress and the worry financially away and instead brought a mental fuck job I've never in my life had experienced and I could not put my finger on it. I couldn't really talk to anybody about it because I'm a big believer in what happens at home stays at home. So I didn't talk to my girlfriends about it. I didn't talk to my family about it. But I'm just, I, re I just remember being like, what am I missing? What am I missing? Um, so we did not talk about houses. We did not look at cars. We didn't do any of that for November, December. And he came to me like around Thanksgiving. And he, what I thought was a very open, loving conversation. And in that conversation, he was like, okay, I know I have fucked up. 
I know that things are not feeling too strong right now. He was like, I want us to get married. I want I, I want a home. Um, I will show you whatever you need to see to put you at ease. Um, he was very, um, like contrite. He was very just like, what, what do, what do I need to do to put your mind at ease so that, you know, I'm in this and that I want this and that I love you and I want you to be my wife. Um, so I was like, show me your accounts. He showed me his checking he showed me he showed me one of his savings he showed me a chase savings um he did not show me the offshore and he did not show me the US bank so he showed me those two accounts checking and chase savings so i knew that there was money what I saw in those accounts, there was money. I told him, I was like, if we're going to buy a house, I want it to be through the mortgage on Chase. I don't want to deal with this proof of fund shit no more. I said, I do not want to look at another house until the beginning of the ne- of the new year. He said, okay. That is when we then had a conversation. So I guess I lied because we are going to have a part uh, 15 or 16 tonight. Um, but... That is when we then had the discussion about marriage. And that is where religion came into play. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I'll give y'all the other part tonight. Stand by. Okay, part 15. Who the fuck did I marry? So in December of 2020, around beginning of December, we had a conversation, kind of a come to Jesus heart to heart conversation and both of us had grown up in the church and the fact that we were un the fact that we were not married but living together the fact that almost had a baby together um bothered both of us both of our families my family and (laughs) his family um were very adamant like okay y'all y'all either need to get married or y'all need to separate Um, and so I'm walking around with a ring on, um, which I'll post a picture of the ring because God, there's so much to unpack. But anyway, walking around with the ring. And so he said to me, whatever I need to do to do my part, to make this work, I'm willing to do. At the same time, It wasn't that I did not trust him as much as it was. I felt like I wasn't trusting myself because, again, like I said in the previous video, I know what I saw. I know what I read. I know what I've heard. um, But fuck, something was not sitting right with me. And every time I would question it in my head, the other side of me was like, "Okay, you know, he ain't lying about the money because you saw it. So, you know, he ain't lying. Girl, are you that? Like, I remember saying to myself, are you that jaded that you don't even know what it's like to have a decent man? Yes, I really had the audacity to have that thought. So we agreed beginning of December, like we wanted to be together. I believe I loved him. I believed he loved me. So the decision was made that we were going to get married. It's still COVID. So we had to follow certain protocol. So we filed um, our marriage license in um, Fayette County, Georgia, because (laughs) you could not get an appointment in Clayton County to save your life. So we filed the marriage license in Fayette County. On our marriage license, it asked the number of um, previous marriages. He said one, I had zero. It asked for our social security numbers. He put his social security number down. I put my social security number down. I mentally wrote down his social security number. 
and I did a background check. I did a background check after I had filed a marriage license. Yes, I know, but I did. The background check, um, nothing came back. It was, uh, it was, it was like no results found. Um, I did a criminal background check, nothing came back. So I thought one of two things, either I had the wrong social, meaning I wrote down the wrong social, or my paranoia was unfounded. There's nothing wrong with him because he has been always throughout the relationship a big stickler about law enforcement, um, following the law because his dad was a retired police officer. So this is someone who has been... This is a guy who would check to make sure my tail lights were working, make sure my signals were working, make sure my oil was good, make sure I had enough gas in the car. So when the criminal history came back with no results, I was like, well, of course there isn't because the man probably hasn't had so much as a speeding ticket. So felt we uh, filed the marriage license and then we made an appointment to get married and waiting for the judge to come out of chambers so that she could marry us. And the reason why I'm pausing is because, my God, if I could go back and see that young woman sitting in that lobby. Wow. I know we can't go back in time, but damn, if I could go back in time, I would. I immediately, I didn't tell anyone I was getting married because I was afraid that we had tried before in September and something came up. So I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to get anyone's hopes up. I didn't want to get my hopes up. Um, I know that's bad, but again, said I would be honest even if it's ugly um I told my mom my family that we got married told my friends they could not believe it like they my mother was um relieved but she had no idea about what was going on my aunt was more like really you married her my friend the one who took me to the hospital for the miscarriage was like I wish you would have told me, like, you deserve to have people there take pictures and celebrate and all this other stuff. Um, and she was like, you know, she's the type of friend, if you like it, I love it. You rock with them, I rock with them. The moment you don't, I don't either. So she was she was supportive. My other girlfriends were happy for me. They just they just hated that I had to get married during COVID because um, they were like, I, we would have loved to have, you know, thrown you a bridal shower and a bachelorette party and all of that. It just sucks that you couldn't experience that. So we got married on a Tuesday. Um, on the way home, stopped and got some wings, went home and I had to get ready to go to work the next day. And life. I got married January 5th. By January 31st, I knew I was in trouble. I still didn't know how deep, but I knew I was in trouble. So <laughs> to give you all a very, very, very candid idea, got married January 5th. The things that the normal things that married newlyweds do when we got married completely stopped and that was not by me you always hear men talk about man now that we're married she don't um in my case it was the exact opposite it was the exact opposite so anyway yeah got married january 5th the things that the normal things that married newlyweds do when we got married, completely stopped. And that was not by me. You always hear men talk about, man, now that we're married, she don't. Um, in my case, 
it was the exact opposite. It was the exact opposite. So anyway, because <laughs> this is not a, a forum to be all R-rated or whatnot, but y'all get what I'm saying. So um, we got married January 5th. January 6th, I went to work. It was <laughs> um, a lot of people congratulated me because the kind of word got out that I had gotten married. January 7th, um, I filed the paperwork to change my last name. And if you were following me, you can go back like 15, 16 videos and I talk about how I had to change my name back <laughs> to my maiden name. But I changed my name within about three days of getting married. Um, my attitude was, this is the bed that I made. I'm going to do right by him. I'm going to do right by my marriage. Um, I took marriage seriously. And when I married him, I absolutely married him thinking I'm going to be with you for the next 40, 50 years. So we're going to have to figure this shit out. That was my mindset. I did not get married to turn around and be divorced in six months. But I got married January 5th, 2021. And by January 31st, I knew I was in serious trouble. So that is where we are. The next set of videos, the next set of all this will be, um, me talking about how things went downhill before it crashed and I found everything out. In the meantime, tomorrow is my birthday. So, happy birthday to me. The fuck did I marry? This is the interlude, basically. Um, I'm not recapping on this video. I'm just kind of answering some stuff that has been written to me. Someone was like, why are you airing your business out on social media? <sighs> it's a valid question. Um, for me personally, I feel like this was traumatic to experience, to live through. Um, and I'll and I'll expound on that on another video the aftermath of the toll that this took. Um, honestly, <laughs> and it, I know some people are going to be like, that sounds crazy. It is kind of cathartic to get this out because I cannot tell you how much of this has been internalized um, since 2020. Also, I don't want to seem like a cautionary tale, to other women or to men for that matter but to my sisters to my ladies white black hispanic asian doesn't matter if something does not sit right with you investigate it um i cannot stress that enough if just one woman watches these videos and she's like you know what some don't sit right with me let me look into this um, then it was worth it. Yes, it is a Lifetime movie. Yes, it is Netflix. Yes, it is crazy. Yes, it is hilarious also. Um, and I understand all of those reactions. As someone who lived it, um, It was traumatic, but I feel like, God, it feels good to finally admit um, what the fuck I went through. And again, by the time this is uh, uploaded, I'm only to January of 2021, right after getting married. So when I think back on it, there's things that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, there are things that I'm just like, why? Why did you not pay attention? Why did you not question? 
Um, and the sad part is I can't even begin to tell you. I don't remember the woman I was before I met that man. I don't remember. Um, because going through something like that, it changes you. And I've seen some women in the comments who were like, I was married to a habitual liar. I was married to a pathological liar. My baby daddy's a, a pathological liar. And my heart goes out to them because until you have dealt with someone so depraved, you you really don't quite know how bad it can get. Um so I'm fully aware that this was a risk putting this out on social media, telling my story, my truth, and really kind of being like, look, this is this is what I went through. I made dumb decisions. I overlooked things I should not have overlooked. I argued away things I should not have argued away. Um, I can pinpoint exactly the moment I should have left. I still feel like God is sitting on the throne and he's like, I never planned for your monkey ass to marry him. I never even planned for you to go out and date with him. That's why I blew your tire. But you hard headed and you went anyway. And then I tried to go ahead and show you signs. You ignored them. Like, I feel like God did everything to help me as his child be like, this is not who I created to be your your helpmate. And I was like, God, you taking too long. I want to get married. You taking too long. I want to have a family. You taking too long. And these are the consequences that I am paying for basically telling God you took too long. And um, I feel like God's grace is sufficient. It is. But at the same time, and I'm not perfect. I mean, not perfect at all. None of us are. But I do feel like when I sit back and I replay the events that happen, I truly cannot believe that was my story. Because all I wanted was to meet a guy for him to be my best friend, for us to get married, have a family. I wanted someone I could make fun of his big old forehead and he make fun of my nappy head and all my wigs. And yet he was my ride or die. Um, I wanted someone that I could be like, man, help me with these kids. And he helped me with the kids. We had a nice home. We were comfortable. That is what I wanted. And I've said this before. And I say it again, I truly thought, I truly hoped it was my turn. You see the women who are, you know, so happy and, um, you know, they're in these loving marriages and life just looks good. I really, really wanted it to be my turn. And so... I excused away a lot of stuff that I hope the next woman who sees this does not excuse because I don't wish this on anybody. I don't wish this on anyone to feel the way I felt the moment I discovered the whole truth. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Because I think it's important to try to answer the, why is she posting this? Honestly, I was tired of holding it in. I was tired of holding it in. Um, and I hope it helps somebody. Okay. Let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's all get some sleep. Um, if you don't have anything to do and you just want to wish me a happy birthday, wish me a happy birthday tomorrow, February 15th. Shout out to Team Aquarius. Good night, y'all. The fuck? <sighs> Part 17. Who the fuck did I marry? So, for context and just to clarify some stuff, going forward, 
I'm going to now call my ex-husband. I'm going to use the name that I call him in real life. Um, so that way it clears up the whole fiance, boyfriend, husband, ex-husband thing. So his name is Legion. Anyone that knows me will tell you that is what I call him. So Legion and I, when I left off at part uh, 16, um, or excuse me, part 15, Legion and I got married January 5th of 2021 for the first two weeks things were fine um we got into like a a routine basically i would go to work he would go to work um he was still leaving the house at around 6 15 every morning he was still on the phone with his brother the one that lived in philly um every morning they would just that was their time to talk from what i was told the brother got off work i guess he must have worked the third shift and so he was getting off work as Legion was getting ready to go to work. So that was the perfect time for them to talk. He would talk to um, his brother in Baltimore and the brother in Augusta. Pretty much, you know, just a quick phone call here and there, if not every day, every other day. So everything was pretty much the same. I would talk to my mom almost every day. I would talk to my aunt almost every day. Um, so it was it was nothing to kind of... Hmm, that's weird. Um, that's what the morning routine was. He would talk. So I worked at Georgia State Patrol. Um, and I said this in a previous video, but again, there were things I said in previous videos that I remember saying, hey, remember that because it's going to come back later. So I worked at Georgia State Patrol. I had been working there for almost eight years, seven or eight years by the time Legion got into the picture. He was fine with the fact that I worked um, within law enforcement. I'm not a trooper. I'm not a sworn officer. I'm a civilian. However, he, um, again, his dad was a retired police officer. So he was perfectly fine in the beginning with the fact that I worked for Georgia State Patrol. Um, he had been to my office before. He had met some of my um, co-workers. Obviously, even with COVID, because I still had to go into the office two or three days a week, he had been up there. So the friend who took me to the hospital when I had my miscarriage has met him. He and I have been to her home with her and her significant other before. So again, even in the world of COVID, when there were little times where you could get together with people, he has met people in my life. He has met um, my friend or that particular friend, and he has met some of my coworkers. So when we got married, the first two weeks, like I said, was fine. And then it's as if something snapped, um, something just changed. What was totally acceptable before, suddenly little comments were made. Why are you wearing that to work? You get off at 3.30, so you'll be home by 5, right? Things that had never happened before. He had never questioned what time I'm going to be home. Um, really, he didn't need to question it because when I'm off work, I, I leave. So it was never a situation of, oh, I'm going to just sit around at work and just run my mouth because I have nothing to do. Um, and then it turned into, you know, he would call me every day from work and i'm going to demonstrate how those phone calls went but he would call me every day from work and if he even so much as heard a male voice in the background he would have little comments to me who was that are they in your office you know man you know i never know who's who's around you because it seemed like every time i call you i have the hiccup sorry it seems like every time i call you um there's some man around and I'm just like you know at first I kind of shrugged it off I laughed it off because it really truly was absurd to me um but then it became a bit more frequent and so I really just didn't feed into it because I'm like I don't know if this is some insecurity I don't know if this is jealousy because nothing has ever been done to make you feel any sort of insecure type of way. I've never entertained another guy, never flirted with another guy. Like 
I don't know where this is coming from. So it is also important to note, we got married January 5th. Things started changing um, around two weeks later. And the reason why I know it's two weeks is because I had recorded an audio diary on January 21st is the date of the audio diary. And I talk about how maybe I had unrealistic expectations because it seemed as if things were changing with he and I. So two weeks pass, he starts making little comments. End of January comes, he informs me that he wants to start looking for a house again. I had no real desire to go through that process. So what he decides is that he's going to look for a house for us using his friend, the uh, realtor, the one I did not meet. So he tells me that he and his friend have been talking and he's going to start looking at houses. And what he's going to do is basically if he feels like it's a house I would like, then he wants to show it to me because he feels like, you know, I know that your attitude really isn't you're in the mood to look for a house. So I'm going to start looking. And then if I think it's a great house, then, you know, you can come see it. Um, And I remember thinking that's not like that's not gonna work you're not gonna choose a house without me he was like no i'm not gonna choose the house but i just think that you know me and old boy have been talking and so he has some houses that he is representing he wants to show me so why don't you let me look at it and if it's worth the time then i'll bring you to look at it so he already had some sort of plan in place after talking to his friend um, about how he's going to start looking at houses. This is Jan- this is the end of January 2021. So I kind of threw my hands in the air and was just like, whatever, because I'm not getting emotionally involved in looking at houses. And for me, that's kind of what it was. I felt like I would see a house, I could picture us living there, and then it gets snatched away somehow, some way. I didn't want to go through that. So the reaction that he wanted, which was for me to throw a fit, I did not do. I was just like, okay, all right. Like, I trust you. Um, And remember that I said the reaction he wanted, because that's going to come back later. So he started looking at houses. (sighs) Funny enough, the houses that he looked at, none of them I actually saw. But he would call me and say, I'm at this house in Sandy Springs with the uh, realtor friend. Apparently his his realtor friend's name was Scott, not to be confused with the other Scott, the one that was actually helping us that dropped us as clients. I want to make that clear. There were two Scots. One is the realtor who was representing us, who said, hey, I need proof of funds. If you don't have those proof of funds, I cannot show you any more houses. The other Scott is his friend who he had talked to on the phone at least 50 to 100 times in front of me. That's that's the Scott that he said is going to show me this house in Sandy Springs. Um, Apparently, the house was like eight hundred thousand dollars. So he was like, I think that um, if I, you know, if I like the house, then I'm going to bring you out here so you can see it. All right. Now let's go into part 18. Okay, part 18. Who the fuck did I marry? So he starts looking at houses in Sandy Springs alpharetta area with his friend scott um i did not see any of these houses i did not go i didn't want to go um so what was starting to change is remember i said before he would leave the house every day at around 6 15 he would be home every day between 3 30 and 4 o'clock without fail it was so I shouldn't say it was annoying, but I could set my clock by the fact that I would hear that garage door open between 3.30 and 4 o'clock every day that he went to work. Even during lockdown, he still had to go to work. His job was only locked down for maybe a week. Um, For me, I was allowed to work from home, but unfortunately, I, I did not handle it well. 
And so I would fall asleep and not check email. So my boss was like, yeah, you're going to have to come back to the office because you're not trustworthy. And I wasn't. I mean, I totally, I would watch Netflix and not even be on my computer. So I had to start going back to work every day, five days a week. Um, And I was, (laughs) me and another lady were the only two in there because we were the only two who did not handle work from home properly. Anyway, that's another story. So Legion would, he started to not come home by four o'clock. He started to come home five, five thirty, six, six thirty, sometimes seven o'clock because he was saying that he was um, looking at houses after work with his friend Scott. So it definitely was noticed that things are changing. Um, And I just, at this point, kind of emotionally and mentally, I was just like, I don't know what to do. This is the end of January. Remember I told you in part 15, I got married January 5th. By January 31st, I kind of knew I was in trouble. And by the end of January, sure enough, I knew things were changing in a way that I was like, I hate to sound redundant, but what the fuck is going on? So he's still maintaining the story of looking for a house, looking for a house. I had already let him know my lease is up in August. When my lease is up in August, I am moving to Cobb County. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and then my attitude was kind of like, you can go with me or you can stay here. I don't care, but I'm moving. I'm leaving Clayton County. The reason why I want, I was so adamant to move was not because of Clayton County. It was not because of the house that I was in. It was because Legion had started to create this narrative that he was beefing with my female neighbor. He was trying to get me to believe that my female neighbor to the left of me um, somehow was interested in him. And so she would make these little comments and he would come in the house complaining about her and her music and the fact that she had, you know, different men over to the house. It was driving me crazy. And all of this was kind of starting in January. So when I say that it really seems like we got married January 5th and then We had two weeks of peace and then something just snapped. I literally mean something just snapped. So he's looking at houses. Now we're moving into February. February obviously is my birthday month. Um, He did good. He did good to make Valentine. He went all out for Valentine's Day. He went all out for my birthday. My birthday and Valentine's Day are... February 14th and February 15th. So um, he went all out on both days. <sighs> Y'all ain't even gonna believe this story. But I said I would share even when it makes me look bad. So the weekend after my birthday, and what I mean by that is if my birthday was on a Tuesday, we're talking about Saturday. Um, the weekend after my birthday, he gave me money to go to the nail salon go get a manicure and pedicure. So I leave the house. I take his car. His car was in the driveway. We had a key to each other's car. Cause again, we're married at this point. We're talking February, 2021. So I take his car and I drive to the nail salon over in Morrow. I'm in the chair getting a pedicure and I get a text message from my husband saying, Someone was just at the house looking for you. And I'm like, who was looking for me? What do you, well, who was it? And he said, I don't know. I think it was some, this is through text. I don't know. I think it was some dude you used to mess with. Okay. Um, I was like, what are you talking about? He's And he was like, I'm telling you, some guy just came to the house looking for you. I told him you were not here. So at this point, y'all, I'm in the chair at the salon. I'm freaking out because I'm like, who the 
fuck has the audacity to come to my home unannounced, uninvited, talking about they're looking for me, especially because before I met my husband, I was working, I was working the last shift at Amazon as a part-time job. So I had not dealt with, dated anything with anyone for about a year before I met him in March of 2020. So I really was like, who the hell is this coming to my house? So I finished the pedicure. I head home. Once I get home, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? What happened? And so I'm frazzled in a way. And he's calm. He was like, yeah, it was a black Dodge Charger. They pulled into the driveway. They backed in. They backed in as if they had been here before. So clearly this was someone who, who, who's been to your house. He got out the car. He said, I opened the door and I went out there and I said, you know, is there something I can help you with? And he said, the guy said, I'm looking for and gave him my name. And he said, I'm sorry, she's not here. And he said, he was like, oh, okay. Um, all right then. And just got in the car and drove off. And I was like, my brain stopped working because I'm thinking who the heck could this be a Dodge Charger I was like are you sure that it wasn't law enforcement like was it the sheriff's office trying to serve me with a lawsuit for a credit card I didn't pay he was like no he was in regular clothes he was like and it was not a um a a police car it was on a marked unit basically and so I'm just like who the heck could this be? And he was like, I know who it was. And I said, who? He was like, I think it was your ex. I said, what ex? He was like, the one that you had dated for two years. Remember back in like part three, part four, I told y'all, he told me about his ex. I told him about mine. I thought we were being honest with each other. So now, fast forward to February 2021, and he's telling me, yeah, it, I think it was the ex that you had been dealing with for those two years before you met me. I said, so you think that he showed up to the house uninvited after two years? And he was like, well, whoever it was clearly was comfortable pull, backing into our driveway, getting out the car, and was like, I'm here to see, and gave me, gave him my name. Um... And so he was like, she's not here. Is there something I can help you with? And the guy was like, nah, nah, it's cool. Um, And then just got in the car and drove off. So, uh, again, brain is like, who, who could this be? So then Legion says to me, you know what? The way that you react into this is real suspect. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He was like, you over here freaking out. I told you I took care of it. I told you it was fine. And you over here freaking out, which makes me wonder, what what have you been up to? Now, let's go to part 19. Okay, part 18. Who the fuck did I marry? So he says to me, the way you're acting is real suspect because I told you it was fine. I took care of it. He was like, I ain't even worried about it. He was like, obviously that nigga didn't know that you now married, that you've moved on. And so now he knows it. But for me, it was the fact that I don't do dry. I don't do pop-ups. Don't come to my house unannounced. So if someone has done that, for me, it it automatically feels like a violation and it feels like it needs to be addressed. So it was not as simple as I already took care of it. It's fine. Let it go. No, nah, we ain't letting nothing go because you don't have my permission to show up to my house. And before this turns into something where I'm going to be on Fox 5 News, I need to address that with you because that is not okay. So he didn't like the reaction I had to the story he told me where someone basically disrespected my home and he felt like my reaction was really suspect. So um, what I'm going to get into the little details that he did not know about. So he tells me again, it was a black charger, a black Dodge charger. They backed into the driveway. A gentleman got out of the car and he asked for me by name and Legion said she's not here. 
So um, I asked him, what does the guy look like? And he said, he was like, why does it matter? I said, what the fuck does he look like? So Legion proceeds to give me the most generic description you can give. He was like, well, um, he was shorter than me. Ex-husband is about six, three, six, four. He was shorter than me. Um, he was brown skin. I said, did he, have, did he have a hat on his head? Mind you, I understand that before marriage, I was a damn fool. I understand that. But every woman has that moment where you only going to fool her but for so long. And eventually stuff, puzzles start coming together. For me, I felt like moving into marriage, certain things started coming together. So I said to him, um, did he have a hat on his head? He was like, nah, he ain't wear a hat. So in my mind, I am mentally going down a list of every possible man it could be. Um, and it was only like four men. I had been in that house about three or four years at this point. So I knew all of the people and I'm talking about from maintenance down to ex-boyfriends. It was a total of like four men. So when he said that, um, it was a black charger, I immediately was like, okay, I know that crosses out one. He said he was shorter than him. All of them were shorter than him. I said, did he have a hat on his head? He said, no, that crossed out one because one in particular was a maintenance guy who always wore a hat on his head because he had like a bruise or something and he, he was just self-conscious about it. So he always wore a hat. That leaves two. So I said, was he muscular or was he skinny? So Legion's getting all frustrated. I said, just answer the question. He was like, well, he was kind of in between. And I said, okay, um, he, he was in between. I said, so was he light skin or was he dark skin? He was like, I told you he was brown skin. I said, was he my complexion? He said, no, he was, he was brown skin. That eliminates one. So now there's one left. And yes, the one left would have been the ex that I had dated for two years. And so he was like, I know that I, I know it was your ex. I know it was your ex. And I was like, that don't make no sense because the ex that I, in my mind, I'm saying this, the ex that I had dated, he and I had no contact with each other. And he was not the type to just pop up at your house. That ain't his style. Not to mention, and I ain't tell Legion this, that man would not be caught dead driving a Dodge Charger. He hated chargers because he drove it as a patrol car. So I didn't say anything. I just was like, that's, that's weird. So what Legion didn't know is that at the time I had a security system. So I had a security system where, um, anytime the front door, the garage door or the back door was open, basically any entry point, anytime it was open or closed, it would send me a text message notification. So when he's telling me all this, I'm looking at my phone and I see a notification where the front door was opened and it was shut all within the same minute. So for example, if it says front door open at 1 p.m., front door closed at 1 p.m. So whatever he did was within those 60 seconds. He's telling me the story of the guy got out the car. Um, he opened the door. He went out there. Can I help you? And the guy said, um, I'm looking for. And Legion said, no, nah, she's not here. And so the, he said the guy kind of was like, OK. And he was like, all right, thank you. And got in the car. And drove off. Legion has also told me that he watched him drive off, drive out of the neighborhood, which means because of the way the house was set up, the townhouse, he would have still been outside watching this. I could be wrong, but something in me was like that would take more than 60 seconds. So for the door to have been open and shut within the same 60 seconds, I was like, mm, mm. okay. So also what he didn't know, we didn't have a ring door camera, but my neighbor did. And her ring door camera caught 
my driveway. It, it the view of the camera could see my driveway as well as her driveway, um, and so who whoever was coming in the door, our driveways were right next to each other, and then on the either on the other side of it was the grass. So it was a per, it was a perfect view of my driveway. So. So she, um, I text her and I said, Hey, were you home? Um, I think I text her the next day. Cause I said, were you home on Saturday? Da, 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 da. And she said, um, no, I wasn't. What's up? You know, everything good. And I said, um, can you look at your security system and see if there was a car that came to my house? Um, at such and such time. And I know I, I did not tell her the reason I was asking, but I was like, is there any way that your security camera caught if someone came to my house um, at this time on Saturday. She's like, yeah, sure, I'll look. And so <laughs> maybe about a couple of hours later, she texted me back and said, hey, I looked at the camera, but I didn't see anything. And I said, okay, by any chance, did it catch if someone maybe walked up the driveway? Like maybe it wasn't a car in the driveway, but someone walked up. She said, I didn't see anything with your driveway yesterday. So I said, okay. Um, and I, and I knew, I knew that something in me again, um, was like, nobody came to the house. So now here we are, um, a month and a half married. And now is when I'm like, why the fuck did he make that up? Because no one came to the house. No black charger came to the house, pulled back into the driveway. Nobody got out the car and asked for me. Nobody was looking for me. So now I'm, I was sitting in the bedroom thinking through all this and I'm like, why the fuck did he make that up? Because that's what happened. I'm looking at the text messages on my phone where he's telling me someone just came to the house looking for you, but no one came. So what was the purpose of that? And then I, and then something said to me, something in me said, he wanted to see your reaction. He, he just wanted to see the reaction. You had been too calm. And so he wanted to see a reaction. So this man gaslit me like I was Georgia natural gas just to get a reaction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to part 20 of who the fuck did I marry? All right. Part 20 of who the fuck did I marry? So after the black Dodge Charger incident, um, things were were quiet legion was fine legion slept just fine me that shit played over in my head for days and days and days um on one hand i was like i know nobody came my head knew nobody came to the house my heart was like but maybe he didn't make it up so the head and the heart were absolutely playing a tug of war because Again, I really couldn't fathom that he was making it up. But nevertheless, I filed it in the back of my mind in my little filing cap, my, my mental filing cabinet. So a few weeks later, we go out to eat at this restaurant in Atlanta. Um, it's a burger place and I'm going to do my, my best by the time I post this to put the name of the burger place um, on the screen. So we go to the burger place, eat dinner. Everything was fine. As we are leaving, he says to me, did I ever did, did I ever show you where my grandmother's buried? This is the grandmother that passed away from COVID in 2020. And I said, no, I was like, we haven't been over here. And so he was like, let me let me show you. So he drives us to the cemetery, which is not far from the restaurant. He drives us to the cemetery, goes around and around, and then it comes to um, like a little hill in the cemetery and he was like, you see the headstone. The headstone had um, like a fam the family name on it. And it did not have, for example, John David Doe. It just had Doe. 
Okay. So there were no dates on it. So it, it reminded me of just a headstone where it was probably multiple family members buried underneath it. That's what it reminded me of. And so he was like, my grandfather and my grandmother are buried there. I do recall him telling me when the grandmother died in 2020 that she wanted to be buried next to his grandfather. And so he told, he, he we're sitting in the car because we can see the headstone like on top of the hill from the car. And he tells me that that is where his grandmother and grandfather are buried. That he was able, the family was able to get her um you know, her wishes were to be buried next to the grandfather. Okay. So as we are leaving, we take a different route home. So we get on the highway. If you're from Atlanta, you'll know what I'm talking about. We get on I-75 North. Um, and we're kind of just, we're just driving around, to be honest with you. But we're taking the scenic route. We get on I-75 North because... The reason why I remember is because when you're on I-75 North going towards Atlantic Station, on the right-hand side, you will see the Varsity. You'll see all these tall skyscraper buildings. One of the buildings has the letters NCR on the building. We, As we're coming up towards the building, he says to me, do you see the NCR building? I said, yeah. He said the building behind it my job bought that building that's where we're going to have um we're setting up operations and i was like why the hell would y'all buy a condiment company in downtown atlanta he was like no we're not doing production there it's just going to be offices and that's where we're going to handle like the business portion the production is still being done in gwinnett county out in duluth and so i was like oh okay he was like that's where i keep the company car so i was like the company car i said aren't you supposed to be bringing the company car home and he was like i don't want to bring the company car home because it's clayton county and it's a ninety thousand dollar car and i don't know i don't want no nah, i don't want no problems so he's telling me that he keeps the company car at the build the building downtown atlanta that's behind the ncr building I barely could see what building he's talking about, but he was like, it's the building right behind it. And so he's telling me that that's where his office is. So I said to him, take me to your office. I know it's a Saturday, but shit, you wanted the VPs, right? So take me to your office. No, I had not been to his office simply because again, COVID. So I was like, take me to your office. And he was like, he was like, I can. He was like, that's no problem. So do I have the other phone? I do. So y'all are in luck. So I can maybe reenact how this goes. So he gets off the exit and starts driving towards the NCR building. While he's driving towards the NCR building, he always has kept his phone in his left pocket. This is my left hand. So he pulls his phone out and he starts calling. He tells me he's calling Willie. Willie is supposed to be the head of security. So he's saying, oh, let me call Willie real quick to make sure that the building's open. So he proceeds, this is another phone, but he proceeds to go ahead and call Willie. He's still, we're still driving, by the way. We're still driving. I'm on the phone, you know, scrolling through Facebook, trying to figure out um, some random shit. But he's, he's driving with the phone up to it. So driving with the phone, next thing I hear Hey, Willie, it's Legion. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. Hey, is the building open? No, I just want to take my wife up there so she can see it and see my office. Are you up there right now? You're not? Okay, is Mr. Justin working? Okay. So is there anybody up there that can physically open the building? Because I don't think my badge is going to get me at least in the front door because of it's, it's on the weekend lock. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me know. All right. Thank you, Willie. Bye. Y'all see how I did that? He's having this whole conversation while I'm sitting in a passenger seat. So then he gets off the phone and he says to me, Willie is not working and Justin apparently called out sick. 
so the building is locked and my badge won't get us in the front door he was like willie's gonna see if there's someone else that can open the that can open the front door so we can actually get in. he's like my badge will get us on the floor but it will not get us in the front door <clears throat> no one ever called so when he's getting off the highway um he basically turns onto spring street again there's this there's all kinds of shit i distinctly remember he turns onto spring street so that he can then get on 75 south so we can go home never saw the office that day um but again this is where he's saying that he um keeps the company car so when we get to part 21 i'll kind of go into detail about the whole company car a little bit more part 21 who the fuck did i marry so the company car apparently was a charcoal gray bmw i believe it was a five series it was a five series I don't know much about the sedans. Y'all know I wanted the X5 dark blue with the cognac interior. He got the BMW 5 Series charcoal gray. He sent me a picture of the car. So I did see a picture of the car. Um, after this whole NCR building, take me to your office. That is what he's claiming is that he left. He leaves the company car at that location. He's saying that he drives from Riverdale to midtown switches out cars and then drives from um midtown to duluth those that don't know how metro atlanta is basically midtown would be in between where we live and duluth um i only know that he left the house every day at 6 15 i know that um i never physically saw the company car come to our home saw a picture pictures plural um so when he told me that he got a bmw 5 series keep in mind this is after <laughs> um i had been promised a dark blue x5 so i was a bit salty i don't care if it is a company car i was a bit salty i will admit that um because i felt like you you get to drive the car that you know i really want which is a bmw um and so he would always he would call me from the car he would tell me you know yeah i'm um i may i may just uh i may just drive home in this car and not switch car you know switch back to his personal car he was like i don't know he he did that a lot and I realize now in 2024, he did that because he knew how excited I was to actually see the car. Because shit, I wanted to test drive it myself, to be honest with you. And he knew that. So, reactions. Um, so, he would he would say stuff like that. Like, man, I'm so tired. I might just drive the, the company car, go ahead and go home. And then, you know, just let me park it in a garage type thing. So eventually he stopped doing that because I didn't want to hear nothing about that car. I'm driving a Nissan and you driving a BMW after you promised me a BMW. So I don't really want to hear nothing about it. So in terms of the company car, I did see that it was, it was a, according to the pictures, a charcoal gray uh, BMW 5 Series. If you're asking me the exact model, I don't know. But I know it was a 5 Series because I know the 7 Series is slightly longer. So it was a 5 Series sedan. Um, so after the whole situation with the cemetery to see his grandmother and grandfather's um, headstone. Then there was the NCR. The office is open. Oh, it's not open. Justin ain't working. Willie ain't working. Willie is supposed to be head of security. But he ain't working. Okay. So... At this point, I'm already numb. It is important for me to point out how numb I became dealing with him. Mind numbing. Because I just got to a point where it was like, there's always something. There's always something. So, of course, we're not going to go to the office. Because there's going to be something. Um, 
So this is the end of February. My birthday had already passed. There clearly was tension on my end, not so much tension on his end. So I get home a couple of weeks later. We are now in the beginning of March. This is something personal about me. The only way you would know this is if you know me. I have been dying, dying to go to London and Paris. Um, I had a layover in London when I did a study abroad, but it's not the same. I want to go to London and be a whole tourist. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I want to see Buckingham Palace. I want to see um, the Tower of London. I want to see Paris. I want to see the Palace of Versailles. This is something, if you know me, you know she wants to see Paris. She wants to see London. So I get home from work. This is the beginning of March. I get home from work and on the counter is a folder with like a little bow on it. And I'm like, oh, what is this? Is this like mail? Like, was this something that you got at work? He's like, nah, it's a surprise for you. I open up the folder. Inside the folder is like a trip itinerary. It is not an actual booked trip. It's it's like an itinerary. Um, a trip for two to go from Atlanta to London. Um, the trip was should have happened and it was it was um the uh fuck the month on there was like July. So it was a summer trip. So he tells me I'm going to take you to London. He was like, I try, I wanted to take you for your birthday, but certain things fell through. He was like, so this summer in July, we're going to go to London. He was like, I've already made a reservation for us to stay at the Savoy. Again, there are certain things that my brain just was like, remember that, remember that. He said, I've already made a reservation for us to stay at the Savoy. I know as much as I want to go to London, y'all, I didn't know anything about the Savoy. And so I remember going to look it up because I was like, what is the Savoy? Well, apparently the Savoy is bougie, very bougie. So I was so excited. I cannot tell y'all how fucking excited I was when I saw that he had um, printed out British Airways. Like he was speaking my language. I am one of those people. I'm a planner. So when he's saying I'm going to take you to London and he took the time to research flights and print it out and research the Savoy and print it out. And there were there were different, ex not excursions, but there were different things that you could do. You could go see the Tower of London. You could go see see Buckingham Palace changing of the guard we could go have high tea at certain places he was like I don't really want to go but I know you're dying to go so he was like you know I love you and I would do anything for you blah blah black sheep have you any wool and so he was like I'm going to take you to London in July the trip did not include Paris that's fine but I was so excited so excited and so this is the beginning of March. I was like, this, this is great. Hopefully this happens. I knew I needed to renew my passport. And he was saying that he had to renew his passport as well because his passport had expired. So both of us were like, okay, we need to get on this if we're going to try to make it to London in July and it's now March. Me being the planner I am, I think I went to work the next day and printed out the passport applications so that we could fill it out and go ahead and get that process um, going. So, um, needless to say, something must have happened and I don't remember what it was. We just simply didn't fill out the application for the passport. So, fast forward, we're now at mid-March. Mid-March... The decision was made that my mom, who lived in Arkansas, was coming to visit us. She would be coming, I believe, the second week of April, and she was going to stay a week um, and then a few days. So, like, maybe a total of nine days. Not quite two weeks, but a little over a week. So, she was coming in April, and I was excited. Legion was excited because he was excited to physically meet my mom. He had talked to her on Zoom. He had talked to her on the phone, but he was excited to physically meet my mom. And my mom was, was excited to physically meet her son-in-law. So, 
this is mid-March. Um, I'm going to go into part 22 where I explain what happened with Facebook Messenger. Come. Part 22, who the fuck did I marry? So now we are in March. This is right after he had surprised me with the announcement of we're going to go to London for um, a trip in July. Because we definitely didn't do a honeymoon. We definitely didn't do any sort of trips together. So the idea was we're going to do a trip in July together. Um, one thing about Legion was that <laughs> he was the guy who was like, I have nothing to hide. I don't lie. I don't like liars. Um, if we're in a relationship, then everything should be out in the open. So I've always had his cell phone passcode. Never felt the need to look through his cell phone. Um, and funny enough, I can tell y'all right now, disclaimer, I will never go through a cell phone again. Mm -mm, you cheat in peace. So anyway, um, so one day, this is mid-March, going like around March 20th. Um, so we're heading in towards the end of the month. He was in the shower. Keep in mind, my mom is coming for a visit in April. So he was in the shower and he received a text message on his phone from a woman. Um, the text message, because it was a preview. So the text message was something where if you didn't know the context of the text thread, you could either go left or you could go right with it. So me being just curious, I opened up the phone, put the passcode in, read the text, then read the thread. Come to find out, it was a text from his aunt. His aunt and his ex share the same name. That's why I say it could go left or it could go right. Text was from the aunt. So um, I went, I looked at the text, went, went through the thread, nothing in there. So I went ahead, X, uh, X out of the um, messages. I see that he has Facebook Messenger downloaded. And obviously it shows you the, the number of um, unread messages in the icon. So it showed that he had like five unread messages. So I clicked on it just being nosy. And what do my wondering astigmatism I see? So in his Facebook Messenger, is about seven women. I can see um, their profile picture and I see their names. Some of them had a preview. The ones that um, he had not read, I could see the preview of the message. One in particular said, when are you gonna come get this? Y'all know what I'm talking about. So I clicked on that one first. Um, and I'm reading through the thread. And so she's saying, when are you going to come get this? But earlier in the thread or further back in the thread, he had asked her, when are you going to give me? And she said, when lockdown is over. So from what I could piece together, he had not yet physically gotten with her. Um, but had there been no COVID, oh, he would have smashed all day, every day. Um, the other messages were in you windows, meaning the other messages from the other women were in you windows. They were not as graphic as the one between him and her. So I'm reading these messages. And what is interesting is that the person I am married to is not the person in these messages. Like this man was on some nasty shit. And I say nasty not in a judgmental way, but in a, with me, he seemed to act as if I was damn near virginal white. And I clearly see evidence that you were into some shit that with me, you acting like, nah, I ain't really into that. So, um, I confronted him. I absolutely confronted him and was like, what the fuck is this? If two plus two is four and five plus five is 10, what the fuck is this? Um, and so he did not, you know, oh, that ain't, that ain't what happened, blah, blah, blah. Instead, what he hit me with is, man, I was just playing around. Like, ain't nothing happened. Um, you know, I shouldn't have said all that, but I was just flirting. It, it ain't mean nothing. I don't even know that girl. I was just flirting. And so I'm like, is this what you into? 
And so he was like, no, it's not what I'm into. It was just stupid. It was stupid because I shouldn't have done it. So I'm going to be honest with y'all because I've been honest all this time. What pissed me off the most was that here I am as a woman behaving, trying to do the right thing by him and this marriage. And you mean to tell me you out here offering your dingling to random chicks that you don't even know. I was more angry at the fact that I'm like, dude, do you know how much I have turned down in order to be faithful to your dumb ass? And I'm seeing that you basically are out here acting like you got Skittles taste the rainbow. I was hurt. I was angry. I thought about getting my lick back. I ain't, I'm just being honest. I did. Um, and he, he played it off like it ain't nothing serious. It ain't nothing serious. Don't overreact. Don't get emotional. It was just dumb. He was like, I will delete the messages. I'll even delete messenger. And I, and I told him, I was like, that's really not good enough. Cause that, that's not going to fix the root of the issue. So this is where I introduced that we need to do marriage counseling. He didn't have any issue doing marriage counseling. We did not do premarital counseling, um, but he was like, that's fine. He was like, I don't have no problem doing marriage counseling because if anything, it can help us. So I thought that, okay, he may not have physically cheated from what I could see on the messenger. He may not have physically cheated, but he damn sure got caught, you know, d doing a little something, something, because they had exchanged pictures. So y'all know what pictures he sent. And I was disappointed because I don't like men that send, <laughs> I don't like men that send those type of pictures. But anyway, that's another issue. So we agreed that we would start marriage counseling. We also agreed that we would put on a united front when my mom got there. In other words, we were not going to argue. We, you know, just let's just act like everything is fine. But at that point, when my mother arrived in April, I could not stand him. I did not want to be, but we couldn't, um, he moved back into our bedroom because he had, he had moved into the guest bedroom when I saw the messages. Like three days before she came, he moved back into the bedroom because obviously she needed to sleep somewhere. So, um, I really could not stand him. And it was because I was busy second guessing myself, like, damn, what's wrong with me? Like, if that's what you into and I'm supposed to be your wife, like, let's have conversations like shit i went to fam you i understand some stuff buddy so it, it just was one of those things where it made me second guess like what's wrong with me what did i do wrong what is it that she got that i don't um because you all out here willy-nilly you know messaging her all hours of the night because the thread went back quite a few weeks i saw it in march there were messages from december november so again, I'm just second guessing all kinds of stuff, self-esteem taking a hit. So no, I did not want to be around him. I did not want, um, I, I, I didn't like him, period. I did not like him. I left and I would just go for a drive because driving clears my mind. I called my aunt, told her what happened. I don't recommend that. I don't recommend calling family to tell them what's going on in your marriage. But I called my aunt and my aunt, lovingly was like what do you want me to say you married him you know he ain't your boyfriend y'all can't just break up that's the hard part about marriage is like i mean yeah i guess you could leave him but at the same time you married him so honey you gonna have to go back home and y'all are gonna have to figure this out she was like i can't give you advice on what you should do i'm sorry that this happened but uh, but you married him so even though it was just one drive i went back home and that's when the discussion was um we need to do marriage counseling 23 who the fuck did i marry so we agreed to do marriage counseling um i had found a pastor and his wife who agreed to do our counseling basically our counseling was going to be on zoom and it was going to be every other week um every other tuesday initially legion was um 
participating in it. Um, his body language seemed to be that he was open and receptive to the marriage counseling. Now, the pastor and his wife were deeply concerned at the fact that we had only been married three months and we were already dealing with some form of infidelity. We were in marriage counseling and <laughs> as the pastor would put it, there seems to not be any sort of intimacy. Um, they were concerned. Rightfully so, I think any person would be if they knew what was going on within those three months. So um, the pastor and his wife, it is, it is fair to note, we started counseling with them um, in the spring. We continued counseling with them up until a week before I found out what I found out and he got kicked out. So one of the first things that um, the pastor kind of talked to us about was, um, you know, are you, what, what was the deal with the Facebook messenger stuff? Um, and Legion was like, it was stupid. I shouldn't have done it. Um, it was just, it really was just attention and it just, I got carried away. He, he felt like he was not going to, he kept saying, I'm not going to keep apologizing. I'm not going to keep getting persecuted. Um, after I told you, I'm sorry, I told you I wouldn't do it again. And I want us to move forward. You're either going to forgive me or you're not. The pastor and his wife were like, wow, um, the audacity is real on this one. <laughs> so needless to say, we started moving slowly forward. Um, it was always in the back of my mind, just like it was in the back of my mind with that black Dodge Charger. It was one of those things where, okay, I see how you kind of are moving and operate. He came to me a few days after we started our first counseling session. And he was like, we should um, get a joint bank account. What he wanted to do was to each one of us have our own account and to get a joint account for our money to go in there um, for joint expenses. Now, up until this point, he had been paying the rent, the utilities, and I really was just paying for my stuff. So now he's suggesting, look, we're married now. Let's go ahead and get a joint account. I wasn't necessarily against it because I knew that I would still have my own account. I would still have my own savings. So what I countered with was, okay, let's take a look and see what we're working with. Show me your checking. Let's, let's look at each other's accounts. Look at what we have currently. He was cool with that. So he shows me his checking account. His checking account available balance was about, it was just over 9,600. Mine's was just over 1500 so there was a huge disparity in the amounts. Um, and so he logged in on the phone and turned it towards me, and I could see available checking, you know, available balance, just over 9600 I logged into my savings. I showed him how much I had in savings. He logged into, picked up his phone, da -da 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 -da, logged into his Chase savings, turned the phone towards me. In the Chase savings, it was roughly about 15000 But I also knew that he told me he had a U.S. bank savings and he had an offshore savings. So at this point in time, I asked him, show me the U.S. bank savings. Show me, show me the other two accounts. He would not do it. This became a huge bone of contention. He would not show me the two accounts that he claims has the most money in there, the accounts that he claims has money for a house in there, because he still was mentioning, hey, we need to get on this house thing if we're going to move um, when the lease is up. So I'm just adamant on, why, aren't you, why don't you want to show me your savings account? You showed me the Chase one, like, what is the big deal? And so he kept saying, he was like, there's a lot of money in there. And he was like, and my uncle always taught me, this is not the uncle that died, another uncle. My uncle always told me, you know, j just keep your money tight because women can be, I said women, like we're married. So go ahead and show it to me. He would not show it to me. 
So then we went back into marriage counseling, like the next session. And I bring it up. I said, he will not show me these two accounts that he claims has the money in there to buy a house. I told a pastor and his wife, I said, I saw the pre-approval letter. So I don't understand why he's not going to show me to just put me at ease that he has the money in there. I had never questioned it before because again, you tell me who in their right mind signs their name to a legally binding offer, an all cash offer on a house. And they they just do it willy nilly. I don't know anyone that does that. So I actually never questioned what was in the savings because I clearly saw him sign his name to a $699,000 all cash offer on a house. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back to the parts in this playlist where I talk about what he did when we were looking for a house. So the pastor and his wife were like, Legion, that's not his name, y'all. That's a nickname. Legion, why would you, why would you not show your wife your savings account like what what's going on here and so he made up some bullshit and I remember the pastor's wife was like something something ain't right and so at this point Legion kind of shuts down he's just like look y'all are not gonna tell me when and where I can open I open up my accounts to show anybody the money I earned I earn that money I earn that money by playing football blood sweat and tears he went to this whole Denzel Washington monologue about how he earned that money and no one no woman no one is going to come in and tell him that he needs to open up the account so then he starts talking about the ex-wife and how she tried to get money from him in the divorce back when they were in California so now the pastor and his wife their red flags are just like whoa so much so that the pastor's wife said and i will never forget this she said i don't think you all are gonna make it to january what she was talking about is i don't think y'all are gonna make it a year and i really truly was like we're gonna make it like of course we're gonna make it and she was just like i don't have a good feeling about it and so legion's all defensive he he at this point he's folding his arms and he and because remember we're on zoom he's folding his arms and he's just like i'm i'm done with this like i'm not gonna get attacked because i'm not comfortable showing you the amount of money that i have money changes people and i'm not comfortable so he's playing that victim card um and so the pastor and his wife were like, you know, we we're, we're still going to help y'all as much as we can. But so he was like, I'm not comfortable. And basically the pastor and his wife were like, look, we'll help y'all as much as we can. <laughs> but there's some deep issues here. And, you know, had you this is what they advised us. Had the two of you came to us for premarital counseling we would have told you do not get married y'all should not even be together that is what our (laughs) that is what the pastor and his wife told us in marriage counseling if you two had come to us for premarital counseling we would have told you y'all should not even be together let alone get married but here we are so we will help you guys as much as we can But the pastor's wife was like, I don't have a good feeling that y'all are going to make it a year. Part 24, who the fuck did I marry? So remember, we're in April. Um, We're now moving towards the end of April. And he still did not show me his um, savings account. Saw the checking. Saw the Chase savings. So... He decides that we should start looking for a house again because my lease was up in August and I made it very clear that when the lease is up, I am moving. I wanted to move to Cobb County. So um, he was like, you know, we need to get the ball rolling. I didn't want any parts of it. Didn't want any parts of it. He found a realtor. This time it was a woman. It was a woman. Um, 
and I believe her name was Amber. I think her name was Amber. So he found a realtor and um, kind of we, you know, he told her what the budget was. Amber started finding houses. So please understand or you don't really have to understand, but um, I believed I believed he was a sane, rational human being. Sane enough that you would not sign an offer on a home if you didn't have the money. That's what I believed. So when we started working with Amber, Amber, I believe, showed us three or four houses. It was not nearly as many as the other realtor, Scott. So one of the houses um, absolutely loved. Oh, I love the house. Um, I really wanted to put in an offer on that house and I'm going to post it on the screen, the house. Love that house. It was just absolutely beautiful. And once again, he wanted to put in an all cash offer on the house. But before he could put in an all, he had told Amber, I want to put in an all cash offer. And what Amber, the woman, was smart enough to say is, okay, let's just go ahead and take it one step at a time. Let's go ahead and get your pre-approval stuff together. She said, I work with a great lender who, if, you, if you're not already pre-approved, um, he can get you pre-approved, no issues. Um, and then if you want to do an all cash offer, then we'll go ahead and get the proof of funds together. So that way we can submit it all with your offer. Jesus. Y'all already know what happened because you remember what happened on the last house with Scott. Um, basically, Legion was like, well... I can get you whatever you need. That's fine. But I really don't want to submit proof of funds unless they accept the offer. Amber, and I don't know where she is. I don't even know if she'll ever see this video. Um, anyway, let me keep going and I'll explain why that woman has a special place in my heart. So Amber was like, you know, I totally understand. Um, but this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> um, I'm going to need that paperwork. Okay. And um, we'll submit it with your offer. It, she, she just simply was like, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. And so he did not submit the paperwork um, when she had asked him to. And I remember I was driving to work and I stopped at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road in Riverdale, Georgia. And Amber had called me. It was it was in the morning. She had called me. Um, and I believe with all my heart that Amber knew something was up, but she also knew I did not know what was up. So she called me and she was like, I just don't understand. Like, if he has the paperwork, like you can submit the paperwork. But the issue was the Chase paperwork that I had was from a year prior. So my understanding was that it pretty much was no good at this point. Um, so she said he can, all he has to do is just email it to me or take a picture of. She was like, I just need to know that he's able to back up his offer. And I said, I totally get it. Um, and she was explaining some stuff to me. She was like, you know, he needs to do X, Y and Z. And so I said to her, I remember I said. I don't know what's going on. I said, um. I'm going to get down to the bottom of it, but I don't know what's going on. And so let's put a pause on this whole thing. Let's put a pause on looking at houses. Let's put a pause on um, getting his pre-approval letter because I'm not sure what's going on. And she got quiet 
And she said, okay. I said, and I know this sounds weird. And she said, no. She said, that is actually very smart. She said, um, do your research. And if I can be of assistance, call me. She said, whether you buy a house with him or you buy a house on your own, I will be more than happy to represent you. I don't know where Amber is today. But that one sentence, I felt like, I felt like just woman to woman, she was basically telling me something ain't right, baby, something ain't right, and now you need to open your eyes. I'll be more than happy to work with you um, if y'all get your shit together. I'll work with both of you. But whether you buy a house or not, do your research and then let me know what I can do. That was our conversation at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road. So I got off the phone. Um, that was the last time that we worked with any sort of real realtor. That was the last time that we looked at any sort of house. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember exactly what happened after that meeting that day. I do know that when I went home, I simply told him, I don't want to look at a house right now. Um, I said, I think it's okay if we rent. Um, we'll just find a house in Cobb County and just rent um, for a year. And let's, and let's build, you know, save some more money. Let's just, um, let's not worry about buying a house right now. And basically what I was trying to do was save face because that was the first time with Amber that I actually was embarrassed at the fact that we're wait, we, he and I, because I felt like I was complicit in the fact that I'm going to look at houses with him. I felt like we are wasting these people's time. I did not mean to waste your time. I clearly see my time as being wasted, but that doesn't mean I need to waste your time. And I felt embarrassed at the fact that we wasted her time um, coming across as serious buyers. When time came to put up or shut up, nothing was put up. And I knew nothing. I had nothing to add to, the, to, to, add to this because we're talking about a $650,000 house and, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't make that. I don't make anywhere near that. So it, was, it just became one of those situations where I was trying to save face. I was trying to save face with my husband and I was trying to save face with Amber. And so I did say to him, let's just rent for another year. And then let's see um, at that time where we are, if we should go ahead and buy. So now is when shit is about to get real. Part 25, who the fuck did I marry? So we weren't looking at houses anymore. We were not working with a realtor anymore. The end of April, I had decided that I wanted to look for another job. I did. The reason I wanted to look for another job is petty. Yeah, it is. I wanted to look for another job because I was pissed off at the fact that, um, I had basically was dependent on him to help with the car note. So I wanted to look for another job where I could afford life all by myself, including that car note, basically where I would make more money. I told him that I was going to start looking for another job. He laughed. And his exact words were, you're not going to leave Georgia State Patrol. He was like, I swear you love them niggas more than you love me. He laughed. So that fueled me even more. So I was hitting the pavement hard trying to find another job. I was applying to all kinds of places. Got a phone call um, from my current job. So this is how I ended up in my current job. Got a phone call um, they, and they had sent me an email with a background packet. The background packet 
was long and extensive. But in the background packet, it asked for my spouse's full name, my spouse's date of birth, and my spouse's social security number. So I showed it to Legion and I was like, I need your social because, you know, I'm applying for this job. It's a great job. It's way more money. Um, and, you know, we're talking about moving anyway to Cobb County. So this, you know, this, this is a God thing. He did not want to give me his social. I explained, I showed him the paperwork where I was like, look, because we are married, I I can't lie on here. So help me. <laughs> um, so he writes down his social security number on the background packet. And um, I eventually turned it in. I scanned it, saved it in my email and, and sent it in. And I looked at it one day because just going through it, just making sure I didn't really miss anything. All T's were crossed, all I's were dotted. And I looked at his social and something about the social seemed different than the social security number that I remember seeing when we did our marriage license. And so for those who you remember in the previous part, I said I had ran his social security number from the marriage license. Nothing came back. So I thought that I had written it down wrong. Basically, what it is, is that the first three numbers were different on the background packet than what was on the marriage license. If you don't know this, here's a little trivia. Your social security number, the first three numbers pretty much are dictated by the state you were born in and the state that issued your birth certificate. So he was born in Pennsylvania. So his social, the first three letters, excuse me, the first three numbers of his social security number should be attributed to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, shit, they probably got like five, six different numbers, uh, three digit numbers that your social security number can start with. So the social that was on the marriage license, for example, um, was probably one, two, three. What was on the background was four, five, six. Both of those social security three digit prefixes are issued through the state of Pennsylvania. Again, this is an example so I can make it clear. So when I saw his social on my background, I immediately knew that was a different social than what I saw on the marriage license. Um, and when I compared, because I, f I had found a copy of the marriage license that we turned in because I had filled it out on the computer. So sure enough, the first three numbers were different. The rest of the numbers were the same. So one of two things, either when I ran his background, I did in fact put in the wrong number or the number on the mayor's certificate or the um, background packet is wrong. So I decided that I was going to roll the dice and take the social from the background packet. Again, this is the background packet that I had to fill out to get my current job. I was trying to get a new job. Okay, so I took that social and I ran a background check on it. What came back on this particular background were, was all the addresses that the social security number, I guess, had been um, attached to. So all of the addresses, the states were Georgia, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. What I did not see was California. So I thought that was weird. I thought, OK, maybe this is not a complete background because clearly he went to San Diego State. It's on his resume. It's on it's on quite a few things. Social media. He didn't have a LinkedIn, but it was on his social media. So clearly he had he had been to California. So maybe I just need to do a different background check. Also to note during this time, he, um, I think I told you guys, he had hit his leg at work. So what was happening was it was getting more and more difficult 
for him to walk, like put pressure on that leg, on that knee. Um, he was still able to go to work. He was he was still leaving at 615 in the morning. He was still coming back between 330 and four o'clock. But I clearly could see where he was in pain. Um, he would elevate the knee, ice the knee. It was it was getting worse. And I was constantly like, go to the doctor. Let me take you to urgent care so that they can look at this knee because you shouldn't still be limping and having a hard time um, putting weight on that knee. And every single time he was like, oh, you know, it's it's fine. I have a doctor's appointment on Wednesday. The doctor just told me to ice it and to elevate it. Um, this happened. This is an old football injury. It happens all the time. It used to happen a lot when I was out in California. So I'm mentioning this knee issue for a reason. Um, but back to the background. So once again, when I ran the background the second time with his second social, it showed me states of Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And that is all this that's all that I saw in terms of addresses. I didn't see anything for California. So by this point, we're moving into May of 2021. Things are starting to reopen. One of the things that reopened was San Diego State. So I called San Diego State. I called the registrar's office, registrar's office. Um, someone did answer and there was there was um, instructions on how to request a transcript. Um, I was able to try to request it online. You needed the person's the student's name and I believe you also need their social. And when I typed it in, it said no results found. Um, I believe that I sent an email asking, you know, this person is, is saying that they were a student there. Can you verify it? The response I got was there were no records found with that social security number. <laughs> so I'm like, OK. I asked him about it. And in part 26, I'll tell you exactly what his response was. Part 26, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked Legion, what's the deal about San Diego State? He was like, what are you talking about? And I said, um, why is there no records of you there? <laughs> I just came right out and said it. Without missing a beat, this man said, well, I was a private citizen. What the fuck does that mean? And what he said is that when he started at San Diego State, his father paid money so that, okay, it's important I'd say this with a straight face. His, his father paid money so that his name and social would not be publicized and he would be considered a private student, a private citizen. Um, he said that he had a card where all he had to do was show the card. He does not have to give his name. He does not have to give any information because he had that card. He said, so San Diego State would not public would not have any record of him, but he was, in fact, a student there. I said, and you claim that you played football. He was like, I did play football. I said, so you're saying that the school did not publish your name anywhere and they were in violation of NCAA rules. And he was like, why are you asking all these questions? And I said, I'm just curious. I'm just, meh, meh, I'm just curious. You're saying that you were a private citizen, but yet how did you, how were you in compliance with NCAA if you were a private citizen and they did not publish your name on any roster? So that was his excuse. He was like, all I can tell you is that I was a private citizen. My dad paid for it. Okay. So now I know that San Diego State has no record of him. Now I know that his social security number, at least the one that's on my back, my background packet, only shows that he listed in, he, excuse me, only shows that he lived in Georgia, Rhode Island, 
and Pennsylvania. Okay. So at this point, the pain in his knee is getting worse. Uh, it's getting to the point where when he would come home from work, he would take a shower and immediately get in bed, elevate his knee. He was he was not even eating um, the way that he used to eat. It was getting to the point where at times, um, if you remember when I told you all about the miscarriage, they gave me pain meds because I had taken that pill. But the pain meds I was allergic to, so I couldn't take them, but I still had them. So the pain in his knee was getting to the point where he would take one of those pain meds just to get through the night. He was constantly in agony, constantly kind of tossing and turning, so much so that in May he moved into the guest bedroom because I couldn't deal with the tossing and turning thing. And he just said he was more comfortable there. So what what at first was a, oh, I hit my knee at work, turned into, no, it was an old football injury. This has happened before. Turned into, you know, it's painful for me to walk on it. Turned into, it's, it's actually hard for me to work on it. Um, but he was, he was still going to work at 615 every morning and coming home between 330 and four. So... Um, it is, again, I'm just giving you guys the chronological order of how all this happened. So at this point, we're not looking at, we're not looking for a house. Um, I still have not seen the two savings account. I'm pretty sure there's no money in those savings accounts. But again, he was going to put in an all cash offer with Amber, the real realtor. So I really didn't know what to believe, but I I believed what I saw, which is I saw that that background is not showing where he went to California. So at one point in May, it was close to mid-May, he calls me from work. He calls me from work, calls me while I'm at work and tells me that he got a phone call from his stepson. The phone call from his stepson, the stepson was crying and was just absolutely distraught. And I'm at work in my office like, what's going on? And he says to me that the stepson informed him that his stepdaughter passed away. That she died from COVID. The stepson, found, this is the story. The stepson found her in her apartment because they had not heard from her for a couple of days. And she was unresponsive. He called the ambulance. They pronounced her dead when she got to the hospital. So he was calling to tell me that she had died. Um, and he was also calling to ask me if I would object to him giving his ex-wife $2,000 towards the funeral. As I've stated before, and I, and I still am this way to this day, I don't play about death. So when he told me that she died, I immediately went into the, all right, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, whatever we can do to help, let's help. Because Surely nobody would make that up. So he, he again, he was like, are you are you OK with that? He was like, we're married. And the agreement was that anything over five hundred dollars would be a discussion. So two thousand definitely. And I said, yeah, I said, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, he was upset because, again, he was close with the kids and my heart went out to his ex-wife. It did because I I can't even imagine. I cannot even imagine. So part 27, who the fuck did I marry? So here's where we are at and here's what we can establish. Number one, 
I ran an initial background check on the social security number that was on our marriage license. Nothing came back. I subsequently applied for another job. In that job, I had to fill out a background packet. The background packet asked for my spouse's name, date of birth, and his social security number. The social security number on the background packet for the new job did not match the social security number that he gave me for our marriage license. If you are confused, I believe it's in part 25 or part 26 that I explain that. So we can establish that I then ran a background check on the new social security number that was on my background packet. It came back with um, address or excuse me, states that it that the social security number apparently had lived in. Those states were Georgia, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. OK, I decided this is now around May 20th. I decided to do another background check um, and I paid to do another background check. This time I did it with a different company and not only did it give me the addresses, excuse me, not only did it give me um, the states, it gave me addresses and it also gave me names of people who were like associated with Legion and that address. One of those names was his ex-wife. I've always known, he's, he's always told me the name of the ex-wife. But now I see it when I ran his background. I did a search for her on social media. She was not there. So the address that it showed that she was associated with, with him, because remember his story is we got married in San Diego. We lived in San Diego. We divorced in San Diego. Men lie. Women lie. The U.S. federal government, which is a social security number, does not. So... Um, he's saying he was always in California. His social security number never showed that he was in California, according to the background check. It did show that he had lived in Georgia at an address associated with the ex-wife. So try to find the ex-wife, could not find her on social media. So I looked in the metro counties to protect her identity, this I am going to not divulge a lot on this part. I looked in the metro counties in the um, the open record courts. So typically, you know, you can look in like superior court or magistrate court or probate court. So I looked in open records for the different counties, metro counties, metro Atlanta counties. Let me be clear, metro Atlanta counties. And I looked under her name and I found where they had filed for divorce in a metro Atlanta county. So when he said that he filed for divorce in San Diego and that he was married in San Diego, I was able to find no, according to the state of Georgia, you were married here. You were divorced here. So I looked under her name, found a record, found a record for divorce, and it did show his name. So now I clearly see on my computer that there is a Metro count, Metro Atlanta County court that has a divorce record in the state of Georgia between him and his ex-wife. So I did what any rational person would do. Because this is still kind of COVID time. Um, well, not really. It had nothing to do with COVID. Let me take that back. Because of the parameters of the court, you can only do the open records request in person. I did what anybody would do. I told my boss I had to go. I grabbed my purse, grabbed my keys, and I drove to the court to do the open records request in person. The open records request was for the divorce documents. 
go back in the story in the series and remember I went over I did a background on the ex-wife I told you all exactly what was told to me he met her in California he married her in California he divorced her in California because she cheated on him he filed for divorce she tried to get spousal support it turned it was going to be a little ugly he was helping her with the kids that was the story that was told to me so went to the court filled out the paperwork got the open records request for the divorce decree for the divorce records first thing i see he didn't file she did second thing i see they didn't make it more than six months I see the the date of marriage. I see the date of the date of uh, dissolution. Six months. Second, uh, third thing I see, he was served in Metro Atlanta, which means that at the time of the divorce, he was living in Metro Atlanta. Had nothing. California was never mentioned. Fourth thing I see, he filed what is called a pop pauper affidavit if you don't know what that is i'm going to do my best to explain it real quick basically he filed an affidavit with the court saying that he is so poor he could not afford the fees to pay for a divorce he couldn't afford a filing fee he couldn't afford a service fee that is what a pauper affidavit is for all of this is in um, the divorce documents she had filed she said it was irreconcilable differences. She was not requesting any money whatsoever. Um, and both of them had signed a pauper affidavit. He was served in Georgia at his previous employment. According to the divorce documents, he was served at like a grocery store. That is what was listed as his employer. And it had a date of when he was served. So I see all of this in one day. I also see where on the divorce documents, she listed her name, her address, and her phone number. So I did what any rational person would do. I wrote down the phone number. There was a 50-50 chance that the number was already disconnected. She could be like me. I'm one of those people. Honey, you can sneeze at a 27-degree angle. I will change my number so quick, you ain't even know what hits you. You can talk to me at 5 o'clock, and at 5.05, my number has been changed. So she could have been like me, and the number is not even active. Or she could be like some people I know who have kept their number since kindergarten. Either way, I wrote the number down. I um, left the court and I immediately went back to work. And the same friend who helped me when I had my miscarriage, I told her, I was like, I got this phone number. This is the ex-wife. She was like, girl, you better call. You better call and, fi and find out from her. Because can't no, I think she said to me, can't nobody tell you what is going on quite like the ex-wife so part 28 is the phone call that i had with the ex-wife part 28 of who the fuck did i marry so i had the phone number went back to work um my really good friend was like you better call her you can use my phone but call her so I called her. Um, she answered. Let me use aliases. Um, and the conversation went like this. May I please speak with Barbara? This is Barbara. Barbara, this is Shirley. Shirley who? This is Shirley Jones. I am the wife of Legion. Silence. Then she starts laughing. And she said to me, and I quote, if you were calling me, then I know it's bad. I chuckle and I said to her, I'm not trying to bother you. 
I'm not trying to disrupt your life. I, I said, I am literally coming to you on some woman to woman shit. I said, because you are probably the only person who can help. <laughs> she and she she listened. She was she was gracious. And she said, um, she said, what is it that you need to know? Or what is it that you want to know? And I said, I understand that you and my husband talk and communicate. Um, and she was and she immediately said, what? No, we don't. And I said, OK. Um, she said, one thing you need to know about Legion. She said, whatever he tells you, it is a lie. And she said, when he again, let's go back to part one. I told you guys that when he introduced himself or when we met we actually had matched on two different sites and he was under two different names. One was an act was like the actual birth name. The other one was a nickname variation of that name. That's the name I know him by. So for example, if his name was Matthew, he had a profile under Matthew and then he had a profile under Matt. I would have known him as Matt. So she said to me, she was like, I don't even know who Matt is. She was like, that's not even his name. And so I knew what his actual government name is. She was like, no one calls him Matt. She was like, that must be his new, um, his new personality. Or she, she was cracking a joke, but she was like, anything he tells you, you need to know is a lie. So I just asked her, I said, what was your experience? I said, because I can tell you the story he told me and she and she stopped me right there. She said, whatever he told you was a lie. She said, let me guess. He told you I cheated on him. Let me guess. He told you that I wanted money from him. And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah, that's a complete lie. Um, so we had a conversation where she told me how they met um, they didn't meet online or anything. I said, well, were you guys ever in California? She said, no. She's like, he, he, she was like, that man ain't never been from past the East coast. So I said, okay. Um, so you guys have always been in Georgia. And she said, yeah. She's like, we got married in Georgia and we got divorced in Georgia. And she, that's when she asked me, how did you even get my number? She said, because, I want nothing to do with him. So how did you get my number? I told, And I said, I'm going to tell you the truth. It ain't going to make me look good. I told her, I said, this is, this is what happened. And this is what led to me doing research. And this is how I got your number. And she laughed. She was like, wow. She, said, she was like, normally I would be freaked out, she said. But under the circumstances, she was like, wow, okay. Um... She said, yeah, if you're calling me, then it must have gotten pretty bad. She said, so what did he promise you? And we talked for about 30, 35 minutes. She asked me in that phone call, she said, look, I want nothing to do with him. I have not spoken to him since our divorce was finalized. She said, so I would just appreciate if you keep me out of whatever's going on with y'all. And I told her, I said, I give you my word. I will never tell him I spoke to you. I said, I give you my word. I said, this, this, this conversation is for me. It is not for me to use in any sort of legal litigation, nothing. This is for me. And, um, I said, I, I said, I don't plan to call you again. I don't plan to be a disrupt a disruption in your life. I just needed to know how bad is it? And she was she paused and she said, It's bad. She said, I don't know what all y'all got going on. She said, but if it's anything like what it was for me, it's bad. 
So we talked a little bit more. She was very encouraging. She was like, girl, do not blame yourself. She said, um, I went through that and I, I had blamed myself. She was like, this is not on us. This is on him. Um, she was like, he is a master liar, a master manipulator. She said, I ignored the red flags. So she was like, do not feel as though this is on you. We talked about, um, the ex, there's an ex-girlfriend that shares the name that shares the same name as his aunt. She and I talked about her. She said, um, the reason why they broke up because the ex-girlfriend, I didn't know this, the ex-girlfriend had reached out to her about six months before he met me. And so <sighs> the ex-girlfriend lives in um, lived in Douglasville. On Legion's driver's license, he had a Georgia driver's license with the Douglasville address. What he told me was that it was the address that his sister, because remember I told y'all his sister Shantae lives in Douglasville. She's a nurse married with two kids. So he told me that the address on his license, it was his driver's license, was to Shantae's house. The ex-wife is telling me no. That's the address for the girlfriend, the ex-girlfriend. He had moved in with her and he created this whole narrative with her. She found out um, that he was lying and she kicked him out. And so I guess after she kicked him out, she then um, reached out to the ex-wife kind of the way I did for confirmation. And so the ex-wife was just telling me, whatever that man has told you, it is a lie. She said, I got out before it got too bad. Um, she said, because once I knew he was lying, I was out. She was like, because he's never going to change. <laughs> um, and so... Again, conversation went on and on. And so finally, we were getting ready to get off the phone. And before we got off the phone, I said to her, I said, if everything is a lie, I said, I have one question for you. And she said, sure. I said, how is your daughter? I said, how is your daughter? Next part coming up. Part 29, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked her, how was your daughter? She said, my daughter's fine. And I said, okay. She said, what did he say about my daughter? And I will be honest with y'all. I didn't have the heart to tell her. So what I said instead was, oh, no, it was, you know, with everything with COVID, I think he mentioned that she might have um, she might have had COVID or was exposed to it. I downplayed it bad. I wasn't going to tell that woman that he said her daughter passed away. Um, so. She did, I said, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm glad to hear that kids are fine. She, she said, look, whether you stay with him or not is your choice. She said, he ain't going to change. He ain't going to change at all. Um, she said, this, th this is what he does. She said, you're not the first. You're not going to be the last. She said, he did it to me. She was very, very encouraging because she was just like, you do not blame yourself. She said, you know, we both ignored red flags, um, but it is not your fault. She said, this is on him. And so we, you know, once again, I thanked her for her time, got off the phone. I took the long way home that night. Um, I, I could not be around him. <laughs> I could not be around him. I had to figure something out. I had to, I had to figure some things out. So I just 
I, I took the long way home. What does that mean? It means that I purposely, I probably could have taken, oh, 75 to 285, but I probably took 20 to 75 to 285 to 675 kind of thing. Like, I just took the long way home. Um, a couple of days later, because I really, my, my mind was spinning. A couple of days later, at this point, I'm turning into the FBI, CIA, and Homeland Security all in one. Literally. I'm I'm trying to find everything. Um, and he's carrying on his business as usual. Nothing changed with him. He had no idea that I had spoken to the ex-wife. He had no idea I had gone to the court and saw his divorce um, documents. He had no idea. So a couple of days later, I decided to look up his mother's obituary, look up the mother's obituary and um, down at the bottom where it talks about, oh, she's preceded in death by and it lists all the people, the family members that died before. And then it says leaving behind to cherish her memory. It lists the husband, his dad. Her husband, excuse me. Let me start over. It lists her husband, which is Legion's dad. It lists Legion's brother that lives in Philly and his wife. Because again, this is a 2000. She passed away in 2015. So it lists Legion, the, the brother in Philly and his wife and daughter, her granddaughter. It lists Legion and his wife. I think it was like Latoya. Or le, le something. Le something. Um, it did not list the ex-wife I just spoke to. And it clearly said Legion, his wife, Latoya. Then it listed the brother in Nashville, his wife, Jane or whatever. <sighs> So I'm thinking to myself, there's two things I was thinking immediately. Number one, um, who is LaToya? Never heard that name before. Never heard that name before. So I was thinking, who was LaToya? And then number two, where are the two sisters? Shantae and Kim. Shantae lives in Douglasville, married with two kids. Kim lives in Augusta, and I believe he told me she worked at like Procter and Gamble. So wh why aren't they listed on here? Because apparently, uh, go back to the video. I, I posted it on there. I gave y'all background on the family. He apparently was one of five through both parents, brother in Philly, older brother, younger brother in Nashville, an older sister in Douglasville, and a baby sister in Augusta. So why is it on his mother's obituary? There's only three, three children named. Where are the where are the two sisters? So I'm even more like, what in the hell's going on? And then I started thinking to myself, where? Why wouldn't they list Shantae? Like, they talk all the time, so I know that they're close because he talks to Shantae all the time. So. I, I really was confused. Again, keep in mind, I'm trying to give y'all insight into how I was thinking May of 20, uh, excuse me, May of 2021, because I still, still didn't find out a lot of stuff at that time. I found out enough to figure out, okay, it's not a question of if he's lying. That, that, that was over. It's not a question of if he's lying. The question now is becoming, what else is he lying about? So we have the phone call with the ex-wife. Now I see an obituary that apparently there's another wife. I know on our marriage certificate, it only states he had a pre one previous marriage. I had zero, he had one. So this is how I'm thinking in my head, which is, Okay, what am I what am I missing here? I know we've established that he's lying, but 
Who who the fuck is Latoya? Like, I'm really trying to understand who is Latoya. Um, and again, he's he's hobbling around the house, limping. And I'm I'm in our bed well, in the bedroom, just I mean, I could not get on Google fast enough to try to figure some stuff out. So, um, see the mom's obituary, study it. And at this point, I'm now trying to figure out, okay, what's the game plan? What is the game plan? And that's where we are about to get into the next part. Okay, part 30 of who the fuck did I marry? So I'm going to use this as a clarification video. So we're going to use part 30 as a stop. Let's clarify some things. Um, I've done that before on a previous set of videos. So I think it's just important to do that. So that way I can try to address some of the things that I have seen in the comments, um, both supportive and just downright mean <laughs> but let me clarify some stuff number one it is important to remember that i am telling this entire story of how i met dated married and divorced my pathologically lying ex-husband i am going in chronological order of events so what that means is that ma'am sir whoever you are if you were coming in at part 30 but you have not seen part 11, some stuff is not gonna make sense. I know, I know, I know it is a long playlist. Um, and don't worry about watching the video as soon as it comes out because everything I'm trying to do this um, responsibly of telling the story in the order of which things happen. So I say that to say, please, if, you, if you're able to, Start at the introduction disclaimer video. Start with part one and then just watch each video because a lot of the questions people are having that I'm seeing in the comments, and I say this respectfully, is just because you did not go to the other videos and watch them in order. That's just the first thing I wanna say. Um, it is important that I get this story out, but that it's done, like I said, responsibly. To me, responsibly is being honest even if it makes me look bad, but then also trying to be clear and not ramble all over the place. So I'm trying to take the time to tell you this is what happened at this time. This is what happened at that time. That's why there's so many parts and we're not even to the part of the divorce yet. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. Second thing I wanna clarify, I cannot stress this enough. My family and my friends did not know what was going on between Legion and I. They did not know. My family only knew we've met this guy. He's dating our daughter, our niece, our cousin, our granddaughter. He seems to be a really nice guy. He seems to really love her. Um, from what he has told us, he's done well for himself. He played football. Um, and he has worked at this company six, seven years and financially he is in a good place from what we understand he just moved here from california that is what they knew they did not know about the red flags i had they did not know what was going on in my head they did not know what was going on in my heart because i did not want to look stupid i'm fully aware that when i tell this story i look stupid I'm aware and I've made my peace with that. But at the time, I did not want to look stupid. So it was important to me to put on a everything's great. We're really happy. We're looking for a house and everything's going well, knowing full well that behind scenes, I couldn't figure out why he wasn't showing proof of funds. They did not know. So I say that to say, I see the comments about how my aunt gave me horrible advice when I called her about the sexting on Facebook. And I wanna clarify something. She did not tell me to stay with him. She did not tell me to leave him. That's not her place and that's not what she would do. She simply was in shock that any of this had happened and did not know what to give me advice on. 
the one thing that she did say was, look, he's not your boyfriend. Meaning it ain't as simple as, oh, we just going to break up, pack your shit and go. Because you married him. My aunt is the most ride or die chick I've ever met. You fuck with me, you fuck with her. And she is straight Jersey. So I, and I, I love her for it, but I need it to, it's not fair for me to leave it out there as if, oh, she just was like her. I mean, go home and deal with it. No, never in a million years. So I just want to, I want to clarify that. Also want to clarify about my mom. So my mom lives in Arkansas. And when she came to visit in April, this is, we were already married. This is her first time physically meeting Legion. My mom will tell you, she had no idea anything was amiss, but there was something that nagged her a little bit. She didn't know what it was. And my mom is the type where she's gonna get on her knees in prayer. That's who she is. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. He seems like a nice guy. He seems to love my daughter. Um, there, Because again, there was no arguing in the house. The house was peaceful while she was here. Even though behind the scenes, we had just came off of the whole sexting incident with other women. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. She did tell me later on that it seemed as if I wasn't as happy as she thought I would have been. But again, she took it to the Lord in prayer and her prayer was, God, protect my child. I don't know what's going on, but protect her. That was my mom's response. So she did not know. She did not pick up um, or overhear something that was going on while she was while she was here. She had a uh, candid conversation with Legion and Legion kind of came across as it's. I miss my mom. He missed his own mother. And so he called my mom, mom and um, doted on her again, putting on a a charade. And so for her, it was like, you know, bless his heart. That's (laughs) that's what she said. Bless his heart. Um, But no, she did. She did not know the specifics. Nobody knew the specifics. They didn't know the specifics until. We're talking May, June of 2021. They knew that we were looking for a house. They knew that the house fell through. They did not know about the proof of funds. They did not know that he wouldn't show me the savings account, the offshore account. So I just want to say that because to me, it would be irresponsible to not clarify what family and friends knew um, because they these people have always been supportive of me, always had my back. I just simply did not share with them the things that I felt like were red flags. Because again, my mindset at the time was I want to be married. And what if he isn't lying? And, you know, I was making excuses for him to myself. So I definitely would have made excuses to family. Another thing I need to clarify. And I saw the comments on this about how a VP would never date someone that looked like me. And to the person that wrote it, that wasn't very nice. Um, I need to, I need you all to understand the relationship started in March of 2020. He had came, he came into my life as regional manager. Okay. That is how he came into my life. Then eventually he got promoted to VP of production or operations, some VP of something. That was later on in the relationship. He showed me the paperwork where it it was basically a memo from HR. You know, you've now your new position title will be VP of pr- production. We'll just say production. Your salary. I don't remember the exact amount because it was a very specific amount, but it was over two hundred thousand dollars. It listed some of the benefits that he would have. Um, he would have an office. He would be getting an executive assistant. That's where we get David from. If you don't know who David is, please go back and watch the series in order. He would be getting an executive assistant. He would be getting use of the company helicopter. He would be getting a company car. 
that is where we're introduced to the fact that he was starting to shop for a company car that could not be more than $90,000. That's what he told me. I didn't see this in the memo, the amount of the car, but that's what he told me. So that's where you get the car shopping for the Range Rover, the Jaguar, the um, uh, the B the BMW. He even test drove a Mercedes uh, GLE, I believe. So I'm, I'm just trying to, again, bring some clarity to this so that way we all can understand what's going on. And hopefully this just makes a lot more sense for everyone. All right. Part 31. Part 31, who the fuck did I marry? So I found his mother's obituary online. It then told me, um, it listed the, <laughs> it listed his brother in Philly and his wife. It listed Legion and then it said his wife. I took the name from the obituary and I did a Metro Atlanta court search with that name. I found a divorce record. <sighs> I found a divorce record with Legion and the same woman's name that was in the obituary. Um, in that divorce record, it looks like he's the one that filed for divorce. This would have been around 2016. This was after the mother's death. He filed for divorce. She was the respondent, I think that's the correct um, terminology, both had a temporary protection order against each other. He had one against her. She had one against him. The divorce ended up getting um, granted, finalized. Then it looks like he went on his way. In the course of the search for her name, I discovered that at one point in time, the two of them had lived in Rhode Island. So that's the connection with Rhode Island because for the longest time I could not figure out was, who lived in Rhode Island. Um, that's where that came from. The two of them, he and this woman lived in Rhode Island um, several years prior or a few years prior. Um, I could not find the obituary for his dad. Um, I searched and I searched. I could not find the obituary for his father. For whatever reason, I just, and I knew the, I knew his grandmother's name. I just randomly decided to do a Google search of the grandmother's name. Initially, nothing came up because I was looking for the grandmother's name in Philly. Nothing came up. I looked for the grandmother's name down here in Georgia. Found um, a record, but it was not, um, it wasn't quite clear. What was clear was that she had died several years prior. So what I found was um, a different website where it was like a like a legacy.com type thing. So I believe legacy.com holds old obituaries. Did a search for her name, found a match. That is when I discovered that she actually had passed away in July of 2008. Read the read the caption of the obituary and verified that in fact it was his grandmother. She, because at the bottom of it, again, obituaries tell you a lot. It names um, who who she leaves to cherish her memory. So it lists all the different family members. It lists the brother in Philly. It lists Legion, no spouse, and then a brother in Nashville. Once again, it did not list the two sisters, Shantae and Kim. So I'm even more like, okay, clearly um, something, you know, is, is, is up when it comes to Shantae and Kim. Because, but what I do know is that he has um, talked to them multiple times in front of me. So I'm not sure what I'm missing. Maybe some family feud happened. I, honestly, I don't know. 
So that is how I discovered that when he told me the grandmother died from COVID and he was crying, boohooing and all that shit, she actually had died in July of 2008. I found this out the same time that I found out about allegedly, and I say allegedly because I'll explain, allegedly the first um, wife, or at least what I think is the first wife. So while all this is going on, Legion is almost bedridden from what happened with his knee. And I need to take a moment to address this issue with the knee. Again, the story started, he hit his knee. Then it turned into, um, it was an old football injury. And this has happened before. He's going to the doctor. The doctor's telling him to ice it and to elevate it. He eventually moves into the guest bedroom to be more comfortable. I'm going to make this statement. This is probably the only time I will make this statement. He was not lying about the injury that he had. I don't know where the injury came from, but what I do know was he was not lying in the fact that he was in pain. You could clearly see that he was in pain and the pain was becoming debilitating. Please understand what I'm saying. The pain was debilitating enough to where he was taking my pain meds from when I had um, the miscarriage. And then also it was hard for him to walk. He was not eating. So this is what made me believe this, whatever was going on with the knee, there was more to it because he was not eating. When I met this man, he was a size three X. At this point in time in May, he's down to a two X. He is not exercising. He is not doing anything mobile. He's simply not eating. So there definitely was something going on, something concerning. Honestly, I thought it might have been cancer. But he kept saying, no, it's not that. It's from a football injury. It's from a football injury. I said to him, the next time you have a doctor's appointment, I want to go. It was that bad. Um, and he kept making excuses like, okay, fine. I'll make the appointment. I'll let you know what it is. Cool. I will take off work. I want to be at that doctor's appointment because whatever is going on with you is serious to the point where you are losing weight rapidly within a two week span. So now we can go ahead and enter into June. Um, when we enter into June, I have verified, read the divorce documents for not one wife, but two wives. I have called San Diego State, verified they have no record of him. He claims he was a private citizen. I don't believe that. They're saying there's no record of him. I have pulled his background. It is showing that you've lived in Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Georgia. When I look at the addresses, it is tied to at least two women, both of whom I'm showing divorce records on file that you had. Um, I've also verified that your grandmother actually died in 2008 and not in 2020 from COVID. I know all of this as I'm going into June. His birthday is June 17th. So all I've been doing is just trying to figure out what is it, what is it I'm going to do? I spoke to the pastor and his wife. I believe it was actually the pastor I spoke to because I knew the pastor um, previously before he did our marriage counseling. And I told him what I found. Mine blown. Mine blown. Had no idea. He knew something was up. He knew that Legion was not really trying to make this marriage work. He had no idea all this was going on. So he asked me, are you wanting to stay or do you want to end the marriage? I said, oh, absolutely. I'm ending it. Oh, hell yeah. I'm ending it. I, 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 I have to. I have to end it. Um, I have no idea who that man is in my guest bedroom. Not to mention, on top of all of this, he had lied about the death of the ex-wife's daughter. Part 32. Part 32. 
who the fuck did I marry? All right. So we're now in June. By this point in June, um, I have been offered the new job, accepted it, put in my two-week notice at my previous job, and was going to be starting this the, the new job later on in the month. So when he laughed where I told him I wanted to get a new job, that laughter fueled me to get a new job. <laughs> so here's what happened the beginning of June. He's at this point, he's completely bedridden. When I say completely bedridden, what I mean is, um, I'm trying to clarify this so it makes sense. From what I see, he is going to work, but he's calling out a lot more. Okay. So he had already left the condiment company and was working for Apple. So he's calling out quite a bit because the pain is pretty bad. So he's hardly eating at this point, hardly. For example, if I were to say, oh, I ordered a 10 piece wings, he's eating two. And that's it. That's all I would see him eat. Well, I was going to work and coming home. The house was the in the exact same um, place that it was when I left. Nothing in the kitchen had been moved. Nothing in the refrigerator had been moved, which led me to believe that he had not left the bed from the time I left to go to work until the time I came home. At this point in time, he's drinking power aids like it's water. I mean, I'm buying cases of power aids. Um, and that seemed to be the only thing that he was taking in. So if he was a 3X when I met him, he's probably at a 1X maybe a 2x depending on the clothes he's lost a lot of weight because he's not eating so that's the reason why i say he wasn't faking whatever was going on i think the knee the issue with his knee was a symptom that was not some football injury that was not um oh i hit it at work it wasn't that something else was going on i had kept asking him to you know let me know when you have a doctor's appointment i'm gonna go with you i'm gonna go with you and um, he just kept saying the doctor to he's he's calling the doctor and the doctor told him to just keep icing the knee. But I knew better. What was happening was I didn't care. Because of all the stuff I was finding out. So beginning of June, he is in a bed um, sleep and I get his phone. I ain't gonna lie. I, I got his phone. He had a work phone and he had um, a personal phone. It was the work phone that he had from the condiment company that apparently was never turned in. Follow me. It all come out. So he still had the work phone. It was deactivated. But he did not wipe the phone. If y'all know what I mean, take all the data off. He did not do that. So I looked through the phone. And I see this would have been text messages, text messages between him and a woman named Peaches. I go back to the beginning of the text messages. This is on the work phone. This is the beginning of June of 2021. I go back to the text messages on excuse me, the beginning of the text messages between him and Peaches. Yes, that was her name. Peaches. I'm reading the thread because he's knocked out sleep. So I'm in the bathroom with the door locked, reading the thread. And what I can tell is that he met Peaches on POF. If you don't know what POF is, it is Plenty of Fish, a dating website. He met Peaches. This would have, I saw the messages in June. So he met Peaches around February. Um, met Peaches from POF. And apparently Peaches... Um, was, you know, there's no nice way to say it. apparently Peaches was, was a prostitute. So be, and the reason why I say that is because in the text messages, 
she's listing the prices. So he asked for a hand job. This is in the text messages. She told him it would be like $40. He asked how much would it be for oral? She said um, it would be 60 Um because it was 60 and 80. One was the price with a condom. One was the price without one. So no messages after that. She sent a picture. He sent a picture. No messages after that. So in other words, these messages were not back to back every single day. There's breaks in between the messages. So like a message was in March. The next message is in April. A message in April. Next message is like two weeks later. So... um He's asking her the prices. Next message I see would have been from a few weeks prior to the date of this. So this was the beginning of June. This The message is from sometime beginning of May where he is thanking her and says to her, you know, thank you so much. That was really great. I hope I can see you again. <sighs> then there's messages where she said, hey, basically, she was at an she was at a new spot. She must have moved. So he said, OK, I'm going to come through. I'm going to come see you. He's asking her to confirm the address. He was like, is it the house with the brown trash can with a white car in the front? She says, yes. Yeah. So I'm thinking he was actually in front of the house when he's texting these messages. Then again, he does whatever he does. And he sends her a message a few hours later saying, thank you. That was great. I'm reading all this. Um, and I will tell you guys something that you may or may not understand. Some women may or may not understand it. The cheating didn't even phase me. Didn't even phase me. I didn't cry. I didn't. Um, I did not feel like what did I do wrong? I was relieved. The reason why I was relieved is because up until this point, I kind of struggled a little bit on whether or not, God, you know, I know, I know, Lord, you hate divorce, but I can't, I just, I, I can't stay with a guy that lies. So when I saw the cheating stuff, I was like, oh, shoot, thank you, Jesus. Okay. Because I know my father in heaven is going to forgive the fact that I'm a divorce him for infidelity. Go ahead. It's fine. I'll, I, Jesus will forgive me. Um, so I was, I was, I was relieved to be honest with you. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> I got grounds now, bitch. Um, that's how I felt. So saw the messages, forwarded the messages to my phone, um, or excuse me, I took. I had to take my phone because the phone was deactivated. So I kind of had to do a little ghetto, hold the phone up, take my phone and take pictures of what I see on the phone um, so that I would have proof on my phone. Then I put the phone back and continued on. Now in the next part is the day that he gets kicked out. And I will tell y'all what happened. Part 33, who the fuck did I marry? June 17th, 2021. So you guys have been on this ride. You now know exactly what information I did have. The morning of June 17th, which was his birthday. um, He was in the bed as usual. Powerade bottles all over the place because I wasn't in the mood to clean. Um, And so I went in his room. He was awake. He was watching youtube on his cell phone he watched a lot of youtube watching um these two guys that always were fixing jeeps on youtube um and if i saw them i would know exactly who they are but i can't remember their name it's a popular show on youtube anyway so i go in there and i I just calmly sit on the edge of the bed and i was like can we talk and he was like yeah what's up I said to him, I said, Legion, obviously I called him his name, Legion. I said, I'm going to ask you something. I just want you to be honest with me. So he starts, I can already see in his eyes, he's about to get defensive. And I was like, calm, because this this is the tone I had, calm. I said, "Um, you never went to San Diego State, did you? 
he rolls his eyes and he's like, I already, I said, calm down, watch your tone. <laughs> I said, you never went to San Diego State. I said, you never lived in California, did you? And he said, of course I lived in California. He was like, I fucking showed you the house I had in California. He said, and I told you about San Diego State. I was a private citizen. My dad paid for me to be a private citizen. And I said, okay. I said, I called San Diego State. And he looked at me. His eyes were like empty. Like he wasn't shocked. He wasn't like, oh my God. He was just more like, okay. Okay. I said, they have no record of you. I said, they have no record because you never went. You never been to California. So at this point, I'm very calm and I'm just stating. I said, you never been to California. I said, I bet you've only lived in Georgia, Pennsylvania and Rhode Island. At this point, now there's there's a little emotion behind the eyes. And I said, I don't think that this is going to work. And he said, what, the marriage? He was like, so what you saying? You you don't want to be married to me anymore? And I said, I don't want to be married to you anymore. I said, we need to go our separate ways. We tried, but we need to go our separate ways. The way that I am talking to you all is exactly how I was talking to him. Um, and so he was like, that's not what marriage is. Marriage is, you know, you, you, you have to fight for what you want. I said, I don't want this. And I don't want to fight for it. I said, I don't want you. And I don't want this. And so he was like, I'm not giving up on the two of us. I said, you don't have a choice. I said, I think that you should call your brother or your sister now. And I think that you need to pack a bag. And I think you need to get the fuck out my house. And he was like, you know, I don't really have time for this. You know, I don't feel what I said. I don't care. You need to get out of my house. Again, the way I'm, I know y'all are going to be like, she's so dramatic. And in real, I am actually a very dramatic person. But the way that I'm talking to you guys on this video is exactly how I was talking to him in the beginning of how this started. So I said, you need to call your brother um, or call your sister because she's, she's in Douglasville and you need to go stay there. You need to get out this house today. <sighs> Basically, what happened was um, at first... He refused. He wasn't moving fast enough for me. Um, and so he called his aunt. And his aunt was on speakerphone. Let me preface that. She was on speakerphone. And so she was like, you know, what's going on? And he was like, my wife don't want me no more. She, she claimed that I'd be lying to her. I ain't never lied to her. When I heard this, what's the analogy I can give y'all? When I heard him say to his aunt, I ain't never lied to her before, something in me snapped. The best analogy I can give you, do y'all remember that movie, Carrie, when she was at the prom and everyone was laughing at her, um, the blood had had fallen down on her and there was a moment where her eyes just went wild and you knew something was about to happen you just didn't know what but y'all had pushed her too far when he said to his aunt I ain't never lied to her I snapped the calmness left the amount of rage that was in me, I could have fought every member of the Kansas City Chiefs and beat every last one of their asses. I could have fought every member on the Atlanta Falcons and beat every last one of their asses. I'm not a violent person, but I was I was there. I was there. 
that statement, I ain't never lied to her, took me there. I went off. <laughs> I, w- I went off. I went off so bad that I, first of all, every part of me was shaking. I called my mom. My mom was on speakerphone and she's in Arkansas. My mom's a praying woman. I was cussing like a sailor. My mom finally said, um, you know, put him on the phone. So I gave him the phone and I'm standing there and I'm looking around the room. Is is the scene that I remember is the Angela Bassett scene in Waiting to Exhale when her eyes are darting around the room right before she grabs everything to put it in the car to set it on fire. I was more so looking at what weapons were in the room, the lamp, the TV, the dresser. <laughs> I was I was looking more. I mean, I was while she was talking to him, my eyes were darting around the room because if he did not get his ass up and get his shit and get up out of my house um it it was it was going to be bad if i have never in my life been on tiktok and said thank you if had it not been for the blood y'all i'm i i can't i know this is gonna sound dramatic i know this is gonna sound like girl you you so funny you don't understand had it not been for the Lord on my side had it not been for the fact that I know I got a praying mother I know I had a praying aunt I know I've had a praying grandmother in heaven because I'm telling you I clearly saw what was getting ready to happen had he not gotten up got his shit and got out of my house so I'm trying to calmly say this because I'm trying to calmly tell this story because the rage had taken over me. The pure, unadulterated rage that I felt when he said to his aunt, I never lied to her after I had discovered only 2% of the lies at that point. Just 2%. So it was enough for me to be like, you need to get your stuff and go. So my mother gets on the phone and she says to him, you know, Legion, she called him by name. Um, She said, I am not there to control my daughter. She said, in the name of Jesus, get your stuff and get out that house because I think she might kill you. Get out of the house. She's on my phone. His aunt is on his phone. His aunt said, nephew, come home. Home for her was Philly. She said, I'll send you money. Come home. Leave that house right now, she said, because I think that that woman is about to kill you. Let's go. Let's just go to part 34. Let's all just take a deep breath. Part 34. Who the fuck did I marry? So the aunt told him, I'll send you money. Come home. I'm yelling in the background, by the way. I'm not standing there calmly. I'm yelling. I said, oh, he got money. Yeah, you got money. You got money in that offshore account, right? You got money in that Chase account. You got money to drive. So do what you got to do. I I told him, and I'm not going to repeat some of the stuff I said because my mom might see this TikTok. But um, I did tell him, I was like, if you don't get out of this house, you going to actually what I said was you have two options. You either going to leave this house voluntarily or you're gonna leave this house involuntarily and he tried to get a little he tried to get a little nook if you buck he tried and that's when he because he was still on the bed still laying in the bed and he was just like you ain't gonna do shit like don't talk to me like you done lost your fucking mind da, da, da. and i calmly got close to him i got like this close and i literally said i will beat you like the bitch you are I dare you to try me. I said, I will literally beat you like the male bitch you are. And so when I said that, his eyes were like, I said, I'm not even playing. Because at this point, I'm 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 rocking like back and forth. Y'all, again, I'm not some hardened type chick. I'm not. I want the soft lifestyle. But I have been pushed to the point. 
So I'm rocking. I'm walking back. I'm pacing. So finally, his aunt was able to get through to him. I had called my aunt, my mother, my aunt. I had called the pastor. I had called all these people because I did know that I was in a very dangerous place. Not because I'm scared of him. At this point, I was scared of me. I don't know if this has ever happened to someone where you know your own, you know yourself. You know that you got a line. I was over that line. So I had enough wherewithal to be like, okay, okay, you're probably going to go to jail today. You're probably going to go to jail. Um, you probably ain't going to have th that job in the morning. Like, I, I was there. And again, this is not to sound bragging at all. This was, this was a woman who I, c I could not believe that even with the, the attempt of me trying to give him one last opportunity to tell me the truth, he still lied in my face. I, I was at my edge. So... I pull, I yanked the covers back and um, I told him, I was like, get up, you know, get, get the fuck out of my house. Again, I'm saying it calmly on here. It was nothing calm in the house when this happened. So I'm throwing stuff, throwing stuff up against the wall. Um, I, I remember I looked at the lamp. He looked, he looked at me looking at the lamp. And I think that's, I think something in him realized, okay, I, I, yeah, I'm in pain, but if I don't get up, she, she's going to do something with that lamp. So he does get up. He is still on the phone with the aunt because the aunt was pretty much like, keep me on the phone. She did not want him to hang up. <sighs> He throws some stuff together. Again, keep in mind, he has all his stuff in the house. So he basically packed like two bags worth of clothes. Um, and he's limping around and I'm standing in the hallway watching him like a probation officer. So he's limping around um, and I'm looking at the condition of the bedroom. This is when I noticed Legion have been semi bedridden. Remember I told y'all that because the knee and other stuff. I look at these bottles of Powerade because he had been drinking Powerade so much at this point. He was not getting up to go to the bathroom. He was drinking the Powerade and then using the empty bottles to pee in. So there was about six bottles around the bed. And I was like, what is this? Because again, I hadn't really been going in that room. I was busy being CIA, FBI, and Homeland Security for the past two weeks. So I was like, what is this? He was like, I'm gonna throw it out. He grabbed a trash bag, put the bottles in there. And I said, what are in those bottles? I said, tell me. And I, I think I started like twitching. Like, tell me, there that is not piss in those bottles. He was like, I couldn't make it to the bathroom. I was in too much pain. So at this point, I'm even more like, yeah, get the fuck out. Get out. Um, get out of my house. So I helped him. While he was packing his bags, I went downstairs. I took the house key off of his keys. Um, I went back upstairs he had his two bags. I grabbed the two bags. Yes, I did. I grabbed the two bags. I had opened up the garage. I had already popped the trunk for his car and threw the bags in the car. I did that because I was like, you getting out of this house. You getting out of this house today. You can't come back. You can't come back ever. So I ha he it took him about, about two hours um, from the time of I will beat you like the bitch you are for him to actually leave the house. Again, I'm calm telling y'all this story. It was not calm in the house. So he eventually puts on some sweatpants. Now I can fiz I can really see how much weight he has lost. But he puts on some sweatpants. He puts on a shirt. He's limping down. He's like, you really going to kick me out on my birthday? 
I just looked at him. I just looked at him. Opened the door. He went through the garage, got into his car, called, you know, his aunt was still on the phone and she was like, I'm going to send you some money. And the, and that's the part I was like, clearly he has the money. Like, you ain't got to send him money. He doesn't even have to go to Philly. He can just go get a hotel for now. I don't care what he does. He just got to leave his house. So he ends up getting in the car, driving off. My mom calls and she's just like, you know, is he still there? I said, no. Um, I, I had not told her what all he had lied about. Even in the midst of me being angry and me going off. I never told him that I spoke to the ex-wife. I never told him I knew he was lying about the stepdaughter. Because then it would have he would have asked how, you know, what makes you say that? Um, so I did keep my word. I never told I never told him I spoke to her. So he eventually left. I text a friend of mine. I text my landlord. I said, I have an emergency. I need to know if it is okay to get the locks changed. Landlord was like, that's fine. Um, my landlord was super cool. Shout out to Mr. Patel. Um, I went to Home Depot, bought brand new locks, text my text a friend of mine, asked him, when you get off work, can you please come by my house? I need the locks changed today. So he was like, oh, okay, what's going on? I said, I'll explain it later. So to give you a timeline of June 17th, when I asked him about San Diego State and I told him that I know you've never even been to California, that was about 8 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. By the time he left the house, it was maybe going on noon, one o'clock. So this happened pretty quickly. Um if you're at if you're wondering why did you even ask him, it re- I I already knew that. I want it out. I knew that. But for some reason, a part of me was like, let's just see if he'll be honest just one last time. And he wasn't. And it sent me into a rage. And then he lied to his aunt saying, I ain't never lied to her. And that sent me over the edge. Um, so by one o'clock, by one thirty, he was gone. By 2.30, um, I had done a pretty good job of cleaning up the the bedroom. He had thrown away the Powerade bottles. Um, so I didn't have to touch those. I stripped the sheets. Anything that he touched in that bedroom, I stripped the sheets, threw them in a the trash bag, threw them out in the trash can. And so it, most of this was adrenaline. Adrenaline was pushed because I hate packing. I hate doing all that stuff. I went on Amazon. I ordered oversized large tote bags because I was packing up all his shit. Part 35. Who the fuck did I marry? So I packed up all his stuff. Okay. The reason why I packed up all his stuff is because so I had a three bedroom, two and a half bath town home. One room was the guest room. Obviously, there was a master bedroom. And then we had a TV room that he had made like his Philadelphia Eagles man cave. I was going to put everything that belonged to him, pack it up and put it in the TV room because the plan should have been that he's going to come back and get all his stuff. Okay, so that's why I did it. Um, And honestly, it just felt good (laughs) to pack up his stuff and and go through it freely because when he packed in a hurry he left obviously really important things he left all his invicta watches he left all his wwe championship belts and if you know anything about wwe championship belts you know those things are expensive he left all his jordans he left um suits he left uh cole han shoes he left all that because he it was such a hurry for him to leave. So all that was still in my house. Um, so around two thirty, I think I I wasn't even at a place where I could start crying. I was just too angry, still shaking, packing everything up, packing everything up. One of the things that he left um, is a photo album with all the pictures of his mom and dad and his siblings growing up. Now, I had the thought of, 
I was going to have a burn party. And I was going to put it on Facebook Live. I was going to burn it with my friends and drink and dance and play music. But um, it's his deceased parents. I do have a heart. So I put that somewhere special, meaning I put it up in the closet. Um, He had told me that he was going to come back and get his stuff. And so... I just did not, I I didn't throw anything out unless it was like something I knew was trash. Other than that, I put everything up and kept it, you know, in the TV room. So that's June 17th. Also on June 17th, I had already ordered his birthday cake. I had ordered the birthday cake like the end of May because it was like a special birthday cake. So I also had to go get the birthday cake (laughs) from the bakery in East Point. Um, And I took it to my family's house and we ate it. Yes, I had left the house, um, went to my family's house, filled them in my aunt my little cousin and my grandfather, because my mom was in Arkansas. So I went over to their house, filled them in on what was going on. They could not believe it. Although my grandfather then told me, he said, he ain't look like he was a football player. He was like, I ain't want to say nothing, but he ain't look like he was a football player. <laughs> Gotta love grandparents. Um, so we ate his birthday cake, went back home. Um, the friend that I had called, came changed all the locks changed i changed the security codes um effectively he would not have been able to get in that house so that is what happened on june 17th so now we can fast forward he he would text me and he would call me that he got to philly apparently he drove through he left georgia and immediately went to philly So he immediately went to Philly um, and he did text me and said that he made it to Philly and he was staying at his aunt's house. I know that this is a short part. That's okay because what we're doing now is I went through how we met. I went through how we dated. I went through how we got married. Um, Now I'm taking you all to June 17th. The week after June 17th, He's in Philly. He still would call me. He still would um, text me. The conversations we were having the week after June 17th. So this would be June 18th up to the 24th. The conversations we are having had to do with divorce. So who's going to file? He was like, well, I don't want a divorce. I'm going to fight you on it. Are you really are you gonna fight me on the divorce um I didn't know anything about filing for a divorce so but I refused to stay in a place of ignorance so I um went online there's a website that you can go to where you pay like a two hundred dollar two hundred and thirty nine dollar fee and you fill out basic information and you choose your state you choose your state and they will um, process, not process, but they will make all your documents. All you got to do is print it out and take it to the court. And it is step by step directions. We didn't have any property with each other. We didn't have any kids with each other. So by the state of Georgia's standards, this should be an uncontested divorce. So the conversation that last week, the week of June 18th, to the 24th was about divorce. What stuff do you want to keep? Well, I'm going to come and get all my stuff. I just don't understand why you couldn't talk to me about it. I said, there's no room for talking because you've been lying to me since day one. Um, But even still, keep in mind, as of June 17th, June 18th, June 19th, I did not know what I know now. So the lies were really only like 5% of the whole story. So... June 24th or 25th is when I had printed my documents and I'm laughing because at this point in time, I've read y'all's comments about how that man will print out stuff. I know, but um, I used the website, typed all my stuff in, got my documents, and then I went 
Um, I took a day off from the job because I was getting ready to transition into the new job. So I left work early, went to the courthouse and filed for divorce. I filed, I paid. Um, and then I already had the documents where he would have needed to sign so that um, it could then be entered into for a divorce settlement agreement. So going into part 36 or 35, I know there's so many parts. Going into the next part is where I can tell you guys what happened with him because he drove to Philly and he was in Philly for about a week, maybe three to four days. <sighs> then I get a message on Facebook Messenger from a woman claiming to be his cousin. Lord Jesus. So the cousin tells me, well, actually, I can tell y'all. So the cousin tells me that he's there. He's telling the family that I kicked him out. He's telling the family that I kicked him out after he walked in on me having an affair, that I stole his money and I then kicked him out. And the man I was having an affair with, he said was a law enforcement officer who used his duty weapon to threaten him to get out the house. This is what he told his family. And the cousin was reaching out to me. She found my, she found me through a search on Facebook and was reaching out to me because she's like, we know he lies. So I'm just trying to figure out what, like, is this true? Because he's up here asking us for money, asking to stay on our couches. Like what's, what's going on? Then she explained to me, we didn't even know he got married. So this is the first time we're hearing about you. What do you mean you didn't know he got married? He talks to his brother every day. She said, who told you that? I said, I've heard him talk to his brother every day. All his brothers. She said, all his brothers. How many brothers do you think he has? I said, he has four brothers. I named them. She said, he has two brothers. She, got, she said, he has the twin and he has the older brother. I said, twin. Who was the twin? Welcome to the next part where we discover the real family tree. Part 36, who the fuck did I marry? The family tree. Please fasten your seatbelts and put the tray tables in the upright position. Let's go. All right. The cousin, I'm not going to name her. The cousin had reached out to me on Facebook, asked me to please give her a call. So this conversation was on the phone. Yes, I was actually speaking to her. She informs me again about the whole he's up there. He's telling everyone that he walked in on me cheating on him. It was with a law enforcement officer. And that the law enforcement officer um, used his duty weapon to threaten him to get him out of the house. The reason why I'm, sp I'm particularly mentioning the fact that he said it was law enforcement is because he was trying to get a family member like one of his cousins to call the agency of the law enforcement officer and file a complaint, which in hopes would then start an internal affairs investigation. Yeah. So female cousins on the phone with me. She's telling me everything that he is telling them. She's like, look, we know he a liar. We don't fuck with him. We He's been a liar since a kid, but he's also family. She said, we didn't know at all who you are. So I thought that that was interesting because I was like, you didn't know who I was, but his brother knew who I was. And so, again, that's when I said to her that um, I was like, I've talked, you know, he's talked to his brother every day. So I, why wouldn't the brother tell y'all that he had gotten married? And so she said, what brother? And so I told her the brother's name. And she said, he told you that? I said he was having the phone calls in front of me. So at this point, what the cousin said was she was like, okay, 
I'm going to confirm that with him. She was like, he lives up the street. So I'm going to just confirm that with him. She was like, because I'm pretty sure that they, that they have been beefing for a while. I was like, I can only tell you what I saw, what I heard. That's, that's all I can say. So then when she asked me about, well, how many brothers do you think he has? And I said, he has four brothers. Again, I listed all of them. This woman was like, he has two brothers. She said he has the twin and she and he has the older brother, the one that he was on the phone with every morning, blah, 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 blah. I said, twin, who's the twin? <sighs> so this is where she explained to me. She said the parents, mom and dad had the older brother. The um, older brother is uh, about five or six years older than Legion. Legion and the younger brother who lives in Nashville, they are twins. So when he kept saying the younger brother, my younger brother by two years, it's his older brother by 20 minutes. They are twins. I have seen a picture of this brother. Yes, they do very much look alike, but they, I didn't know they were twins. It doesn't even matter. I didn't know they were twins, um, but definitely they had a mom, the same mom and dad. So she was like, no, that he's older. He's older than Legion by 20 minutes. They're twins. She said, so the parents had three boys, brother in Philly, the older brother and the twins. She was like, who the hell are these sisters that you're talking about? So I tell her, I was like, Shantae and Kim. She said, I don't know who Shantae is. She said, Kim is my daughter. Kim is not his sister. Kim is my daughter. And she said, that's his cousin. She was like, and they haven't spoken in about 20 years. So no, that's not his sister. He does not have any sisters. And I said, well, then what about the other two brothers? She was like, what other two brothers? I said, the brothers from his dad. She was like, you mean to tell me <laughs> this man is going around telling people, I know somebody's going to quote Nicki Minaj lying on your dead mama, but try not to. Um, she says, you mean to tell me this man is walking around lying on his dad saying that his dad had kids outside of his mom. And I kind of stuttered like, yeah, she was like, he does not. She said, I have no idea who those two men are. She said, those are not his brothers. But if y'all remember, I've met those two. And he introduced them as, you know, man, this is my, bro this is my brother, uh, John. This is my brother, M Matt, you know, type thing. And so they both were like, oh, my sister is good to meet you. It's good to meet you. Remember that because obviously I do eventually talk to those two men again. So she says to me, the family tree is mom and dad, the three sons. She was like, there are no sisters. She said, I don't have a clue who Shantae is. She said, Kim is my daughter. So that's just their cousin. But again, they ain't spoken 20 years. I said, okay. And then there was the grandmother. She said, yeah. She named the grandmother. She was like, yeah, she died in like 2008. I said, yeah, he told me that she died in 2020. And that, you know, all of you were coming down for the memorial service. And she's just like, she died in 2008. I said, then there was the uncle who also died from COVID. She was like, which uncle is that? I told her the name. She said, he's been dead since like, shit, 2010. I said, okay, what about the cousin nicknamed Junebug? Everybody got a cut. If, if you're not African-American, we all know a Junebug somewhere. Um, and she just was like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, cousin Junebug. She was like, man, that's that's crazy what happened to him. And I was like, what you what, what do you mean what happened to him? Because I know he has talked to his cousin Junebug on the phone like, few, you know, a few months prior. He was like, and so she said to me, she said, yeah, he had passed away in like 2016. So this is now three people. <laughs> that she's naming that I recall him having either a story about or a phone call with. And she's telling me that they are all passed away. 
So this is when the conversation kind of changes. And she's like, you know what? She said, let me speak to the older brother um, because he probably wants to talk to you. She was like, you probably should talk to him. And a lot of your answers, a lot of your questions will get answered. She was like, this dude's been lying ever since he was a kid. She was like, I, oh, she said, literally, we don't fuck with him. I remember her saying that verbatim. She was so adamant. She was like, and when he showed up here out the blue, talking about how his wife cheated on him with a law enforcement officer and how the guy took his gun out and threatened him to leave the house. She was like, we knew something was up. She was like, that's why I had to find out who you were and reach out to you and find out the truth. I said, there was no other guy. There was no law enforcement officer. And she was like, yeah, because he was telling us where to do work and how we should go ahead and file, like help him file a complaint so that this dude could lose his job. I said, there is no other person. I said, I kicked him out. That was me all by myself. No gun, just my fist. Um, and so she said, you know, he tell he's telling us that he had gotten married. And then she was like, apparently y'all had a baby. So she was like, so you got a kid with him? So I had explained to her. I said, no, I said I had a miscarriage back in July or excuse me, back in June of 2020. And I had to have surgery in July. So she was just like, girl. So she started like really being encouraging and was saying, you dodged a bullet, honey. She was like, I don't wish this. She's like, I know he my family, but I don't wish him on no woman. So we we've had each other's numbers. She was like, if you need anything, please feel free to call me. She was like, I've had my own issues with him. I've had my own issues in life. But she was like, get your divorce and be done with him. Then she said, I'm going to put you in contact with the older brother. Next part is me finally talking to the older brother that he had been talking to every morning. Part 37, who the fuck did I marry? So at this point in time, I have filed for divorce. Um, I paid for the filing fee. I'm representing myself uh, pro se and it should be an uncontested divorce. During this time, Legion had driven to Philly, lied to his family and said I had cheated on him, um, that he caught me and that the guy I cheated on him with was a law enforcement officer who used his gun to threaten him to get out the house. None of that was true. At some point while he was in Philly, he ran out of options in terms of where he could stay family members did not want him to stay with them. Um, apparently, a lot of bridges were burned, according to the female cousin I had talked to on the phone. So he left Philly, left Philly and went to Augusta. Yes, what you were hearing is correct. He drove from Georgia to Philly, stayed in Philly for about three, four days, left Philly, drove back to Georgia, went to Augusta. Keep in mind, if you have lost your notes at this point. He was raised in Philly and did high school in Augusta before he went to California. So he has family in Augusta. So at this point, he's on his way to Augusta to stay with a new set of people. The reason why this is important is because what I have is a divorce settlement agreement. That divorce settlement agreement has to be signed by the two of us where we are basically telling the court look this is what he's keeping this is what i'm keeping i need his signature let me repeat that i need his signature because i wanted a very quick and painless divorce as much as it could be so by this time this is now around june 25th so around June 25th, he's now in Augusta. He had left the house June 17th. So between June 17th and June 24th is the trip to Philly, then leaving Philly, coming to Augusta. Um, my aunt and my little cousin get in the car with me. 
<laughs> and I drive to Augusta with a with a rag on my head, some sweatpants, and a tank top because it's July, so it's hot. Um, but we ride to Augusta. I had spoken to him. I had said, you know, I just need you to sign this piece of paper, and he was like, you know, I'll I'll get to it when I get to it. No, no, no. We're going to get to it as quickly as possible. So if that means I got to drive to Augusta tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, I'm going to do that because I need that signature. I ain't telling this. This was my attitude. Sure enough, went ahead, drove down there. I met him at the UPS store in Augusta. It's in the same Kroger shopping center. They had a notary there because I needed the papers to be notarized. So he pulls up. It's only been a week since I last saw him. It has been months since my aunt saw him, okay? She had no idea of the condition that he was in. Again, I'm telling y'all, when I met him, when he met my family, he was like a size 3X. In just a short span of time for a week, he easily could have been in an extra large, maybe even a large, but was wearing 3x clothes so he has told me this whole time he didn't know i had spoken to his family okay probably need to put that in there he did not know i had spoken to his cousin so he was telling me that he had a place to stay he was staying with some family members um and everything was cool he told me he was going back to augusta because he had a job that's what he told me the family member, the cousin told me, oh, no, it's not that he had a job. We kicked his ass out because he's still lying and we don't want we don't want anything to do with him. So when I saw him get out of the car. I immediately knew. You probably have not washed in three days. I'm not overreacting. His nails had not been cut, so his nails were a bit long. He smelled like the Chattahoochee dump on a hot summer Georgia day. He stunk so bad. Um, and for a moment, I did not recognize the man I had been, that I was legally married to. I did not recognize him. Um, he almost looked, uh, what's the word, emaciated? If I, I may be saying, I may be mispronouncing it, but the way someone looks when they've lost so much weight and it's almost like your skin and bones. He he looked, he, obviously he looked homeless. He smelled homeless. Um, and my, my heart just kind of broke. It kind of did. I'll be honest, it kind of broke. Um, it did not break enough for me to not get that signature though. So when he walked into the UPS store, you clearly could see that some of the people were like, you know, let me let me get away from him. Me, I just was like, OK, so I just need you to sign right here and I just need you to sign right there. OK, and then a woman named Lauren came over and notarized the papers um, and then we were done because he signed the divorce agreement. He didn't even read it. He didn't even read it. Reason why I'm pointing that out is because he didn't read the part where what's left in the house now belongs to me. Where he took technically what he was going to take. Everything else in that home belongs to me. Remember, I told y'all he had left all his Invicta watches. He had left all his WWE championship belts, his Jordans, his a lot of his clothes, his Cole Hans. He had left all that stuff. He never even read the divorce agreement. So he signed it. I signed it. Lauren notarized it. We leave the store. And I said, have you eaten? And he was like, yeah, um, I ate. It's just, you know, my knee. So again, he's, he's talking about the knee. But if you saw him, you would know there's way more to it than the knee. So I said to him, look, since you met me here, let me give you some money so you can get you some chicken nuggets. Yeah, that's what I said. You can get you some chicken nuggets. So I believe I gave him like five or six dollars. Go get you some chicken. I think I zelled it to him, actually. Just go get you some some food. Then we because where he parked was not far. It was like 
Okay, I'm parked here. He's parked in front of me in the other row. So there's that aisle that you can drive down. Um, so I walked him to the car and I saw the condition of the inside of the car. And that's when I knew he's been living in his car. He's been living in his car. So clearly I no longer had a question of, so where's this offshore account? Where's the U.S. bank savings account? Where's, where's the checking account? Didn't have that question anymore. Because if you had money, you wouldn't be living in your car. You would not be in the same clothes that you were in when you left my house on June 17th. And this is now June 25th. So he was like, I'm going to be all right. I'm about to start a new job. I'm going to be cool. I got a family member I can stay with. Um, everything's going to be okay. All right. Um, I said, I will let you know when the divorce is granted. I said, I will send you a copy of the divorce decree. And he was like, okay. He said, well, how long do you think that's going to take? I said, I'm not sure. I, I thought I had to wait 30 days before I could file the divorce agreement settlement form. And then the judge would grant it um, in 30 days. So basically, this is like June 25th. I'm looking at the end of August that it would take for the divorce to be granted, assuming there were no hiccups, assuming he didn't decide he was going to pull a fast one. So I told him, I was like, I'm, I'm going to file this. And then once we get the divorce decree, I'll send you a copy. He said, okay. He got in his car. I got in my car. I drove all the way back home and he went to wherever he went. Next part is the next series of lies that I was faced with. All right, part 38 of who the fuck did I marry? I'm gonna call this uh, housekeeping and missing pieces. So housekeeping, um, first and foremost, as much as I know you all have enjoyed uh, this series and some of you have told me how um, entertaining you have found it, <laughs> um, the, the story will be done um, this weekend. So in other words, I don't care how many parts I got to film. It will be done this weekend. We're just not bring. We're not going to drag it into the new week. Um, so I just want to let everyone know that. So please be sure to tell your sisters, your mamas, your aunties, your cousins, your best friends. Hey, y'all go ahead and watch all the parts because she's saying she's wrapping it up this weekend. Um, but I'll leave the playlist up. So don't worry. Um, also, uh, let's see. I'm sorry for the people who were like, I keep talking really slow. I didn't know that I was. And they're like, you're just long winded. I'm very detailed. So that's probably what you're feeling is that I'm detailed and I'm trying to get everything out again in a responsible manner. So, um, you all have asked me if I will do a live. Yes. I will. I don't have any issue doing a live. I feel like if you're going to put the story out there, you know, you're going to get questions. So if you stand on business and you stand on what you said, do the live. So yes, I will do a live and I will let you all know when I'm going to do a live. So it won't just be some random shit. I will actually do a live and, um, let everyone know. So that way, if you have questions, bring them. Um, the issue with doing a live is that I need moderators. <laughs> so because I just anticipate a lot of people have questions and I'm just one person and I don't want to be accused of she's ignoring my question, which means there's holes in her story. Y'all, we all know how TikTok is. So, but I will absolutely um, do a live. That's the housekeeping. Missing pieces. So when I said before that it's important to me that I am responsible in how I tell this story, meaning I'm clear and I go in detail, I realized that I left out some missing parts and it was brought to my attention by a number of you. Thank you, because I'm all for accountability. Um, I did not go into how he, how my ex-husband Legion left the condiment company and then went to Apple. I also did not go into detail on when my mom came to visit. Both of those were in the month of April. 
Um, I was going to go into detail a little bit more on the Apple situation because as you probably have figured out, of course something came out later on. But nevertheless, um, in terms of April of 2021, my mom came for a visit. She lived in Arkansas. She came to visit us. She came to visit us after we had that whole sexting on Facebook incident and just after we had started marital counseling. There were no fireworks during her visit. There, nothing was weird. I did talk about how, um, you know, my family has always been there. And if you spoke with my mom, she would tell you she didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Um, the, but there was something in her spirit that just didn't sit right. She didn't talk to me about it at the time. She did not raise her concerns. Um, she simply, when she came to visit, we welcomed her with open arms. Legion was excited to meet her. She was excited to meet him. We took my mom out to eat. Um, it was it was a typical, very quiet, um, non-active visit. I didn't know what my mother thought until later on. So she didn't share with me during the visit, something don't seem right. Um, she, she and I sat in the guest room talking. I never told her anything that was going on. Number one, because again, it goes back to that mindset of what happens in my marriage needs to stay in my marriage. Um, and I talk about how I didn't think it was I, looking back. It was not a good idea that I told my aunt what had happened. My aunt is not the type that's going to tell my mother that, that in other words, if you confide in her, she keeps it between you and her so my mom never knew that there were any issues um and so there wasn't there was nothing for her to be on mama bear mode had she known this would have been a very different trip but she didn't know so she did come to visit um everything went fine he and i put on a united front oh we're so happy we're so you know in love um and yes behind the scenes was a whole different story. He talked to her about how he was looking to buy a house and how he told her how work was going, you know, how his job, you know, little, how his job was going, um, you know, bragging as usual, which I had, I did tell my mom, look, he's going to talk about himself and money a lot. So, um, <laughs> just change the subject. If he brings up a house, change the subject. That was my instructions to her because I was like, I don't even want to get into the whole house situation. So other than that, uneventful. Now, once my mom left, this is still in April, everything was fine with him at the condiment company. As far as I knew, everything was fine. Um, what ended up happening is he randomly came home one day and starts complaining about changes that are going on at the company. When he started complaining about those changes, it was things like, um, keep in mind, he is not VP of the company. He was VP of, I, I keep getting it wrong, but I think it was VP of production is what the memo says. So he was not the second in command for the company. He was upset that he was being blamed for, um, production uh stats that the production was down he was upset that his plant manager apparently had um resigned he was upset that some of the policy changes that were coming into play that would affect his plant these are the things that he would he was coming home and complaining about literally he would complain. He started complaining Monday. By Friday, he said, you know what? If they continue doing this, then I just need to find another job. He was like, I think I'm going to call my homeboy that I work with at Apple. And I'm going to see, you know, what they have available. Yes, there were red flags going up. Of course there were. Um, at this point, we're now we're not even dealing with United Nations of red flags. We are dealing with the Olympics. We are dealing with the parade of all nations. Everybody got a red flag. So when he said that, I was kind of like, okay, because I had become numb to all the antics that he did. I was numb to it. So he literally said, I think I'm going to call my homeboy and I'm going to see what's at Apple. My response to him was, well, what about your salary? <laughs> um, 
would you take a pay cut? He was like, no, I'm not going to take a pay cut. Like, I wouldn't leave unless it's going to be the same amount or more, or more money. Y'all, the next week, last week of April, I'm at work, minding my own business. He calls me and tells me I've decided to resign. You what? I've decided to resign. Don't worry. Don't don't get all crazy. Um, I had talked to my homeboy. There is a position at Apple, and I'm on my way there now to go and meet him so that I can get some information on the position. We're married, y'all. We're married. So what I said to him was, well, will you get all this in writing? His words to me were, of course I'm going to get it in writing. I'm not stupid. You know what? I don't even want to talk to you no more. Click. That's the end of April. So that is how I was introduced to this Apple job. Again, if you stick with this series, you, you will find out exactly what happened. But that's how I was introduced to the Apple job. It literally was in a span of within two weeks. And he resigned from the condiment company and immediately said, I'm going to move over to Apple. Just wanted to clarify that. So we will continue on. Part 39, who the fuck did I marry? Everything you're going to hear um, probably in this part and the next part, all of this happens in the month of July, 2021. Divorce has been filed. It was filed the end of June. I got his signature on the divorce settlement agreement. Um, I thought that I had to wait 30 days before I could actually file that with the court. And so this is all, this is kind of in the limbo period because I th I'm still within those 30 days. So he left his book, he left a book bag um, at the house, book bag that had all kind of paperwork in there. Inside the book bag, this is the paperwork that I found. Number one, I found a doc, a uh, packet from the condiment company where it showed his 401k contributions. It also stated in there that he had been terminated. So he was terminated from the condiment company according to the paperwork in the packet that I saw in the book bag that he left at my house. Also in the book bag were um, paycheck stubs from a previous job where he worked at a cemetery. The same cemetery that he took me to, to show me where his grandmother and grandfather were buried. So let's go ahead, I'll, sh I'll do this video and say, this is what he told me, this is what I confirmed. He told me his grandmother and grandfather were buried there. He showed me a headstone with a family name on it. If you go back in previous parts, it's I talk about it. Um, the truth is they are not buried there. He is of no relation to the people who are buried at that particular grave site. Only reason why he knew about it is because he had worked there. Also in the book bag, it was a copy of a driver's license that he had the address on the driver's license, now this I still don't have an answer to, but the address on the driver's license was the same address as the cemetery. Because I looked it up on Google. Also in the book bag um, was paperwork from another construction company job, meaning it was paycheck stubs from another construction company here in Atlanta that he had worked for. It did not have dates on it, so I don't know when he worked for the construction company. Also in the book bag, paperwork was unemployment um, paperwork. So it looked like he had been receiving unemploy unemployment just before I met him. I met him in March. It looked like he had been receiving unemployment January and February. So once again, let's confirm, he did not work for the condiment company for six to seven years. Also in there were scraps of paper from a temp agency where it was, it was information on the job that he had been placed at. Where was that job? The condiment company. He would be a forklift 
slash loader is what it said. So I interpret that to mean he can drive a forklift, a forklift, but he would have been loading up the 18 wheelers for them to go out to their deliveries. Also in this book bag um, was paperwork from Clayton County Courts, I believe, um, for a weekend, uh, uh, what is it called? A weekender jail it was like a weekender jail receipt. So I had to do some research. So apparently what that means is that there is an option where if you have a job, let's say you ha you were sentenced to six, 60 days in jail, but you have a full-time job. Apparently the court can say, okay, you'll go to jail on the weekends. So in other words, you have to report to the jail on Friday at five o'clock and you'll be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you will get out Sunday at six o'clock. Apparently that's actually a real thing. So what was in the book bag were multiple yellow receipts for different weekends that he had to report and get out of jail. Last but not least, um, there were some additional pictures and then there were some, um, and when I say pictures, I'm talking about family photos. And then there were some, there was another additional copy of his driver's license with the Douglasville address. I looked up that address. The name associated with that address was the same name as the ex-girlfriend that he had in between the ex-wife and me. If you go back to the video where I talk about the conversation I had with the ex-wife, she tells me that the address was going to come back to the ex-girlfriend. I'm simply saying that is correct. So what she told me is true. So <clears throat> because of everything that I found, I decided to go down a new rabbit hole. Again, just recapping what I said um, in previous videos. Ex-husband was always a stickler about law enforcement. His dad was a um, retired police officer. I'm just telling y'all the story. His dad was a retired police officer. Mom was a retired teacher. Um, after his parents, after his dad retired, they moved to Augusta, started a church. He took me to that church in Augusta. The same day that he took me to meet his aunt who lived in Augusta. So these are now things that he actually took me to, just like he took me to the cemetery. So that's what I found in the book bag. The Weekender Jail Receipts. I went ahead and went online to find out exactly why did he have to go to jail for the weekend and I'm going to end this part here the next part has to do with his criminal history part 40 who the fuck did I marry so we are now at the point of July 2021 we are at the point where I've spoken to the female cousin and she gave me the phone number for the older brother for the purposes of this video we're gonna call him Chris Chris I was very nice. I called him. He was gracious. Um, he was willing to answer whatever questions I had. And what he said to me was, he was, he said, my brother has always been a liar. He's always been a liar. He said, but ask me what questions you have and I'll confirm what's real and what's not. First question I had was, when was the last time you spoke to him? Without missing a beat, Chris says, um, 2015, just after our mother's funeral. I explained to him about the phone calls, the fact that Legion would be on the phone for 30, 35 minutes, laughing, talking to Chris, relaying messages from Chris to me and relaying messages from me to Chris. Without missing a beat, Chris says he was never talking to me. And I said, and he said, now I'm, I am going to say this, maybe he was on the phone, but he was not on the phone with me. He said, because he knows that if I ever see him, I'm going to whoop his ass. <laughs> and I'm laughing because obviously Legion loves to say I'm going to whoop somebody's ass. Um, so for the people who were confused, like, wait, what does this mean about the phone calls? What this means is 
every single time that my ex-husband was on the phone, holding his phone like this, talking, <laughs> laughing, cracking jokes. Hey, um, my wife said that, you know, we can go later on this evening and all this other stuff. Every time they were doing things like that, every time he was having a phone call or conversation that he claims to be with Chris, no one is on the phone. No one's on the phone. That is what that means. So I'm on the phone with Chris. My mind is spinning. It is blowing up like a volcano. I mean, I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy because what this means is that for the past four or five months, every morning that he is having a phone call with his brother Chris, I am now understanding in real time that that phone call was completely fake so chris tells me maybe he was talking to somebody else but it wasn't me he said the only family member that legion actually talks to is the twin and that's only because for some reason i guess this is their twins he helps him out when he needs it legion only calls the twin when he needs money and the twin according to chris now this is the part that might blow some minds the twin brother, the one that is older by 20 minutes, is VP of his company, is married, drives a luxury car, and lives in like a four or five bedroom house in Nashville. So Chris is saying to me, he was like, it sounds like he took the identity of the twin and was trying to act like that's his life. And it's not, he was like, that nigga ain't never had no money. Ain't never kept a job a long period of time. And he was like, and you're telling me that he claims he was VP of a company? And so he was like, did you ever see anything? Did you ever meet people? Like, the, like Chris, I respect the fact that he was asking me the same questions y'all are asking me. Did you ever meet any family members? And I told him. I said, I met your aunt. Well, what aunt is that? I told him her name. He said, that ain't our damn aunt. I don't know if y'all have ever dealt with people from Philly. So he was just loud. <laughs> he was like, that ain't our aunt. He said, that is our mother's best friend. And I don't trust that hoe. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's the way he said it that uh, it makes me laugh. Anyway, he's like, I don't trust her. I don't trust her at all. She, she is not our aunt. She was our mother's best friend when our mother was living in Augusta. She's not our aunt. So then I explained to him about the other brothers. The brothers, remember, there were two half-brothers from his dad. One lived in Baltimore, one lived in Augusta. Chris is on the phone saying, I don't know who them niggas are. They ain't related to us. He said, our dad never had other kids. He was like, so you mean to tell me this nigga going around telling people that our dad had kids on our mom? And I said to him, well, the way he actually put it is that the, the two brothers came before y'all. He was like, hell no. No. So and then I explained to him about the sisters. He was like, who the hell is Shantae? And I was like, Shantae, apparent, again, I'm just telling you what I was told. Shantae is a sister that lives in Douglasville, married with two kids. He was like, no, we don't have a sister. Told him about Kim. He was like, Kim's not our sister. She's a cousin. And she and he said to me, and I know she ain't talked to him in forever in two days. He said, so everyone, the only people who are his family members is Chris and the twin. He's like, we got some cousins up here. I told him about Junebug. I told him about the uncle. I told him about the grandmother. And he's just sitting back like, oh my God. He said, he was like, I realized that every relationship my brother gets in, he gets worse. And it sounds like he is actually worse than what he was in the last relationship. And I thought he was talking about the ex-wife that I had spoken to. No, he had no idea there was another wife. Because again, he hasn't spoken to him since 2015. So he was like, the best thing I can say to you is this. He said, thank God you ain't have kids with him. He said, get your divorce 
and forget you ever met this man. And he was like, and I know how that sounds because he's my brother. He said, but if I didn't have to claim him, I wouldn't. And I, and I said to him something that I, I should have probably said in this, in this whole TikTok series, this is not someone that you forget. This is not a situation that, you know, man, I, I don't even remember him. No. What I don't remember is the version of myself before I met him because nothing so far has turned out to be true. The only thing that Chris was able to tell me is true is that number one, yes, there is a brother in Philly, him. Yes, there is a brother in Nashville, the twin. Yes, both parents are deceased. That is what I was told from the beginning. Those pieces of information are true. The grandmother did die in 2008. He was like, no, she didn't. She definitely didn't die in 2020. I told him how I found the obituary. And so he was like, and the uncle, he said, which uncle is he talking about? Because if you guys remember back in one of the parts, I talk about where he said his uncle was giving him advice on why he should not open up his, um, his, his, uh, savings account to let me see it. He would not let me see it. And so I'm telling Chris about the uncle. And he was like, that uncle been dead for years. I told him about Junebug. He said, Junebug been dead for years. And I said, Chris, he was having conversations with Junebug on the phone in front of me. He was like, it wasn't Junebug. He said, it sounds like my brother was making up the conversations. He said he definitely was making up the conversations with me. He said, hell no, nah, I ain't going to be on the phone at no six o'clock in the morning. So the conversation with Chris solidified that this is the actual family tree. And no, there were never any conversations with his brother every morning um, when I was getting ready to go to work. They had never talked. On to the next part. Part 41, who the fuck did I marry? So this is a continuation of my conversation with Chris, which will then lead into some other stuff. So um, Chris has confirmed that he has not spoken to Legion um, since 2015. So now we know that the phone calls that Legion was having every morning on the phone with Chris when we were you know, getting ready to go to work, the phone calls were fake. I demonstrated in the last video how I think he, you know, how he was doing those phone calls. Um, Cause he would relay messages from me to whoever was on the phone. So Chris and I also then talked about their parents. So if you remember in the beginning, I told you from the get go, this man was, you know, very respectful of law enforcement because his dad was a retired police, Philadelphia police officer. The mom was a retired teacher. And so he had the utmost respect for law enforcement. That's what he used to always say. Because, again, there's, there's a lot that he lied about. So I'm trying to only highlight the big things because, truthfully, um, it got to a point where when he would say that as a VP in his company, he had a meeting with the local sheriff. Child, we know we know that's a lie. So I don't even need to go into detail about that because again, why? So I told Chris what Legion said about their dad being a retired police officer. Um, and I was explaining how he said the mom was a retired teacher. So Chris listened again very gracious very nice guy he listened and he was like so are you ready for me to tell you what's true and what's not um and at this point i was already convinced i was going to be drinking heavily that night after this phone call so i was like go ahead all right so here's what legion said legion said my dad was a retired police officer with philadelphia pd when he retired he and my mom moved to augusta i was there for high school and um, they started a church. He took me to that church in Augusta and show, and you know showed me where the church that they started. The truth. Dad, according to Chris, 
Their dad was nowhere near the church. That man ain't go to church on Easter. He ain't go to church on Christmas. He was like, my dad ain't go to, he ain't stepped foot in the church since the day he got married. That was the last time he went to church. He ain't have nothing to do with church. He said um, that their father was the furthest thing from a pastor. And he was like, I love my dad, but that man drank, smoked, and nah, he, he was not a pastor. The mom was not a retired teacher. She did substitute teach at one point, but she was not a retired teacher. Um, the dad was a truck driver. And not only was the dad a truck driver, at one point, he was a correctional officer. And so I said to Chris, I was like, yeah, I, was, I said, I had no idea, of course. <laughs> I had no idea. So now we know the truth. Parent, the, the dad was never in law enforcement. Um, and I'm not knocking correction officers. I'm just, I want to make very clear because I know that sometimes people that work in law enforcement feel like, look, when I'm out there patrolling, that is not the same as being um, a correction officer and correction officers may feel the same. So I just want to give the distinction between the two. So the dad at one point was a correction officer. However, his primary career was a truck driver. And so um, the dad would do long hauls. So Chris is explaining, no, he, 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 man, he was like, now that's funny. He said, if you knew our dad, you would understand how funny that is to even insinuate that he was a, that he was a pastor. And so I told him about the church that we went to. He was like, oh, okay. So he took you to a church in Augusta and told you that that was our parents' church. He was like, now our mom used to go to church, you know, every now and then. But he said, our dad ain't been to church since the day he married mom. <laughs> so the church that Legion took me to and said that his parents started that church, that, that was not true. So he just took me on a field trip for nothing, basically. So I told him about the weekend, because I did tell Chris where I worked. And that is when Chris said to me, because at the time I worked in a law enforcement agency and he said to me, now, how does that work? He said, because Legion, you know, he done been in trouble a few times. And I was like, what do you mean? Because I had not yet gone online into the court system to see what type of trouble he's been in. And so he explained to me, he was like, just run his, run his criminal history and you'll see it for yourself. He said, because I don't know all the charges, but run his criminal history. I said, okay. Gave me some homework. I'll run his criminal history. So again, he cleared up a lot of stuff in regards to the family dynamics. He did explain to me that, yes, he does have a daughter. Um, he and his ex-wife are divorced. And I said, well, Legion would... Legion would talk about his the niece, meaning Chris's daughter, and would send her stuff for her birthday. And he was like, I'm he said, I'm almost positive my brother never sent anything for my daughter's birthday. And I explained to him, I said, Isn't your daughter's name Egypt? He said, No. Who the hell is Egypt? <laughs> And I said, I was told that was your daughter's name. That's the reason why I'm telling, I'm saying the name on here because obviously we're about to confirm that's not the daughter. So I said, I was told that's your daughter's name. I said, I, I went with him to Rack Room Shoes and bought shoes for what I was told was your daughter. And she lived in St. Louis with your ex-wife. He said, no. He said, my daughter and my ex-wife do not live in St. Louis. He said, I don't know who Egypt is. Um, he was like, are you sure it wasn't for a woman? And I said, well, it was kids' shoes. And he was like, no. He said, and I told him, I said, I went to the UPS store. I mailed it. And, it, you know, I, I, they printed the label with the girl's name on it. And I'm thinking this whole time, it's Legion's niece. Chris is like, I don't know who that is. That's not even the name of one of our cousins. 
So I have no idea, ladies and gentlemen, who my ex-husband was buying girl shoes for and had me sending them telling me it's for his niece. I have no idea. So Chris is like, yeah, he, 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 he finally said to me the same thing the ex-wife said, which is pretty much whatever he told you is a lie. And I was, and I, I'm, I'm being honest with you guys. It is very hard to comprehend that everything is a lie. Like there has to be something that's true. I'm like, how was he paying? If he wasn't working at the condiment company or he got fired from the condiment company, how was he still paying the bills? Keep in mind, we never joined our accounts. He wanted to, but we never did because he wouldn't show me <laughs> the offshore, the savings account, which of course never existed. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, I know that I saw his checking account. I know that I saw his savings account and he had money in there. Something had to be true. Something had to be true. And Chris was like, no, he said, it sounds like everything my brother said. Um, everything that he told you was made up. He said those phone calls were definitely made up. He said, I don't know who Egypt is. That's not any family member of ours. Um, I don't know who Shantae is. We don't have a sister. Um, he said, we don't have half brothers. He was like, I'm telling you who the family members are. He said, I am so sorry that my brother put you through this. So now let's go into the next part. Part 42, who the fuck did I marry? So I finished going through the book bag, still July of 2021. I finished going through the book bag. Um, there were some other folders with papers in there. He had left the work phone, work phone. What I actually found out was that it was not a work phone. It was simply a secondary personal phone. He told me it was a work phone. I thought that the company was paying for the work phone. That's what I thought. No, because I found um, receipts where basically, and I didn't know this, ladies and gentlemen, I had no idea, but I found receipts where he it was a prepaid phone and he's paying to add minutes to it so it's just receipts of you know you you added minutes to the phone on this date you added minutes on that date so the the uh work phone whole thing that was a bold-faced lie obviously it was a lie because as we now know he was a forklift loader so the work phone that he's been walking around with was really just a secondary phone he had left the phone. He took his personal phone, meaning the, the main phone, I should say, but the work phone, he left. So I'm going through the work phone, just try, trying to find some sort of answer. Now what is really burning in my mind is how, how is it that he had all this money in the accounts? But again, the last time I saw him, he's living in his car. Like the math is not mathing. I go into not just the photos of the work phone. I go into the deleted folder. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to go through somebody's phone, which I will never do again, but if you're going to go through the phone, don't just go through the text messages and the pictures, go into the deleted folder because sometimes you find a gold mine. In this case, I went into the deleted folder of the pictures in the, work phone i keep saying work phones because again this is just a secondary phone it is deactivated there's no minutes on it so i go into the deleted pictures and what i see is a is what looks like a screenshot of his checking account the one that i saw with the available balance then there's another photo of the screenshot of the savings that he showed me now, one of two things it could be. Either one, it's not real and it was pulled offline, or two, he took a screenshot of his own account and saved the photos. So this is when I got introduced to reverse Google, 
Google image search. I did a reverse Google Im image search. Sure enough, as you probably have figured out, some of you, because I read it in the comments, what he showed me when he turned his phone around showing me his available um, checking account balance was nothing more than a screenshot that he had found on Google. When he showed me his savings, turned the phone around, because remember, I, I demonstrated for y'all how he was, and then, you know, showed it, turned it around and showed it to me as if he was signing in. When he did that, he was, he was simply showing me a screenshot that he had taken from Google Images. Because when I did a reverse Google Im image search with those two photos, the checking and the savings, it came right up. It was nothing more than just Google Images. In my phone, I still had, I didn't even need this because again, I already knew that he was not a VP regional manager, but still for shits and giggles, I did a reverse image search of the charcoal BMW. Remember I told y'all he had sent me pictures of the company car. Nothing more than a screenshot he had taken off of Google images. The house that he showed me that he had in San Diego, Google images so what we can now confirm is anything he showed me when he's turning his phone around is nothing more than an image from Google images at this point the checking account the savings account Google images the house Google images the company car the BM that charcoal gray BMW 5 series Google images so at this point I realize okay nothing nothing is real um, and I wasn't so much in a rage to be honest with you I wasn't in a rage then and there as much as it was I really truly had a moment where I said to myself oh my god what the fuck have I let in my life? Like, this is not even human at this point. That's really how I felt. Like, again, as someone who, um, I, you know, I studied psychology, but I didn't, I didn't graduate with a psychology degree. However, I have never dealt with a pathological liar. I have studied about them, but I have never come into contact with a pathological liar. Because to a compulsive liar, if you ask them, man, why did you lie to me? They probably are going to have a reason. Pathological liars don't have a reason. Like, there's, and there's no limit to the lie. So, I have now confirmed that at least 70% of everything that I thought I knew is now absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. So, in between all of this, I get a phone call from the aunt in Augusta. The aunt in Augusta who Chris has confirmed is the mother's best friend. She is not their mother's sister or dad's sister. She's the best friend of the deceased mom. She calls me and this is the one I have met. This is the one that Chris was like, I don't trust that hoe, you know, anyway. Um, so she called because she wanted to know what happened. She wasn't trying to be nosy or messy or anything like that. She's just trying to find out what happened because apparently Legion is trying to come stay with her. So she asked me, sweet lady, but she said, you know, what what happened with you with you guys? She's and I and I told her we're getting a divorce. Um I said because he he lied to me. A lot. He lied to me a lot. Um and so what breaks my heart about the conversation with her is that she said, so whatever happened to the baby? Mind you, we went to Augusta, told her I was pregnant. I thought he told her that I had had a miscarriage. He didn't. He never told this woman I had a miscarriage. So she informs me, this is what she tells me. So now we're confirming something else. She tells me, that on at least five times while I'm at work, 
Legion was driving to Augusta and telling her that he was going to visit the church of where the parents of allegedly start the church that the parents started. And I was like, what do you mean he went to Augusta? She said, I've seen him like four or five times. He's come down here. And each time I've asked him to bring the baby. And I said, what baby? And she said, the, the baby that y'all had, he told me that you all, that y'all had a baby boy. And I said, no, ma'am. I said, I had a miscarriage in June of 2020. And she said, oh my God. Oh, you know, she was, she was doing that whole thing. Um, she said this whole time he told me that y'all had had a son in January and I have been asking him for pictures. I have been asking him to bring both of you down here so I could meet him. And he always had an excuse as to why he wouldn't bring the baby. And the last time he was in Augusta, he said that he was leaving you and he was taking the baby with him and that you were at work. I am not making this up. That is what that woman told me. And I just was like, no ma'am, none of that is true. There is no baby. Um, I said, I had no idea he was going to Augusta. Next part. Part 43, who the fuck did I marry? So after the conversation with the aunt, again, she's telling me that Legion has been keeping up this lie that we had a son. I have let her know, no ma'am, there was no baby. We did not have a baby. Um, and I said, I'm so, I thought that he told you. And she said, he's told a few people that you all had a baby. And she said, because I know some people were sending, were, were trying to send a gift to celebrate the birth. I ain't know anything about that. Didn't know anything about that. So she said, he's trying to come stay with me. She said, but I don't think I, I want him to, again, she's an older lady. She was like, I don't think I want him to come here because I don't really want to get involved with, um, his divorce again and I said what do you mean again I said are you talking about the previous wife and I said the previous ex-wife's name she said I don't know who that is I'm talking about Latoya La Latanya that one the first one and I said well what happened do y'all remember I said in my previous uh video that I found I read their divorce records he had filed for divorce and they had a temporary protection order against each other. I said that. So now the aunt is on the phone saying that she had to go to court and testify on Legion's behalf in regards to the temporary protective order. And I was like, well, what happened? She said they, she said they got into a fight with each other and she slapped him. And I said, well, do you know why they got into a fight? And she said, yeah, apparently he had lied to the wife and it was something major and they got into a physical fight and that and she said that woman almost beat his behind and so he asked the court for a temporary protect protective order so now i'm just getting the backstory on how that tpo was even even came into play so i told her i said you know miss Christy, we'll call her. I said, you don't have to worry about that. I said, we're not, um, he's already signed the paperwork. We're not fighting. I'm not, I'm, I don't have it in me. I don't. So I said, I'm not going to tell you not, not to have certain people in your home, but I am going to tell you that I'm just barely kind of discovering exactly what the lies are in regards to Legion. So if you feel comfortable having him in your home, then do it. I said, but I am going forward with this divorce. And once the divorce is final, I will have nothing to do with him. And uh, I said, and I'm so sorry, you know, that he lied to you um, and kind of pulled at your heartstrings in regards to a baby. I said, there is no baby. So she says, so y'all are really getting a divorce? I said, and I didn't want to cuss to the older ladies, but I said, yes, ma'am, we are, we are. Um, and so we get off the phone. Um, 
Also during this time, Legion would call me every now and then. Legion had no idea I've spoken to his ex-wife, I've spoken to his brother, I've spoken to his female cousin. He had no idea. I have now, if we wanna go through real quick and talk about what we can confirm. We can confirm that um, there is no sister. We already knew there was no baby. There was no um, VP job. Again, he was he was a temp, and apparently he was making decent money. So what I believe, and this is just what I think off of putting pieces together, I think that he made enough money to pay the household bills because it wasn't as if the household bills were so expensive. He made enough money to live on his own, um, but instead of him living on his own he's living with me so we can also confirm that when he told me that he was paying his car off and he called the dealership and paid his car off we can confirm that that's a lie that story will come up later on so pretty much at this point the only thing i know to be true his name his date of birth the secondary social security number that was on my background check um, and that he has two brothers and the parents are deceased. At this point in time of July 2021, that is all I can, that's all that I was able to confirm that to be true. So later on, Legion calls me. He calls me because he wants some money. He want, He just needs a little bit of money to hold him over till payday. And so he we're on the phone, the call again, I was recording all my calls at the time. We're on the phone and I just and I finally kind of confronted him number 1 about having a twin. That's when he tells me, you know, I I I don't know why I lied, but I don't really talk about him. Number two, I asked him about, I asked him why did he get fired from the condiment company? His story is that he got fired because he had helped a truck driver and he was not supposed to. I know it's a lie. Y'all don't even have to tell me. I know it's a lie. Um, number three, I asked him, why did you tell your aunt that we had a baby? He claims he never told her that. And that she's old and she didn't know what she was talking about. So then I asked him if he was ever in trouble where he's been arrested. And he said, yeah, I've been arrested as a juvenile, but my father had my record expunged. I said, were you ever arrested as an adult? He said, no, nah, I never been arrested as an adult. I said, so you never went to weekend jail? He said, no, I don't even know what that is. So he doesn't know what weekend jail is. That's that's his story. And so he was still li he was still standing by the lies he told me. So finally, I just asked him, and this is where I, I let me just say it. I asked him, why the hell did you even marry me? Like why? Why did you even marry me? Because you easily could have just stayed dating or been the boyfriend or just moved on moved on with your life like you didn't have to marry me you didn't have to pull me in into a marriage and make me think that this is what you wanted this is what he said to me on that phone call he said I had to marry you and I was like no you didn't he said yes I did he said I knew full well from day one that there was no way you were going to stay my girlfriend for longer than a year he said, I knew it. He said, I knew in order to keep you, I was going to have to marry you. Y'all, my jaw hit the ground. I could not believe he said that. And he said it so matter of fact. And I was like, that is the most fucked up thing you could ever say. Part 44. Who the fuck did I marry? The videos that you saw earlier were filmed earlier today. Um... And yes, I'm aware. 
it was brought to my attention. Um, I had to make a decision whether or not to finish, keep my word, or stop, disappear. <laughs> I mean, disappear. Um, okay. Let's finish. So, first of all, let me say this. It is not easy telling this story. It is, it's entertaining. I know it's gone viral. Um, but it is not easy telling this story. I made a decision to tell the story. I made a decision to share my story, what I went through in hopes that it helps just one person. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you all, it is not easy telling this story, to relive it, to face certain things out loud that I had to face internally. Just want to say that. So I, I will push forward to finish, but today got to me the toll of this got to me today so i know that you all are like we're waiting on the next part we're waiting on the next part i appreciate that and i get it because if i was in those shoes i would be waiting too and be like where is it so i understand that um but the toll was real today all right so with that being said um we are still in july of 2021 um, I had talked to the brother, Chris, I had talked to the aunt, I had talked to um, all these people. And now was the time where I, again, I had saw the receipts for the weekend jail type thing. Um, so I went ahead and did a search for his criminal history. I ran his criminal history. I did that on my own at home. Um, with my money. So this was not, I think someone had asked if I did anything with my job. No, I did not. I know, I know better. Um, so I ran a criminal history or I paid for a criminal background report. For him to say that he appreciates law enforcement so much, it was obviously a lie because the criminal history showed that he had been arrested for criminal trespassing. He had been arrested for like suspended license, um, suspended registration. But the big thing was impersonating an officer. If you don't know anything about impersonating an officer, it is a felony, period, point blank. As sure as Peachtree runs from Bankhead to Buckhead, it is a felony. So seeing that, seeing what court it was in. Um, I did another open records request for the incident report. I wanted to know exactly what the circumstances were, especially given the fact that I worked in law enforcement at the time. What were the circumstances as to how he was arrested for impersonating an officer? So I did an open records request. I got um, the incident report and I'm tired of saying my jaw hit the floor, but on this one, my jaw hit the fucking floor. I respect law enforcement. Again, I, I was working in an agency um, with a lot of great men and women. Basically, what the incident report, and I'm paraphrasing it because I don't have it sitting in front of me. Basically, what the incident report shows is that he pretended to be an officer using a badge. I later found out it was the badge that his dad had as a former correction officer. Same last name. So he was pretending to be um, a police officer at an apartment complex on the south side of Atlanta and proceeded to tell people that he was an investigator and he was looking for drugs. He also proceeded to try to uh, pat down someone and then also proceeded to try to go into a woman's apartment and do a search. This is in the incident report. So naturally, 
the woman who he was trying to get into her apartment to do a search happened to either work with or worked at a local police department. So she just simply called her coworkers or called her homeboys or whatever. And so he was subsequently arrested and subsequently was charged um, and found guilty. That is what I found in his criminal record report. It is fair to note, had I known that he had a criminal history, we never would have even finished date number one. Some things I'm just not going to get involved with if I know from the from the rip. Um, so what does this mean? Again, we've been going over what's the lie. What can you confirm? I can confirm that there was no way that this man ever had a passport to take me to London. When he claimed that he was voting in the election, there's no way that he did because he tried to tell me that he was still a, um, a registered voter in California and that he did it online. I knew it was a lie, but again, at this point in July, I'm able to confirm that, yeah, you never had a passport. You never voted. The small things that m mean something to me, he never did it. He wasn't eligible to. So now I know that not only have you, yes, been arrested. Now, what happened as a juvenile, I don't care. But you you have been arrested. You have done some sort of time. And now it explains why you knew your way around the county so well. If you go back to the previous videos, I had mentioned that I was wondering, how do you know your way around here? And the story was his sister used to live in this county and he would come visit when he would fly in from California, when he would go see his parents in Augusta. That was the story. So that explains the criminal history. Um, and I'm also going to take you guys back and remind you when I had to go in for my polygraph and how the polygrapher had asked me, have you, do you know anyone that is a convicted felon that you have relationships with, blah, blah, blah. And remember, I said to him, my husband and I are estranged. I honestly don't know. Fast forward to July, where I find out that, yes, in fact, on top of everything, I was married to a convicted felon. Had no idea. No idea whatsoever. And it's nothing but the grace of God that I was able, that I was honest with the polygrapher and telling him, look, I, I don't know what's in this man's background. To say that I have no idea who I married is an understatement. It, it is a complete understatement. It's fair to say, well, you only knew him for like two and a half weeks before you quarantined with him. That's fair. And I can understand that. And I take responsibility for that. But in the big scheme of things, I had no idea the creature that I was sleeping next to every night. No idea. All right. Part 45. Who the fuck did I marry? So we are now end of July August time frame. During this time, um, Legion basically disappeared. Remember, I'm still waiting on the final divorce decree to come up. I'm actually waiting for the 30 days to be up so I can file the divorce settlement form. So I'm waiting on that on those 30 days to be up. I'm playing nice with him. I'm being cordial. I've I have done uncovered all kinds of stuff. But just in case he was going to act a fool, I was trying to be cordial. So I had spoken to him on like a Monday and I was trying to get a hold of him for something. But I'm the one that initiated a phone call in the coming days. Never heard from him. Never heard from him at all. He wasn't his phone was um, was dead. Um, it was going straight to voicemail. And I genuinely was worried a few days turned into a week. By the time I hadn't heard from him in a week, because I knew he was not living anywhere but his car. That I knew that. So this is what happened, y'all. <laughs> um, I first reached out on Facebook. Remember, even though he has told me that he had all these siblings, 
We know he didn't have all these siblings. But remember, I told y'all I had met the brother in Augusta and I had met the brother in Baltimore. These are people I've met. The brother in Baltimore talked to on FaceTime. The brother in Augusta, I've actually physically met, hugged, shake hands, all that. Um, So I reached out to on Facebook to people that I remember him talking about all the time. The friend Omar, the brother in Augusta, the brother in Baltimore, um, another cousin in Augusta. I was doing a search for these people's names, just like, hey, have you heard from Legion? The brother in Augusta told me, no, I haven't heard from him. I've been trying to reach him, um, but the phone's going straight to voicemail. I knew he was living in his car. So my brain was doing everything it could not to go on the deep end. I reached out on Facebook to the brother in Baltimore. And I said, you know, hey, it's gave him my name. And I said, "Um, have you heard from Legion? Now, mind you, the brother in Baltimore and him have talked, talked on speakerphone. I guess it's important that I make that distinction. They have talked on speakerphone. So I know that they have talked at least in 2020. So I said to him again, according to Legion, they talk all the time. But I have heard them on the phone in 2020. So I said, have you talked to him? (sighs) The brother from Baltimore informs me, no, I ain't talked to him. He owes me money. So I ain't got nothing to say to him. And I said, wait a second, like, he was telling me that y'all are brothers. He was like, man, he's like a brother, but I don't fuck with it. I don't fuck with him because he owes me money. So they had not spoken. This is now July 2021. They had not spoken in well over six months. So all the phone calls, this is what it means, guys. All the phone calls that he had with the brother in Baltimore in 2021 were not real. Then I reached out to the 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 Omar guy and I said and I remember the story was is that he and he and him known each other's years since California worked together at the condiment company. I reached out to Omar and said, you know, have you heard from Legion by any chance? Explained who I was. He responds with and I'll never forget it. He responds with no. I have not heard from him. I have absolutely no contact with him whatsoever. We are not friends. And I would appreciate if you do not reach out to me again about him. The stories I was told was that this dude is supposedly his best friend. Shocking moment. So they had not spoken in years. They're not cool. He does not fool with him. Okay. Went on to the next person, a female cousin I had met. She said, no, um, I have not heard from him. Why would I hear from him? Um, We we don't really talk. Like, I think she was genuinely weirded out by the fact that I'm reaching out to her out of the blue asking, hey, by any chance, have you talked to my soon to be ex-husband? So what I discovered in that, because he ended up being gone for two weeks. What I discovered in those two weeks, let me be very clear with the statement I'm getting ready to make. I called every, I reached out to every person I know who apparently has had some form of relationship with him. Either he said that they were friends, they talked on the phone, he said they hung out. Um, The brother in Baltimore, I was told, had been to the house while I was at work. Brother in Baltimore said, no, that that never happened. I've never been to your house. All these people knew that Legion was a liar. And I think that they all felt bad, with the exception of the Omar guy, felt bad that I was kind of just discovering what they've known for years. In those two weeks, I found out every single person I reached out to, not a single person one of them gave a shit if that man was dead or alive. All of them had the attitude, some even said it, no, I haven't heard from him. I don't care to hear from him. It was as if 
it was for me, it was such a sad moment because I discovered this man has no friends. Fuck whatever he has said. I am now able to prove it. He has no friends. There is nobody who is concerned that they have not heard or seen him in over two weeks. Some people months, one guy years, none of them were concerned. So basically what I'm saying is that I discovered he had burned bridges with everyone. Burn bridges with family, burn bridges with so-called friends, burn bridges with fake brothers, fake sisters, fake aunties, uncles, everything. He had burned bridges with everyone. And for me, that was more telling than anything else. Yes, I knew he was a liar. Um, yes, I knew he had made stuff up. I I was genuinely surprised to discover nobody gave a shit about this man. No one. I, I had never met every single family member, but the fact that he was living in his car, the fact that he wasn't bathing and was um, just had disappeared was shocking to me. So where was he for those two weeks? Glad you asked. He had checked himself into a behavioral hospital in Augusta. Why? Not to get help. No. This is July in Georgia. It's hot as hell. It's sweaty. It's damp. It's humid. It's everything. He checked himself into a hospital so he could stop sleeping in his car for two weeks. When he checked himself in, they took his phone. And that's why no one was able to get a hold of him. And by no one, I mean me. He checked himself into a hospital so that he could have a bed for a couple of weeks. That's the type of human being that I was dealing with. Part 46, who the fuck did I marry? So after the whole missing in action debacle where um, he disappeared for a couple of weeks, <laughs> Legion started calling and texting me, telling me that he was ready to come home. Yes, you heard that correct. So apparently someone had told him that legally he did not have to leave the house when I kicked him out because it was a marital home and he had just as much right to be there as I did. So he started harassing and calling the shit out of me. He was calling, I mean, 30 times in one hour. He was, fa he was Facebook Messenger calling me. Let me be clear. Facebook Messenger calling me. He was calling me so much. He was messaging me saying, I'm coming home. I'm going to get some money and drive up from Augusta. You have to let me in the house. Um, it's not fair what you're doing. All this other bullshit. I mean, it was it was nonstop. He would start calling at seven o'clock in the morning. He would not stop calling until 10 o'clock at night. He was calling so much, leaving messages, like I said, just straight up harassing me. So I reached out to attorney friends. I reached out to local law enforcement. Local law enforcement informed me, well, technically he's right because he is still legally your husband. Our divorce had not been finalized at this point. The paperwork had been sent in. I was just waiting on the judge to give me her signature, but it hadn't happened yet. So the law, the local law enforcement did tell me if he comes back, our officers would would have to let him in the house. You don't have to stay there. They gave me different options. I mean, I was I was trying everything in the book because he is saying I'm coming back to the house. I told him, do not come. You were not welcome. I'm not letting you in the house again. The locks have been changed. The code had been changed. So I told him, if you come to this house, step foot on this property, I'm calling the police and getting you arrested for trespassing. You should know about that. <sighs> he was adamant. He was adamant that he was allowed back in the home. He didn't know the conversations I had with local law enforcement. 
but somebody was in his ear telling him, nah, you can go home because she's not allowed to kick you out. Okay. So I didn't know when he was scheduled to come because he was trying to get the money for the gas to get back to Clayton County. I tried everything I could. Basically, what my options were, were simple. Let him in the home and I can stay in the home, put him in a room, um, just have no dealings with him. But again, I don't want to be under the same roof with him. This is what the local police told me. I could have an officer go room to room and let his body cam film the room to see the condition of the house. And if Legion showed up, I would leave the house. I can go to a family member's home and stay there. This is literally in August, right before my lease is up. So I was already moving. I had already secured another home, um, did exactly what I said I was going to do, moving to Cobb County. So I just needed a couple of weeks before I vacate the home. So the other option was, you know, again, have the officer film the home. With the body camera that way it shows what the condition of the home is at the time that he moved in so if anything gets messed up i can sue him what am i gonna sue him for but nevertheless um or the third option is i can stay there with him make life miserable so my plan was the option of have them film the home i was not staying in the same house with him i didn't care also, there was no guarantee. And I told I told the officer this, look, if y'all allow him to stay in this house, I am telling you by tomorrow morning, every utility in this house will be off. He will have no running water. He will have no air condition. This place will feel like a sauna. Officer kind of chuckled and was like, again, ma'am, I, I mean, this is one of those domestic situations he is allowed in the home. Okay. So again, I had no idea when he was coming. I was on pins and needles every day. I'm seeing the phone ring, like I said, about 30 times every hour. I'm seeing the messages. I'm seeing this. I had reached out to a police captain. I had reached out to the chief of police. I was trying to get all kinds of help. Like it ain't what you know is who you know. So he eventually tells me, I'm going to be there on Wednesday. This is just an example. I'm going to be there on Wednesday. I had been calling a police, uh, excuse me, a police captain who was really gracious, really kind, and was trying to help me because I was like, bro, I just, I just need two weeks and I'm out of this house. And we already knew he legally could not go to the new house. I was trying to see if I could move in early to the new place. The landlord was like, I, I really can't let you. So I felt like I was running out of options. He's saying he's coming. He's saying he's coming. He's adamant he's coming. I guess somebody felt sorry and gave him some gas money so he could drive from Augusta up to Clayton County. So the day before all this goes down, the police captain called me and he informs me that <laughs> he informs me that they ran his name through uh, GCIC, which is a database that law enforcement agencies use. Come turns out he has a warrant for his arrest. So the police captain says this changes everything. If he shows up to the house, don't do anything. Call us. I have I will I will have officers to your home and they will simply arrest him. So I know that this is a short part, but I'm going to dedicate the next part to what happened when he showed up to my house. Part 47. Who the fuck did I marry? So here's what happened. This was mid-August. Um, went to work. Went to work as usual. It actually happened on a Friday. I had to look at the dates. It happened on a Friday. Went to work, um, still he was calling me, texting me, messaging me that he was on his way. And so I was a bit on pins and needles all day. I was dreading going home and that is a horrible feeling to dread to go home. So um, 
he had called me and said that he was at the house in the driveway. I guess he had to use the restroom, so he decided to go to the Walmart up the street to go use the bathroom. I wasn't answering phone calls. I wasn't answering text messages. I simply called the police captain. I said, hey, the, he's saying that he's at the house. The police captain himself drove by the house, but I believe he drove by the house when Legion went to Walmart to use the bathroom. So the police captain was like, I don't see anyone there. But again, if when you get home, if he is there, do not engage. Call us. OK, no problem, because <laughs> I got you on speed dial. So I go home. I'm on the phone with both my mother and my aunt on a three way call. Um, they're both like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, what What do we need to do? Um, I drive into my subdivision. What he did not know was that he had backed into the driveway up against the garage. Normally, I park my car in the garage. But what he didn't know was that at the time I was driving a fleet car. So I wasn't even in my normal car. And I know that he was waiting to see my car, the Nissan Altima that he helped get um, pulled in to the subdivision and then pull in towards my townhome. That didn't happen because I'm in a different car. He didn't recognize it. So when I turned onto my street as sure as it is hot in Georgia in the summer, that man was sitting in the driveway in his Ford Taurus. OK, so I live not the, at the time, not far from a cul-de-sac. So when you go straight down, you just turn around the cul-de-sac to come back up. So that's exactly what I did. I went to the corner, turned off so that I can see the house, but he would not have been able to see me. I went ahead and called 911. I was very calm, told them exactly what the captain had told me to say. I was like, my name is the address is. I need um, police here because my ex-husband is here. He is not supposed to be here. Um, and I feel, feel as though I am in danger. <sighs> she said, okay. She, you know, again, regular phone call. She said, we're dispatching police to your home. As soon as I hang up, I then call the police captain. He immediately answers the phone. He says, we just got the call. I'm sending four officers your way. OK, good. Get off the phone. Call my mom and my aunt back because they were both like, call us back. Um, call them back on three way. I continue to sit there until I see four officers, four cars pull in and stop just in front of my house. So then I ease up. He gets out the car, I guess, trying to see what's going on. I explain to the officer that walks to my window. I say, you know, this is what's going on. So I was trying to sound extra law enforcement smart. I was like, check him through GCIC. You're going to find that he has a warrant out for his arrest for a violation of probation. And the officer kind of smirked because she was like, we know we are. We already uh, checked GCIC. The captain called us. <laughs> so I was like, OK. Um, so anyway, uh, they tell me to sit in the car. They go up to the window of the car and get him, you know, ask him to step out of the car. He does. When he when he stepped out of the car, I was like, oh, my God, I hadn't seen him since the end of June when I met him at the UPS store and he looked bad then. He was still in the same clothes. When I told you guys, when I met him, he was like a size three X. What got out of the car was easily a medium or large. Easily. That is how, and it makes sense because, you know, he probably wasn't eating. Let's set for somebody gave him six dollars for chicken nuggets. But what got out of the car was some was something I didn't even recognize. So he gets out of the car. They arrest him. Um, there was no incident or anything like that. He he was arrested peacefully. They put him in the back seat. My neighbors are all looking like, what is going on? Um, and so the officer comes up to me and she said, you know, he's asking to speak to you. Do you want to speak to him? I said, yeah. 
So she walks with me. Keep in mind, she's wearing a body cam. So she walks with me to the window. They put the window down. And I and I remember looking at him. I was like, I told you not to come. And he said, I just wanted to get my stuff. I just wanted to get the TV. I said, what TV? The TV that you gave me in the divorce? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that TV. And I says, I said, it's mine. You gave it to me. I have the fucking text messages proving that you gave me the TV. And I'm trying not to scream because the neighbors are all watching. Um, and he was like, I know, I know. I just, I just needed, I just needed my stuff. I'm sorry. I'll never bother you again. I'm sorry. And so I look at the officer and I was like, you have me out here with four fucking police cars you have embarrassed me to no end you have made a fool of me and you got the audacity to now be like i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm like fuck you're sorry so the officer was kind of like okay i said i never want to see you again he was like you won't you won't i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm so sorry so i walk off the officer is like um, going through the, the the stuff that was in his wallet. They took it out and put it on the roof of the car. So that's his, I'm sorry, the stuff that was in his pants, like his wallet, his keys. They put it on the roof of the car when they had him get out the car. And so she's just like, um, you know, I said, did you catch all that on body cam? And she said, yeah, I said, he gave me the TV. And she said, yeah, she's like, we're going to take him in and um, we'll get we'll have somebody look at him because in her words, she said he's definitely having a mental episode right now in the back seat." And I just shrugged and I was just like, my God, I, I just said, I just want to be done with him. I just want to be done. I just want to be done. And so she was like, I understand. I, I, I totally get it. So his car is in my driveway. The keys and everything are, um, they took it with them because I guess since it was on him, they took it with them for processing at the jail. Um, I think that's what how that works because I didn't see the wallet or the keys afterwards. So, so at this point, four officers leave. I go into the house. Everything's peaceful and calm. A few minutes later, I go outside to check the mail. What's in the mail? But a letter from the court. I open it up. I go into the house because, again, it's hot. I have my wig on. My, my head is all sweaty and stuff. I, I'm just angry and um, just angry. That, that raised my blood pressure. So I go in the house. I sit on the steps inside the house, and I open up the mail from the judge and it's my final divorce decree and I'm smiling right now but y'all when I got that divorce decree sitting on the stairs I broke down into ugly Oprah tears I broke down it was as if a huge a year worth of weight came off of me I broke down and I mean I wailed I broke down I broke down so, I broke down so bad all right part 48 who the fuck did I marry so after I finished breaking down wiped my tears and his car is still in the driveway I couldn't park in the driveway so I called the car company. I had called the car company once before um, when he went missing for those two weeks to ask them if they maybe had a tracker on the car and could track it. And the nice gentleman informed me that the tracker had not been giving a signal off for about five months. So he wouldn't really give me details on the car, but obviously the car had not um, the car payment was not being made on that car. It had not been made on that car for quite some time. So I, you know, he and I split in June, but apparently the car payment wasn't made long before June. 
can't speak to that, but he still had the car. So um, called the car company. I told them, I understand that y'all are looking for this for a tourist. And the lady said, yes, you know, or you can make a payment. I said, no, y'all can come get it. Here's the address. What When do y'all want to get it? And she said, well, I can have a driver come get it tomorrow morning. I said, no problem. That car will be ready for you to get it tomorrow morning. Um, and so the car was repossessed out of my driveway the next morning, Saturday. The driver was there about seven o'clock in the morning. He had the master key for the car, cranked it up, drove it, put it on the tow truck and left. Here's what that now means. When Legion left my house in June, he left with two bags of clothes. Everything else was in my house. At the end of July or towards the end of July, everything that he had left in my house had been donated to the domestic violence shelter, which means that the only thing that legion had were the clothes that he had taken with him in the car when he got arrested in my driveway all of his clothes were still in the car and when the car got repossessed saturday morning all of the clothes were in there which means that when he went to jail whenever he got out he only got out with keys to a car he no longer had a wallet with probably no money in it and the clothes that were on his back. Everything else was gone. Now, now we can fast forward to what happened around August 29th. So I was scheduled to move August 31st. Remember, I'm moving up to Cobb County. We have been checking the court documents. He had a court date scheduled for around August 29th or August 30th. I don't remember the exact date. The court time was supposed to be around nine o'clock in the morning. My mom was watching the court file, the court filings online. And according to her, because I missed it, um, they showed him on the screen because this was still during Zoom. They showed him on the screen and then he was ushered out of out of the court into like a back area and an attorney spoke on his behalf. Between the time that he had been arrested and the time of the court date, I had never in my life slept so good. Truthfully, never slept so good. I was officially divorced. I had no ties to him. There was nothing in the house of his that, that excuse me, there was nothing of his that was still in the house. I felt free. So um, when the court date happened and my mom told me what she saw on the Zoom, I was confused. Is he getting out? Is he having to serve time? What's going on? I called the courts. I tried to speak to his attorney um, and his attorney had a horrible attitude and was like, why are you calling me? And I informed him. I said, look, I'm a bit afraid of this man. So can you please just tell me if he is being released or is he going to be kept um, or if he is going to be sentenced to a longer jail term. He said, no, he's not being he's not being kept in a longer jail term because the probation, the warrant had expired. So when the police arrested him, yes, it was a valid arrest, but the warrant had expired. So I believe the warrant had expired like six months earlier, but of course it wasn't put in the system. <sighs> Which means that if the court date is August 29th, he's going to be released August 29th or August 30th. I'm moving August 31st. So my mom was just like, please just spend the night at your aunt's house. Like just spend the night at your aunt's house, then go back to the house during the day. The movers will be there and then just move. So that's exactly what I did because there was concern that he would get out of jail angry and catch a an uber with no money and come back to the house either for retaliation or because he's just in a fucking manic mode and so that's where he went um i really didn't want to take any chances it's just that simple i did not want to take any chances i knew that at that point legally the law's on my side y'all are divorced you have no reason to be at this home I knew that that's what the police would say, but 
I wasn't 100% sure because truthfully speaking, I did not know this man. We can make all the jokes we want. I did not know this man. I thought I knew him, but you never really know a pathological liar. So needless to say, he got released August 30th. I went to my aunt's house for the night. August 31st, I went back to the house. The movers were there. They packed me up and we got out of there so quick. I think they packed me up in about two hours. I honestly told them there is extra money in this. If you guys can get me packed up, meaning loaded up onto the truck because everything was packed. But I explained to them, this is a domestic situation. I need you guys to move quickly. When I moved out of that house on August 31st, anything that Legion touched, I got rid of. I sold the furniture. I sold <laughs> dining room tables. I donated plates, glasses. I, when I tell you I moved out and I started over, I completely purged my life, completely started over. I mean, I didn't, I was not willing to take a single item into my new home that reminded me of him from the dishes in the kitchen to the towels in the linen closet. When I tell you Amazon and Ross were my best friends, I mean, they were my best friends because I could not fathom moving into a new home, a new space with anything that reminded me of him. I sold the bed, got a new bed. Um, if he had bought me clothes, I got rid of them. If he bought me shoes and purses, okay, I kind of kept the heels, but um, everything else I got rid of. So I completely purged my life, completely. Started over from the bottom in terms of just the move. Um, I, ha I could not take any piece of him with me. Could not. Part 49, who the fuck did I marry? So after he and I talked for a while, very respectful, really nice guy, um, very compassionate. And so I told him, I was like, I, I said, we are divorced. So I have nothing to do with him. I said, I wouldn't bring him in my house with my family if I were you but that's just me um and so the guy was like lady you know he didn't say lady but he was like lady you dodged a bullet he was like i know you may not see it now my sister but you dodged a bullet you dodged a bullet big time and so you know just in talking to him he was very encouraging like it sounds like you got a good head on your shoulders. It sounds like you a good woman. And no, he was not flirting at all. He was like, it sounds like you a good woman. And I really hope this does not mess you up. Like, don't let him mess you up. Don't let him like diminish your shine kind of thing. And I appreciate that. I did because at that time, again, had moved into my new place. 2021 was the worst year I ever had. I'm not saying that so that 2024 can be like, hold my beer. Um, but 2021 was a dark year. Started out married, end of the year, divorced. End of the year with COVID and divorced. Um, and that period of time, that August, September time, I felt like I was just walking around like a numb woman i didn't know if i was coming or going i didn't know what i was i didn't know what to do because i felt like i had just been through hell and it was a period of time where i had to sit down and i had to really really deal with some stuff that i just simply was not ready to deal with things that i i had to come to grips with that i really wasn't ready to come to grips with so fast forward all this time, get to December 
of 2021. Yes, this is where the story does end. Um, get to December of 2021. I am out sick with COVID. I'm not at work. I get a phone call from my coworker telling me that Legion has called our devil is a lie. So my friend Tracy, who came to my rescue again, um, my, my friend Tracy was like, okay, here's what you're going to do. She said, you're going to send him a message and you are going to say these exact words. I sent him a, a text message. She said, and she told me you're going to send a text message because it's going to be time stamped. And basically the text message says, I do not have your stuff. I, I did not have your stuff. Um, I have nothing that belongs to you. If you continue to, you were disrupting um, the work of my job by calling and asking for me. We have no contact with each other. I will send you a copy of the divorce decree that shows whatever is in your possession you own and whatever is in my possession I own. If you contact me directly or indirectly ever again, I will get a restraining order on you. Now, for those of you who are watching this in 2024, and you're probably like, wow, she's dramatic. Please understand that what I just said, I meant. I mean that. If you ever try to contact me directly or indirectly, I will get a restraining order. I have it in writing. I've always had it in writing. And if I need to rewrite it again in 2024, I will because the, it, the, the boundaries still stand. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last time I had any contact whatsoever with my pathologically lying ex-husband. Part 50, who the fuck did I marry? So, the aftermath. There are some realizations I had to come to um, after the divorce and everything had passed. One, Legion never loved me. He never loved me. He doesn't love himself, so I know he didn't love me. Number two, he didn't even like me. He watched me get excited about things that he knew I was not going to get and not even just the possession stuff like of course we know I was exci I was excited to be the woman whose husband is like I'm taking my wife to London I was excited to be the woman whose husband was like yeah I bought my wife a brand new BMW X5 you have to understand as all the jokes that we make about the BMW it was the time and effort that he spent in taking me to dealerships and being sure to put me in the car and test drive the car and, you know, oh, I can, I can see you in this. I like this for you. It seems safe. It was, the, it was the effort to really make me believe that he was going to get this just, just for him to fuck with me. The effort in taking me to all these homes to see my face light up as a woman who grew up on welfare, to be able to walk into these four and five bedroom homes knowing that he didn't have any money to buy it. Imagine if he had just been honest and said, hey, I, I like in my free time to go to open houses and just see how the other people live. Imagine if he had just said that versus wasting not only my time, but the, the wasting the time of the realtors who did nothing wrong. There's a level of cruelty to my ex-husband that I had never experienced before. And God knows, I pray I never experience it again. That's the word that I that comes to mind when I think of him. He is cruel. To and and it wasn't just me. He did it to the ex-wife. So 
So do I trust? No. No. I trust the people who were in my life before him. If we were friends or if we were in a relationship or whatever and I knew you before him, um, I trust you explicitly. But if you're somebody I just met, I don't trust you. I, I don't. There's no point in me getting on here and saying and making it seem like, oh, I'm so strong. I'm so brave. I struggle big time. Because on one hand, I want to like someone. On the other hand, I'm immediately thinking, what if it's a repeat? And I'm going to be honest with y'all. I can't go through that again. I can't. Um, every single thing in our relationship was a lie. It took me a while to realize every single day this man lied to me. Every single day he lied to me. Every conversation he had was a lie. I will never know how much he lied to me. I'll never know. I, and I, I've made my peace with it. I will never know how deep it really, truly goes. I only know what I experienced and I only know what God allowed me to see. But I'm willing to bet that there's a lot I still don't know. When people say, oh, you dodged a bullet, like you just, and I've read some, I've read a lot of the comments on this and people have sent me a lot of the comments. And so I need to make one thing very clear. I am fully aware I dodged a bullet. I am so grateful to my God that I did not have that man's child. I'm sorry if that offends some of you, but it's the truth. I'm grateful that we didn't buy a house and that I'm not financially tied to him in any way, shape or form. But I am also grateful for the fact that there are things about my ex-husband that I discovered in terms of how he is when it comes to other women. And I'm grateful that God has kept me and protected me. That's all I'm gonna say. So when I started out making this series and I, and I made the decision to tell my story, my motive was, I just wanna help one person. If there is a woman out there who's like, God, you know, I want to be married and I met this guy and something don't seem right. But, you know, maybe it's not that bad. My advice is, honey, just go ahead and do your research, because I can honestly tell you being single sucks. OK, in my opinion, sometimes it sucks. But being married to the wrong person is a type of hell no one should have to go through. You should not have to be married to someone that does not like you. You should not have to be married to someone that doesn't even love you. And I know what that is like. I know what it's like to be told, hey babe, you know I love you. And yet, I swear I think that man sat back in the recliner with his WWE Championship Roman Reigns belt and laughed his ass off at me every day. Like, damn, she really believed it. Ha, 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 ha. I do. I really do think that. Um, my radar was broken because I am an intelligent woman. And I know that I know better. And I still sometimes ask myself, how the fuck did you let this happen? How did you let this be your story? all because at the time I wanted it to be my turn and I and I hoped it was my turn and when people say well what do you mean by that I just meant we all see it whether it's social media or real life we all see where a woman has she done been through some stuff but she finally met someone 
who appreciates, loves, and respects her. And it is a beautiful thing. I had hoped that when I met him, it was my turn for that. And instead, instead of being obedient, I wanted to be right and I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And the cost of that decision was heavy. The toll of reliving this whole scenario was heavy. It, it, it was. I'm almost surprised at how hard it was to actually finish this playlist. Not because I couldn't remember stuff. I probably remember way more details than what I actually put out. But it's just the fact that it's like I'm reminding myself. How did you let this happen? So. <sighs> therapy is real. Therapy helps. Stella Rosa Black helps too. Um, and yes, I will one day get to London. I will get my dark blue BMW X5 with a cognac interior. Um, I believe I will get those things. Just got to get it, them a different route. So, thank you all for being on the playlist of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? I promise I will go live and I will let you all know when I go live so that we can have a wine night full of question and answers. So now her ex-husband did respond to these allegations. Here's what he had to say. That's the rumor, Risa Tisa, ex-wife, who straight line to y'all. It's, um, it's sad um, because it's completely false of everything. More to the point, I haven't decided who I'm going to talk to exactly or go on whose page or whatever. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and let y'all know that she lied about everything. Follow her. Don't follow her. That's up to you. All that stuff she said, it's complete lies. But uh, my message to her is please stop lying to these people. And you can tell them the real reason I left you, you cheated. I caught you in the house with Bradley. And we went to marriage counseling, didn't work, and we broke up. So now if you guys made it to the very end of this video, I do thank you for watching. You guys let me know your opinions down in the comment section below.